And finally, the Flutter Global Summit 2022 is starting now. Hello, hi. everyone. Hi, hi, hi. So we wanted to say a couple of words. We wanted to greet this beautiful, vibrant community. And uh, we, uh, we're so glad. Yeah, and my calendar says, yeah, <laughs> the summit starts right now. <laughs> so this is the sound of the start of the summit. So we're so excited to see everyone. We're so excited for, uh, for this to finally happen. Anna, uh, hi, how are you today? Just give us a couple of stats on, on this event, what well, we're up to today. Yes, of course. Hi, everybody. I really glad to see all of you here. I promise you that we will have great content today. We'll have amazing speakers with so hot content, of course. And it's basically it's a short event that calls Flutter Global Summit. And it's just like a kit for me. And basically, I am not alone here. I have our friend here, so yeah, he'll also <laughs> listen to us and check everything that we're talking about. Okay, okay. So, uh, Nick, uh, what about the event? So, what, what's the format? Is it uh, standard as usual, two days? Yes, or... As usual, we have two days. We have junior track today and we have a senior uh, on our platform. We have four, black, or four blocks each day. And yes, we have lots of content ahead of us, lots of live sessions and Q&As. And so, yeah, Anna, as always, Anna collected the best speakers, lots of familiar faces <laughs> here. Yes, those who are sharing very openly in community who has what to say, who has what to share and really know uh, even what's going on on backside and Something that is not even announced, they already know it. <laughs> so, yeah, we have that people here. And just one word about our amazing program committee members. It's just people without whom I even can't imagine this event for all this time. They're like a family because they are coming with me from one event to another, from one to another. And they are mostly responsible for choosing and relating that content that we are showing you. Awesome, awesome. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, so let me correct the the Flutter Global Summit because I accidentally mirrored my picture and it was backwards. So, and we have around, I guess, a little bit shy of 30 speakers. So we have around 30 speakers and we have around 4,000 registrations or even more. And we, we're going to have some awesome talks from Flutter uh, GDs from, from Google Developer Experts. And and also we're going to have a couple of awesome uh, partners for this event, for, for this summit. So one of them is GuardSquare. And they're going to have their presentation today also about security and how to actually protect your Flutter application and, and protect it from reverse engineering. So it's going to be pretty cool talk. And yeah, and um, I guess... Uh, this is this is basically it. Yeah, we we are ready to to invite our first moderator. If yeah, I'm I, just, I just wanted to add that. I just wanted to add that. Sorry, I just wanted to add that. Yeah, this this live stream is going to be recorded, so don't worry if you will miss anything because I, we always get that question, and I wanted to add that first. And also, like people use the chat for uh for saying hi, say where where are you watching this from, and uh, behave well because we'll bunk you out of the chat. You will be spamming or sending inappropriate stuff, but we are looking forward for your questions. So we have speakers ready to answer your questions. So that's what this chat is for. Yes, I also wanted to mention that please don't hesitate to ask questions. Use chats on other platform who is registered there or on YouTube if you are just joining us because you got that link from social media or whatever, ask don't be shy and we have q and session and you can get your answers for the most interesting question that you were carrying with you and now you want to get that answer. So just don't be shy and also don't forget to subscribe to share this link with uh, your friends. They also have to know that we have this event and we prepare this content for them. So and also just press some like for us. Yeah, and thank know. you, thank you, David Rosada, for reminding me. Everyone, where are you from? Where are you joining us from? So just give us a shout out in the chat. Just tell us where are you from, because David is uh, from Puerto Rico. And yeah, so and let's let's invite our first moderator. Yep. 
We have Shaddai here with us. Hi. Hello, everyone. How are <laughs> nice you Nice to be here. <clears throat> Great. So this Anna said that this is like her kid, his, her kid, right? This is the third version, is it? Yes, I really love this event. It's just like my kid that is growing, growing, growing. Yes. This time. I guess we, this and I was, I was a speaker in the first two editions. And I really wanted to be in this one, but you know, preparing for a speech talk, it requires a lot of work and you always strive for quality. So I just wanted to be here, but I don't need to have a topic. So I just wanted to help like moderating and thank you for giving me this chance. Anytime, you know that in this <laughs> case, I'm glad to see you anytime. <laughs> at all our events. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for is yours now. Yes, thank you. So we will start then. We will start with our first speaker. I'm very excited to announce her. So uh, she is co-founder, CEO, and the first female Google developer expert for Flutter and Dart in Pakistan. And um, I answer questions in several forums and Telegram channels about Flutter. They ask me about, hey, how, how to implement these background services in Flutter? So I always tell that, okay, watch Sakina's videos. So here now announcing Sakina Abbas with a different topic this time. And it's very interesting. So welcome Sakine. Sakina. Uh, let's have you in the stage. Hello. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Great. So it is really uh, amazing to be at another Flutter event. <laughs> we hear a lot yes, about Flutter. Absolutely. <laughs> Everywhere. And this kind of conferences are really amazing chance to be with together in the community. So uh, today you will have a different topic. So stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, could you just add my... Thanks. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Hope you guys are doing well. Um, my name is Sakina Buzz, and today we will be learning and discovering how you can enhance your Flutter application's accessibility by making it accessible through Google Actions, in essence. So you will be learning how you can uh, use Google Assistant to access certain features or areas of your Flutter Android application. Quite interesting because uh, not many documentation or tutorials are available on this. So um, before I get started, just a quick introduction. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, hello, my name is Sakina Abbas. I am the co-founder and CEO of Reactree, which is a software house. Um, I am also a Google developer expert for Flutter and Dart. Initially, I started off as a native Android developer, and then I eventually transitioned towards Flutter development, which is what I'm currently doing here at Reactree. Um, I am a core member of Flutter Karachi Pakistan, as well as a women in tech uh, speaker for Google Developer Space Singapore. So you can kind of understand um, my relatability towards the topic for today, which is um, we will be looking at a lot of native coding, native Android aspect side of things. But if you're a beginner, that's not an issue. Uh, you will just get the clear idea of if you were to implement a similar kind of um, feature or enhancement in your Flutter Android application, then how you do it. So um, before going into the technical of, uh, of today's topic, have you ever felt the need to access an application on the go? Um, so an example might be, let's say that um, you are trying to search for something on an application. So let's say you don't want to specifically open up YouTube and search for cat videos on YouTube. But in fact, you just want to go, um, hey, Google, um, search for cat videos on YouTube, and you just want to get that uh, result very quickly populated into your application. Um, maybe you just want to navigate to a specific area or a specific screen into your application, into any application instead. So let's say um, you're using LinkedIn, for instance. So, um, uh, right, sorry. Uh, my bad, right? So if let's say you're accessing LinkedIn, for instance, and you are searching for, hey, open um, 
the available jobs in Pakistan for this area in LinkedIn. And it, if it has an action or an intent implemented for it, it will open it up in LinkedIn, right? Um, maybe, and this is something that almost all of us have done. So you don't want to specifically open up Spotify. You don't want to specifically search for a, for, a, for a band or for a music that you want to play. You just go like, hey, Google, play Linkin Park on Spotify and just, just starts playing in an instant. Or maybe you just want to save a note for later. And there are so many other actions that we often do, such as, hey, save this uh, note or save this reminder for later or set an alarm for this time or call this person, text this person, et cetera, et cetera. So there are so many actions that we often have to do. And this is where Google Assistant comes into play. So like uh, many of us might already be aware of it, Google Assistant is um, an AI-based virtual assistant developed by Google. And it's currently supported for obviously the mobile as well as home, automa home automation devices such as smart TVs. So we were talking about Android mobile phones as well as smart TVs and other um, IoT based devices basically. Um, now Google Assistant, it just it does not just engage in a one in a singular uh, direction uh, conversation. Instead, if you're asking it, let's say, um, uh, hey, Google, save a note. It will ask you back, like, what is the text or what specifically note do you want to be saved, right? So it engages in a two-way com communication. And the reason for establishing these minor details here is that Google Assistant in itself is very powerful if you know how to use it. And um, in today's session, we will be looking at a very very basic implementation of uh, Google Assistant with our Flutter application. So let's see where that goes. Um, so these are just some of the top um, companies that are currently using Google Assistant. So obviously Spotify is my number one and go-to example because I personally use Spotify with Google Assistant um, a lot. And then there's obviously Twitter, uh, Snapchat, Etsy, and you get the idea. Now. A lot of us have probably used Google Assistant by, by now, but in order to understand how to implement it technically as a developer, let's first look at the bigger picture as to how does this even work, right? So you're a user, you just open Google Assistant and uh, say like, hey, Google order pizza from example app. So that is your user's query. And once Google Assistant receives an input from the user, whether it is by voice, whether it is by typing, it parses that, um, that input and it uh, tries to identify or extract if there is any action, if there is any capability, or in a sense, if there is any intent mapped to the specific um, action that was requested by the user. Once it has done its parsing and it does all this extraction, it identifies like, okay, so um, um, let's suppose if we're talking about example app. So is there any application called example app that is installed on the user's device, number one? And number two, if it is, does this application support the capability or the action that the user has requested? And if it has done that, then it you know, uh, goes to the Android side of things and then it uh, does all of its um, magic working that we will be looking into in today's session. And then it finally uh, gives uh, its feedback to the end user, which is either by opening up the application to a specific page, to a specific screen, or um, showing them a certain message like, okay, notes have been saved to your application or, you know, just a feedback message. Now, the question is this, that can we build this with Flutter? And Bob the Builder says we definitely and absolutely can. So uh, before we uh, get into the details of how we can do this in Flutter, here are a couple of important terminologies that uh, we should understand so that we don't get confused or lost when we're trying to you know, implement these things. Now, number one, what is an activity? An activity is referred to any single screen in Android. So that's basically an activity. So for Flutter developers, if you might go into the Android block in your project, 
and you go into source, you expand Java or you expand Kotlin, you will see a, a main activity, right? So that's kind of like the main Android screen that is first launched and then that uh, bridges that channel with Flutter and then your Flutter or your Darts execution starts from that point, right? So activity is any single screen. What about an action? An action is a user's input uh, that is being fed into the Google Assistant. So essentially what to perform. So let's say order pasta, play music, save a note, call XYZ. These are all actions, right? Then we're talking about intent. Now intent is the main thing that we will be working with. So this is something that lets you start an activity in any other application by describing an action that you wish to perform. So <clears throat> in essence, it's a combination of action plus activity, and it's mapped to a specific value or a specific key that uh, your framework or that uh, your application then registers or Google Assistant tries to look for it when it's uh, doing all that parsing mumbo jumbo, right? So let's say, um, uh, if, if the user is requesting to play music in Spotify, then there is actually a built-in intent uh, that, that supports this thing. So you don't have to write any of your custom code for this. All of these intents are built in. So most of the functionality is already attributed to it. You just need to configure them in your application, link them with Flutter, and you're good to go. Uh, talking about intents, there are several uh, common built-in intents, um, like I was just mentioning, that Android currently supports. So this is just a snapshot, a brief, a very brief snapshot of what um, of what we currently have in Android as common built-in intents. So we have the open app feature. It uh, launches any specific screen or place within your application. Uh, then there is a um, create thing uh, built-in intent that lets you create a new entry or a new entity in your application. Then there is get thing uh, right over here. There is this uh, built-in intent called get thing. And what it does is that if your application supports um, search functionality, such as in LinkedIn, Spotify, YouTube, Twitter, etc. Then uh, if you go for like search for uh, Sakina Buzz on LinkedIn, and if it has uh, the support, the support for this intent, then it will launch the specific search screen in the LinkedIn application. And with uh, Sakina Buzz, let's say, already fed into the search bar. And if there are any search results, then they will start getting populated onto your screen. So yes, uh, that's, that's how it goes. Now, talking about the prerequisites, now we have all discussed about what Google Assistant is, what's the, what are the terminologies that you need to be familiar with, how do they work with in practice, and now that we're talking about how to actually incorporate this amazing, exciting stuff, what do you actually need? So definitely you will need a Flutter project, but more specifically Android. Obviously, obviously, because iOS has Siri, it does not have Google Assistant. So then you need to have a Google Play account. Uh, this is because um, when you're testing your app actions, you need to upload your um, app bundle or APK to Google Play uh, Console. And the reason for that is uh, you need to obviously test your app actions. Now, if you're expecting that you've uh, set up all the intents, you've made all the links, you've set up all your method channels, et cetera, et cetera, and you're expecting that um, you will just launch the Google Assistant like you normally do for other applications like Spotify in your device and you ask it to do something, it will not register your application because currently your application is number one in debug mode. And number two, it is not registered anywhere in the Google Play uh, console. So it will not be able to do that parsing that we were talking about that, hey, does this application exist? And if this application exists, then does it have these capabilities or actions configured into it, right? So you need to have a Google Play account so that you can upload your um, project or you can upload your Android build over there. 
not necessarily in production mode. No way, not at all. You just need to upload it in internal or closed testing. Uh, just keep it private to you. It's uh, used for testing out app, uh, app, app actions for a debug build. Um, and you do that by using app actions test tool. So we will be looking into all of these steps uh, once I'm done with all of the theoretical side of things, right? So obviously you need a Google Play account. Next, you need an Android Studio. Uh, and uh, not just Android Studio, but you also need to sign in to Android Studio with the exact same uh, Google account that is associated to the Google Play account in step number two. Then you obviously need a either a physical Android device or an emulator with Google Assistant already there. And uh, make sure that the Google Assistant is, again, logged in or it is set up with uh, the, the, the Gmail account that is being used with your Google Play account. And the last thing that you need is an App Actions test tool. It is, it is a plugin that you can easily download and install uh, within Android Studio. Now, some of you might get this quick uh, question in your mind, which I might classify as NFAQ, because naturally most of us developers, we often work with VS Code. So your question might be, get, um, can we test out our app actions if we're just you know, using VS Code? And my answer would be no. I did some research and I, at least as per my research, I did not find App Actions tool currently supported for VS Code. It's only there in Android Studio. Um, I don't know why, uh, maybe it's still in beta, maybe it's still in working. So yeah, uh, but the essence is this, that you can still do all of the rest of your coding using VS Code, but just in order to test your app actions, you will need Android Studio. Now the recipe. So first of all, uh, we will be looking at two steps for Android, uh, native Android, and then two steps for Dart, which is Flutter. So for the Android side of things, the first thing that you need to do is you need to create an actions.xml file with a built-in intent that you wish to use. In our case, we will be using um, this one, the first one over here, right here, open app feature, so that we can open the application by using Google Assistant. Uh, I have added the complete path over here, so you actually need to go inside your Android directory, app folder, source, main, res, uh, create a folder called XML, and inside that, create this file called actions.xml. And in that, you will be uh, defining all of the actions that your application uses. Once you're done with actions.xml, you will then um, introduce its reference in your Android manifest at the application level. So not at the activity level. This was a mistake that I had previously made and it took me a really long time to figure out that, okay, the reason it's not working or the reason it's not firing up is because my reference exists at the activity level. So it had to be taken out and put um, at, the, at the application level. So inside the application tag, but outside uh, all the activity tags. Then once you're done with this, uh, the third thing that you need to do is obviously handle this intent in uh, main activity. If you're using Kotlin, then .kd or Java, then obviously .java. And uh, now comes the interesting part of how to link it with Flutter. So uh, this is something that can go into two directions. Number one, you can either um, handle opening up of your application via Google uh, Assistant by using dynamic links. You can either use Firebase dynamic links over here, or if for some reason you don't wish to go towards dynamic linking, then you can you always have the option to go towards method channel. So it's entirely up to you. It depends on your use case, how you wish to uh, take this forward. If uh, you're using uh, method channels, then you will obviously have to uh, write its implementation in your main activity in native Kotlin or Java code. And uh, the other thing that you'll have to do is you will have to handle its response and then your state management and everything else in on the Dart side of things, right? So uh, that's 
how we will be uh, looking at into the code. I already have all the code set up, so I will be showing you all of the uh, all of the uh, parts that I took care of and how you can do what we're trying to do. Now, once you're done with the configuration side of things, the next thing is obviously testing whether whatever you configured is working properly or not. For this, you need to create a signed app bundle or an APK uh, from your Flutter project. And once you've generated that, you obviously need to upload that to the Google Play console. Um, feel free to upload it inside internal or closed testing. Again, it's not at all mandatory that you have to uh, open it up for public because that's not how it works, right? So that's that. Uh, the next thing is this, that um, in... Now, at this point, you kind of need to fire up Android Studio. Uh, here's the challenge that I faced. So I had uh, App Actions test tool downloaded, but uh, it wouldn't create a preview, as in it wouldn't create that set of environment that I needed in order to test App Actions on my Flutter app. And the reason was that um, it's not directly compatible with Flutter. So but there's a workaround for this. So that's that's what I'm talking about over here. So naturally, whenever you're working on a Flutter project, you just have the Flutter project in front of you, right? So you have the Android directory, you have the iOS directory, you have the lib directory, and basically all the Flutter side of things, right? You have to go a step deeper down and just uh, open up the Android module of your Flutter application in Android Studio. When you do that, and then in step number three, when you fire up your App Actions test tool, it will work like a charm and it will not give you any errors whatsoever. So once you've created your, uh, once you've opened up the App Actions test tool, um, it will ask you to create a preview. So in that, you just have to mention your app name, which will be uh, used for when you're giving input to Google Assistant, right? And then you can just um, test it out with your Flutter application. So uh, let's access our Flutter application through Google Assistant. Let me share a different screen. Can you just uh, pull this up, please? Awesome. So um, here is my project. Um, uh, here's my ID, in fact, and I have my device running over here. So what I'm going to do is that, first of all, I will just um, access Google Assistant and show you whether it's working as intended and promised. So let's see about that. Open Coffee Vagera app. So this is an application that's already, um, it's actually in fact publicly available on um, Play Store. So I just leveraged that as I didn't have to upload any other specific application just to get this thing to work. So it's, uh, it's an application that's already running in the market. And I just added this extension to this as to if you can just, you know, open up the application using um, Google Assistant, right? So this is kind of how it's working. Now let's look into the code and the processes that I followed in order to get this thing to work. Now, um, over here on the left side, I have my Flutter application over here. So you can see that this is my Coffee Vivera application, which is my Flutter project. And over here, the first thing that uh, I have is my actions.xml. This is a file that I have created inside my Android app source uh, main resources xml and actions.xml okay so over here uh what we what we have done is that we are using the intent called open app feature what it does is that whatever um uh, whatever query you provide to it 
it will um, take that query parameter. It will see what needs to be opened. It will first see if there is any activity or a screen mapped to the specific um, query parameter that it has extracted. If it finds it, it will open that specific screen. If it does not find it, then it will open up the, um, the, the basically the base URL or the base or the home screen of your application, which is this home screen in my case in Coffee Wagera. So um, over here, as we can see is, um, again, this is something that you can easily find from either Code Labs or the, the common intents that we were just looking at. So this, so first you have actions. Over here, you can describe a list of actions. So I have uh, my first and only action over here. And then I have an entity set over here, right? I'll come uh, to this later, like what exactly is an entity set? Um, first thing you obviously need to uh, define what intent you're specifically using here, which is uh, the open app feature intent in our case. The next thing is you need to mention the fulfillment URL template. So fulfillment means that if it, if it finds an intent mapped to the specific application, then what should it do? Where should it redirect the user to? So in our case, I have mentioned this URL scheme such as app uh, colon forward slash forward slash CW. And open is something that is coming here by default. So if you need to customize it according to your need, this is the only portion that you would modify in your case. So if you're using dynamic linking, I'm just by the way, for the sake of clarity, I'm not using Firebase dynamic links in my case, right? So uh, you can either give it a custom host and a custom source, and you can do it like I've done it over here. Or if you want to go deep dive into your application. So if I were to say open up menu in Coffeeware application and you expected that it would open this menu screen right here then you would obviously have to either handle it through uh, dynamic links or method channel, like I said. Currently, we don't have this mapping at the moment to keep it very basic and simple. So this is like the general URL template. Uh, so what URL scheme will be followed? This is the action that it will be doing by default. And this is the feature name that it provides you. So when you're working with method channels, you can access this uh, feature name to extract uh, elements uh, from or extract data from the incoming intent, right? So this is the parameter mapping over here. Again, this is something that you should not change. You should keep this as it is. Otherwise, you will have to um, mimic those changes into your deep down code level as well. So you don't want to change this. Then we have um, a reference such as parameter name feature. So we have this in, uh, intent parameter called feature. What is it mapped to? Uh, so we have defined like, hey, these are the, uh, this is my inventory set, or these are my uh, set of uh, elements or set of entities that could be possibly mapped to this feature. So I could say, uh, open up menu in Coffee Wagera. So this would pertain to, or this would map to this over here, or I'd say open up locations in Coffee Wagera, and it would open up locations over here. Or if I would say, open up my profile in Coffee Wagera, it will not match, or it will not find any, uh, any entity mapped to that feature. So it will just default to the home screen in our uh, fulfillment URL, okay? So this is kind of how it works. Now that we're done with the actions.xml, uh, we head over to our Android manifest, all right? And we just uh, create a reference for it and we just create an intent filter for it. So our intent filter is basically where we are uh, defining our fulfillment URL scheme. So in our case, the scheme is app, as in we're not using any dynamic links, so no HTTPS over here. If you would be using dynamic links, you'd put in HTTP or HTTPS over here. Um, if not, we're doing it locally at the app level, so you can just put an app. That's the scheme. Uh, now, you can pass anything in the host. Make sure that whatever you're passing over here, it's consistent with whatever you are using right over here, okay? 
So you just create this intent filter. Again, uh, this is some code that you just need to copy paste from when you're uh, co configuring built-in intents in your application. The next thing that you need to do is you need to declare a reference to this actions.xml file that you've just created. And as you can see, this has been done at the very application level. So it's not inside any specific activity. It's at the application. It's at the root of it so that the App Actions tool can easily find it. And later on, when you put your application into production mode, then even Google Assistant registers it very easily. OK, now that we're done with this, the third thing is obviously main activity, which is right here. So app, source, main, Kotlin, da, 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 main activity. Now, what have I done over here? Um, you just need to override your configure Flutter engine function over here. This is, um, uh, this is a change that was introduced when uh, the Android V2 embedding was in enforced and the previous one was uh, you know, just completely, the support for that has been removed. Otherwise, you would be doing on, on create, but that's old story. The current thing is that you just need to override a function called configure Flutter engine. Uh, this is just some boilerplate code, so feel free to ignore these things. The actual thing is that um, whatever intent you're getting, right? Uh, whatever intent you're getting, you just extract its value over here. And then this is the main thing, right? So this is the method channel, which will be forwarding this intent information to the Flutter engine, right? Because so far, what was happening is that you open Google Assistant, you uh, set it to do something, the Google Assistant started parsing whatever you've told it to do. It found that, okay, there's an application, number one, and it uh, number two, it found that, okay, they have a, an intent that is mapped to these specific words, and now uh, let's try to forward it to the Android channel. The thing comes into the Android channel, uh, this method is triggered, uh, the method channel is invoked, and at this point, it says, OK, if my incoming data is not null, then uh, let's let's uh, pass it forward to the Flutter engine so that now you can move your working and state management handling at the Flutter side of things. So you just pass it to your Flutter engine over here. And then in your Flutter application, wherever you need to handle this response, you just implement uh, it over here. So you just um, call on to this method channel with this uh, channel name, which is the shared channel name. Make sure that the channel name and the, uh, and the message and the methods name is consistent with whatever you have configured into your um, main activity. So in our case, the methods name is get MC response. And the channel's name is app channel shared data. Okay. So make sure that these are consistent with uh, your implementation in Dart. Now, over here, we've done nothing fancy. We've just called on to it and we have, um, we have, uh, checked whether the incoming data is null, it's not null, and then we've just printed it. And this is basically now left open to you how you would want to uh, go forward with it. So um, right now, I was telling you that we have the basic thing implemented. That is, if you just say open um, open Coffeeware application, it will do that using Google Assistant. But if you were to say open um, open menu in Go in uh, Coffeeware application, then right now for this, we don't have it mapped or we don't have it handled over here in our method channel. So um, it will not reroute the, it, will, it won't open up the menu screen per se, but it will open up the fallback that is our home screen in our case. So, uh, now I understand that method channel is something that is advanced, which is the very reason that I kind of left it out from here. So if it's something that's too complicated for you, you can always give uh, Firebase Dynamic Links a try. Uh, but if you want to challenge yourself, if you want to actually do uh, 
some some deep level coding or handling of incoming intents in your Flutter application, then obviously method channel will be your go to um, go to logic or style. All right. Now, uh, having done this, let me. Um, I think we're running a bit short on time. So let me just quickly tell you about the tool and how you can test it out. So, um, OK. So on Mac, I can just open up my preferences by pressing Command and Comma. I will search for plugins. Right. So I have plugins. I have this app actions test tool already downloaded and, and installed. So if you want to uh, install it, you just go over to Marketplace, you search for app actions uh, test tool, and it will show up over here that you can then install from here. And uh, this will actually be used for you to test out your actions because right now, the reason I was able to test out my actions directly from Google Assistant was because my application is actually deployed. So Google Assistant registers this as an application, right? But for, for applications that are not yet uh, publicly available, App Actions tool is how you would be testing your actions in your application. So um, for this, what I had to do was that if you were to open your tools from here, App Actions test tools from here, um, then you will get an error like this, like no Android module with actions file reference was found. So you need to create one um, in order to you know, get this working. Now, obviously, we have this reference. We have the actions XML file. So naturally, um, we already have that file, right? So the next thing that you need to do is um, close it. You will um, click over here, open. You will go inside your application, which is Coffeeware user in our case. You will click on Android, and you will Click on Android and then you will click on open, right? So what this will do is that it will open up just the Android module of your um, of your Flutter application, which is open right over here. As you can see, it's showing the Android icon at the top as well. Okay. So once this is open, uh, try running uh, the App Actions test tool again from here and um, see if it works. And it does. It doesn't give you any error whatsoever. And it does give you a prompt to update preview. I already have my preview set up, which is why I'm looking at this kind of wizard. But if you were using it for the very first time, you would have seen something that we saw the previous time when we encountered that error. So basically, you just have to enter an invocation name. Invocation name is kind of optional in this wizard, but it's good to have it so that when you're testing out uh, with Google Assistant, you just go like, uh, OK, Google, open Coffee Wagera app. So it would you know, try to find where Coffee Wagera exists, what package name it's associated to, and then further drill down what intents it or what actions it supports. Right. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that you can actually um, choose which action you want to test out from here. Because we only have one action listed in our actions.xml, then it's just showing up over here. And this is the feature. So this is something that you know you can pass in your custom features over here. So if we had a menu, a menus deep linking setup, and we would have typed in menu over here. So it would have uh, had actually, you know, um, open up the application. So let's just quickly test it out. For this, let me uh, build this for the first time, just for the first time. And then we can just test it directly. All right, the reason that I said that you need to um, build and run your application for the very first time when you're testing out your 
uh, app actions from the app actions test tool is because if you didn't and you would try to run it, it will say that the application is not installed, right? So um, these are just some, some things that even you will learn and understand along the way when you're working with it. So yes. Okay, so now that our application is up and running, let's just click on run and see what happens. Okay, so it showed us Google Assistant and then it opened up the application. Now um, let's uh, close this application, go back and run this again. And this is kind of how you test it, right? Uh, I hope this gave you the sufficient knowledge uh, that you found insightful and useful. And I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing more and more people supercharge their Flutter applications with Google Assistant, even if it's something as simple as just opening up your application via Google Assistant so that it's greater accessibility. So yeah, that's it from my side. Um, if we have time for questions, I will be taking them now. Uh, Kagate, you're mute. I'm always mute. And thank you very much. We have another reference talk for, from you. Like I said, like background actions, uh, background work. Now we have these actions. So first question, how is it with iOS? So Google Action, is it only for Androids? Yes, it is only for Android, like I said, because um, iOS has Siri. So there actually there's even support present for Siri. It kind of works in a similar fashion like we just saw in Android. The difference is obviously um, in Android, we have activities, we have intents. So you just need to catch that intent. You need to extract the data from that intent. And then you have to pass it forward to the Flutter engine using a method channel. For um, iOS side of things, we will have to look into what's the uh, Siri equivalent in iOS and you just have to extract data in that fashion and make the necessary configurations there. But the, but the common thing in both of them is that you need to forward it either using dynamic links or method channels to your Flutter engine. Thank you. Another question is again about the ecosystem. So, you know, it is we have this Google Action with Google ecosystem works very well, Flutter. And then there is uh, AWS and there is Azure. So if we take the case of AWS, have you ever tried to move your code to a Lambda? Is it simple and any performance results? Um, honestly, I have not yet tried it. I can't give any comment on this. Great, okay. Okay, now this is a personal question from me. So you have Android background. So for Flutter developers who don't have native experience, do you think they should really focus on native at some point in their career? Because I received this question so many times. Right, so as a beginner, obviously that's not a mandatory requirement as in if you have absolutely no experience with native, um, it's completely fine because Flutter is designed in a way that it doesn't give you roadblocks in whatever you're trying to develop in Flutter. But yes, at some point you will need to get yourself familiar or equipped with some minimum level of knowledge, uh, whether it's at the Android level, whether it's at the iOS level, because obviously Flutter is cross-platform. And whenever you're building any application for multiple platforms, you need to configure it accordingly. So mm -hmm. in the case of Android, let's say it's good to know what a Gradle file is, what the manifest file is, what a resource file is, you know, just basic stuff like that. And it's perfectly fine, again, if you don't remember the syntax you can always google it that's how us developers work but yes at some point it would definitely help out and the last thing is this that um if you have um if you have accumulated sufficient experience working with flutter and you want to 
do something very advanced, uh, such as while working with background services or while working with meta channels, uh, like in Google Assistant in our case, then obviously you will need to equip yourself with uh, even the coding syntax of Kotlin or Java, whatever uh, suits you, or Swift or Objective-C. So this is kind of how it works. And it's not that difficult, right? It sounds difficult, but it is not. <laughs> it's actually okay, another... not. Well, it's yes, actually not, not because um, when you're talking about native development, so um, native development, it allows you to build an application for one specific platform. And for that, you need to equip yourself with the coding style or with the basically the language and the framework. So the entire thing, you need to learn that, right? In Flutter, it's already cross-platform. So you just need to uh, write small chunks of code and not that frequent, very rarely when you're working on those side of things. So again, it's kind of like a greater cost-benefit analysis. Yeah. But we love Flutter more. <laughs> okay, we don't have much time, but you already answered this question. It requires Android Studio, not VS Code. Am I right? I absolutely, absolutely endorse Android Studio. I love Android uh, Studio personally. Okay, I, think... I use Android Studio personally, and yes. Yeah. But this Google Actions, what I meant, requires Android Studio. Google yes, it requires models. Android Studio because the App Actions test tool, it's currently only supported on Android Studio, not VS Code. OK, and thank you very much. We have more questions, but we don't have much time. And we have another GDE on the line. So Sakina, it was amazing talk. And thank you very much. And hope to see you in another conferences as well. <laughs> have a nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. OK, we are continuing with another GDE, Max Lin. Hello, Max. Hi, Katage. How are you? I'm great. Uh, it is Chatai. I know it's very difficult. Ch Chatai, name. sorry. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm used Chatai. to it. No problem. Totally fine. So I hope you're having a great time. We had great. We started with a very great talk, and we are a bit over time. So I just want to give you the stage. Use your time, and let's see you in the QA. No worries. Thanks very much. I'll just Thank let you. me just share my screen. Let's get that rolling. Okay, hopefully it's coming up now. Awesome. So th welcome everyone. Um, today, I wanted to talk to you about uh, a REPL for Dart. So what I want to start off with saying is that there will be a demo, but uh, there'll be a demo at uh, the end of uh, the presentation rather than uh, at the start or in the middle. So I uh, wanted to let you know there will be one, but we won't be doing it straight away. So what we will be doing first is I wanted to cover a few items um, with you. Sorry, the I think the slides are a little bit um, behind versus what I see on my screen. So uh, first off, what I want to do is give you a quick intro to uh, what we'll be talking about today, which is a REPL. So I'd like to like cover off a few things that we'll be covering there. Oops. Oh, oh dear, what's happened here? So, yeah. so just get that back. So yeah, first thing I would like to do is cover what we'll be a quick introduction to uh, the uh, what REPLs are, talk about the history of REPLs, and uh, maybe have a look behind the curtain and show you a few of the elements of what goes in or what has gone into making the uh, REPL for uh, Dart. Finally, I'd also like, um, as I mentioned, to do a demo, but we'll do that at the end uh, once we've gone through the other things. So the first thing I wanted to do in, in um, giving you a quick introduction is to talk about what is a REPL. So Wikipedia has a fantastic uh, description or explanation of what REPL is, and it basically comes down to read, eval, print, loop. So it's an acronym. And it's really all about what that, what that explanation says, taking single user inputs 
executing them, and then returning the results of that execution to the user. And it actually goes back a fairly long way in the history of um, computing. Like it's really all about um, coming from the days of Lisp and Lisp evaling, evaluating uh, expressions. And remember that word expressions, we'll be coming back to that in a moment and talking about uh, why expressions are important. So I guess the first question or the first thing we want to talk about or is why is there no eval, uh, so why is there no Dart REPL already? One of the things that make it hard is that there's no eval in Dart. So for example, in JavaScript, you have a function called eval, you pass it some um, JavaScript and it evaluates it for you. We don't have this nice convenience in Dart. There's also no bytecode in uh, Dart. There actually used to be bytecode, um, there was a thing called Dart um, bytecode, but it was deprecated and removed from um, the Dart SDK a while ago. So we don't have that convenience either to try and uh, execute piece, small pieces of Dart code for us. Finally, modern Dart is compiled to what are called kernel files. So even when you run Dart on the command line with Dart, say demo.dart or whatever dot Dart, that's actually first compiling into these kernel files, and then those are being passed off to the Dart virtual machine to be run. So even in this particular case, you're not the Dart VM doesn't ex execute your Dart code directly. It does so on it actually executes the kernel files that were first pre-compiled from your Dart code. So. As they say in the in the movies, that never stopped anyone, though. All right, there are lots of reasons not to do it or why it hasn't been done, but let's see if it can actually be done. Now, in this particular case, I have to first mention that really I'm standing on the shoulders of uh, giants with this work. So what happened was actually all the way back in uh, 2017, a Googler by the name of Andreas Kirsch, I hope you got his name right, um, actually wrote two articles and created a proof of concept package for a Dart REPL. He actually did some great work showing how, despite those um, issues that I mentioned previously and others, like it was still possible to create a REPL a Dart, at least as a proof of concept. So what happened was I came across this in around 2020, but what had happened is in the meantime, in those inter intervening years, uh, his code had bit rotted and it no longer worked with the latest stable version of Dart, which was Dart 2 at that time. So I came across it because I was actually looking, I was hoping I could find a, an existing REPL because I needed it for a project I was working on, or I needed to use it as a part of a project I was working on. So what I did was I took uh, Andreas's fantastic work and basically just updated just enough of it primarily just using um, the VM service, which I'll talk about uh, soon. I just basically created a gist of uh, just enough dark code to get something half decent, well, just enough to get something working that I needed from my project. And that's basically where I left it. Like I um, created the gist, thought maybe some people might use it, but I, it was enough for what I wanted to do and I moved on. And actually what happened was I moved on for about two years. And then at the start of this year, I actually, actually was just um, pinged on GitHub on one of the issues in uh, the Dart Lang, um, uh, the Dart Lang GitHub repo. And like a couple of people there were asking about uh, things to do with a Dart REPL. So I innocuously, or well, I thought at the time, not enough, just left this um, comment on another uh, GitHub issue for the Dart Lang SDK, which has actually been asking for a Dart REPL for some time. It's been there for quite a while. And what happened was after a bit of, bit of backwards and forwards with other um, comments and like under contributions from people from the Dart team, uh, what ended up happening was I ended up actually making a package called REPL. 
um, to try and actually address this um, need that, that was clearly evident in the community that having a REPL for DAR would be a useful thing. So I created a new package, uploaded it, uh, created a GitHub repo, uploaded it to pub. And that was uh, the start of this, uh, I guess, uh, package that has come about today. So once I'd created the package, like I had just enough working that it seemed to be useful. So again, I posted and let people know. But the whole point of this talk is to not just say that we've got now at least the beginnings of a REPL for Dart, but to have a look at like what makes up uh, the page and what code has gone into making it, <coughs> excuse me, work. So I'm just waiting for the slides to catch up. And so in having a look at what makes uh, the package work, one thing that's going to be important is to look at the difference between expressions versus statements versus built-ins, what they are and why it's important to differentiate between them. I'm also going to have a quick look at um, using the VM service and I'll also talk about what the VM service is and why it's important for the REPL and why it might also be useful for your code. And finally, I'll also cover hot reload and how it comes into the picture of uh, REPL and why it's useful. So first of all, uh, the first thing I've, I've got on that list is expressions versus statements versus built-ins. So what we need to do is, this, well, first we need to talk about what is the difference between each of those things? So in Dart, what is an expression? Because remember, like we, if you go back to that um, slide I showed at the start, ex evaluating expressions was like the, one of the key things in Lisp that um, REPLs came out of. So what is an expression in Dart? Well, an expression is, in Dart is basically things that evaluate to a result. Like I'm not a compiler um, engineer. I'm not a computer science kind of person. So for me, I'm, I'm probably not going to provide the strict uh, computer science definitions of what, say, an expression and a statement is. But when I think about expressions in Dart, it's things that evaluate to a result. So if you do like one plus two, or if you call a function or a method on an object that returns a result, that's pretty much what an expression in Dart is. So what about statements in that case? What makes a, uh, oops, sorry. What makes a uh, statement? Oh, sorry, I'll just, Go back to my presenter video. So there we go. Well, in, in Dart, basically statements are everything else. You have variables when you're declaring them. You have functions when you're defining them. And of course, cl classes. So when you're defining or declaring all these things, that's basic. basically everything that's not an expression, if you like, is a statement. So all these things make up a statement in Dart. Now, finally, we've got uh, built-ins. Now, built-ins, you might be wondering, well, what is a built-in? That doesn't sound like something part of Dart, and it's not really. Built-ins um, I included here because they're quite a common thing in other languages, REPLs, that I thought would be useful for Dart's REPL as well. So these are typically global functions. Some of them might be built into the language. So for instance, you might recognize exit. That's like a global or it, that's in the Dart SDK or print is another global that's in the um, Dart SDK. So things like that global functions from the Dart, from the Dart language, you can think of them as built-ins, but usually what people think of as built-ins is uh, like things that have been added as globals by the REPL itself. So for instance, I added the function hot reload. Now, I guess what you might be wondering is how can we tell which input is which? 
So the easy way to tell is you, you call a function that says, is it a statement? You pass it the input and it'll tell you, return you true or false. Now, this might seem like, yeah, a little bit of a hilarious way to do it, but literally this is uh, taken straight out of the Dart packages, the Dart REPL packages code. Of course, there's a bit more to it than that, but there's not a lot more. The good thing is, is that there's a fantastic package from uh, the Dart team called Package Analyzer, which you may have heard of because it's the thing that uh, drives the analysis tool inside uh, in, in the Dart SDK. And the nice thing is, is that basically the code that you're seeing there is all you need when you're using the analyzer package to figure out if something is a statement or not. You just basically ask it to parse it as a statement, your input, and it'll tell you whether it worked or not. So if it did, it's a statement. If it didn't, it's not. And luckily, we basically know if it's not a statement, it's mo pretty likely that it's an expression. So next thing I wanted to cover that's very useful inside the Dart REPL is the VM service. Now, the VM service is actually the internal functionality that supports things like debuggers. So when you're using debugger in VS Code or Android Studio, it's actually using the facilities of the VM service inside the Dart VM to do things like debugging, like, you know, breakpoints, whatever that you're doing using when you're um, running the debugger. And one of the things you can do with the debugger is evaluate expressions. Like people might not know this, but there's um, a feature in, the, in Dart debuggers that let you evaluate an expression. And that's actually the functionality that the Dart package, um, the Dart REPL package makes use of uh, when it evaluates expressions in the REPL. So really, again, by leaning on this package, there's not, this is the key basically bit of uh, code that does, there's a little bit more to it than that in the package if you go have a look at the source code, but essentially that's all it takes to get a expression evaluated for the REPL. And also with hot reload, that's another piece of functionality that comes from the VM service. People associate, I think, um, especially Flutter developers think of hot reload as a Flutter thing, but in fact, it's actually a Dart facility. And really all you need to do to make use of hot reload yourself, like the, uh, the REPL package does, is get hold of the VM service. And there's just a uh, function called reload sources that you call on the VM service object. and that'll do the hot reload for you. Now, having covered those kind of like core bits of the functionality of the REPL, the other thing I wanted to talk about was the spit and polish of um, the package. And so in terms of sp sp spit and polish, when I talk about that, what do I mean? It's things that, it's the nice features, the quality of life features that people expect, especially coming from other languages, which have a REPL that we'd want to have in uh, the Dart wrap as well. So things I'm talking about is input editing. So, you know, when you're at entering your input into the REPL, you want to be able to edit it, you know, backspace, like delete, what, whatever, like add new, new text. And of course, keyboard shortcuts, like, you know, be able to jump to the start and end of the line, that sort of thing. There's input history. So if you're familiar with using a command line shell, you know, like you want to be able to, or any other REPLs, like it's very typical that you use, you know, up arrows and uh, the up and down arrows to cycle through your input, your previous input um, history. If you want to rerun a command or something again. And also autocomplete, like it's quite common that REPLs will support some form of autocomplete to a lesser or greater extent. In just to be upfront, in Dart Red Hole, that's a to do, like that's not supported yet, but it's definitely something that um, I've got planned. So, in terms of polish, how did I implement this? Well, the what, what I ended up doing is essentially I just used another package. So, luckily for me, uh, when I did a little bit of searching around, I actually came across a package on PubDev called CLI REPL. And CLI REPL basically provides a lot of that functionality that we just listed. It, it handles things like input history, keyboard shortcuts, command line editing, all those nice to have features come 
essentially out of the box with this package. So it was a, a clear choice to make use of it for Dart REPL itself. And it, of course, it doesn't hurt that it's got REPL in its name as well. So finally, uh, I've come to the demo. So uh, I'm not great with talking and typing and explaining all at the same time. So I've got like a, just a pre-recorded um, demo of the using the Dart REPL here that I'd like to show you. Oops, uh, actually, I'll just uh, maximize it like this to give you a better view. So here you can see, like, basically it started up by running the main file, the main.dart. And you may have noticed that it took a little while. I'll talk about that later. So here, first of all, can, I can show you, like, essentially you can have a statement which defines a variable A. You can then have an expression which makes use of that variable, and it works as you expect. This is all pretty um, basic stuff. But um, here you, you can see what it's doing is it's, deciding whether it's a statement or an expression because they're handled differently as we've talked about previously. Also here, you can see me entering a simple uh, function definition. So then like uh, when it's entered, you can see the, I've just got a, basically some feedback saying that a, re, a hot reload happened. And then you can call that function with the previously defined uh, variable and it does as you expect, it squares the number. Finally, you can see also here, I'm entering a very simple class definition, nothing fancy here. And in fact, the reason I'm entering it is that when, you, when I actually press enter and submit it, you can see it actually comes back with a not recognized. This is actually, I know why I wanted to include this was this is actually a known issue at the moment with a, with the Dart REPL package. And it's one of the to-dos for me to fix is that class declarations aren't supported at the moment. Finally, I just wanted to show you here a demonstration of there, me editing the current uh, line with that um, CLI package I mentioned previously. And just using the built-in print, well, it's actually the global function print to actually um, print, but it's actually been handled as a built-in in the REPL. If you look at the code, the built-in calls the actual itself, the actual print function itself. Finally, I wanted to demonstrate calling exit with the wrong number of variables. And as you can see, it gives a reasonably, because I'm using the analyzer package, it actually gives a fairly reasonable, if verbose, explanation of what was wrong. In this case, we were miss, we, it expected one argument and, and didn't get, and got zero arguments. So, uh, the, the error messages, I've, as I've been uh, testing the REPL package, found to be because of um, the output coming out of uh, the um, using the the evaluate the sorry the analyzers the analyzer package and also the expression evaluation coming from the VM service. So that's it for the quick demo. I'll just hop back to my presentation. So as the saying goes, the road goes ever on and there's always more to be done. So what I wanted to uh, fi uh, finally talk about is just some of the um, areas that I I'm still working on or on my to-do list. The first of these is that uh, I'd like to support, and in fact, the package already has support, but it doesn't quite work for um, using Dart Pub Global Activate, as you might be used to with some other Dart tools, to actually globally install um, the REPL package as a binary and just be able to invoke it directly instead of having, to, like the way I did it, as like have it having to call Dart, like, you know, main.dart to invoke it which is, is, yeah, not great, but uh, currently that's what you need to do because of um, issues to do with actually paths to the package that um, the Dart REPL needs to make use of in order to be able to support that um, global activation. Also, I'd like to be able to support embedding the REPL in your own code. And this was actually the primary driver for me starting on this journey in the first place. I needed 
a REPL to embed into a project I was working on, as I mentioned previously. So currently the REPL package sort of supports this, but I'd like to create a much nicer API that will make it much easier to do this for people who want to embed a REPL in their own project. There's also the need to improve performance. Currently, you may have noticed with um, the demo, it takes a little while, even like I'm, I'm doing this on a reasonably fast um, laptop, it takes a little while for it to start up. I'm actually invoking Dart twice, the first time to run just basically the wrapper script, and then it then invokes Dart again uh, with the VM service enabled because that's a command line parameter. And that's actually that output that you saw when it, the REPL first started up, that actually comes from the fact that we're running um, the Dart VM with the VM service enabled, which is normally for the use of a debugger, but here it's for the use of the REPL. But all of that makes it um, a bit slow to start up. There's also, um, you may have seen a little bit of lag in actually evaluating expressions and especially um, uh, submitting statements. And that's because I'm actually having to run the analyzer twice. Uh, oh, sorry, no, uh, run the, so oh, I'm having to like use the analyzer to decide whether something's a statement or an expression. And then if it happens to be in statement, it's run a second time where, because I need to check that adding that statement to the, all the pre-existing statements in what I call a scratch file actually is syn syntactically valid. So it, if it isn't, it'll cause hot reload to stop working. So we need to make that check. That again, slows down performance. And yeah, I hope to improve that in the future also. Uh, also, uh, Andreas's original proof of concept way back in the day had support for package imports. I don't yet have that. Um, he did it in a way that I'm not sure I want to, to implement it in exactly the same way. So I'm investigating alternative ways of doing it. So at the moment, the um, REPL package that I've created doesn't support having um, your own package imports. And finally, there is also the possibility of using the Dart Better API in the future because it has some of the pieces of functionality that might work better for the REPL than how I'm currently doing it with the um, making use of the VM service. So that's another thing on my to-do list to investigate for the future, especially as it might improve performance. And with that, um, I think we've come to the end of the presentation. I'm not sure if we've got sufficient time to take some questions, but um, if we do, I'll be happy to answer them. If we don't, then uh, you can always reach me on the usual um, Twitter and GitHub locations. And I'm always happy to take, it's an it's a open source package. I'm happy to take any issues, uh, pull requests, uh, feature suggestions, or most welcome. Thank you very much. Oh, I think you're muted again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Thank you, Mark. That's the most common thing. <laughs> yes. So, of course, we have questions, yeah. and I personally have questions. So, because Fantastic. I haven't heard, I haven't heard that before this. So, I'm a mobile developer. I mean, I'm not a mobile developer thanks to Flutter. We do many things nowadays, but originally mobile developer for long years. So we I didn't hear this term before. So if you summarize REPL in one sentence, how would you describe REPL? I saw the Wikipedia even just before joining this session. I couldn't understand. <laughs> right. I, I guess it's just a, for those who are familiar with a command line, it's just a way of entering commands in a particular language. So in JavaScript or um, shell script, or in this case, Dart. And when you enter the command, enter pieces of your language's code, they get evaluated and you get a result back. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's, great. I guess that in a nutshell. It is really great. Yeah, you can edit the Wikipedia page. This was more clear. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So don't you need an interactive command line interface for REPL? This was a question also, but I think. Uh, Yes, so that I guess that's essentially the key part of the REPL is that it is inter interactive command line. So um, in my demo, hopefully um, you can see that when you, I guess that when you're asking uh, interactive command line, you mean like you get things back. So 
when you enter, say, an expression, it gets evaluated. So if it's a mathematical expression or if it's a function uh, call, you, you get back the result. But uh, I'm not sure also if the question's about interactive as in editing the command line. So mm -hmm. being able to, like, you know, as you're entering, you might make a typo. So you, you backspace to correct whatever you typed or you go back uh, through the history of commands and you can reuse a previous command or edit it and then re-enter re re it. So I guess those are the, it's a bit ambiguous what interactive means, but I, when I think of it, I think of it as those two parts, like that you can interactively edit your commands, but also you, there's interactivity in that you get results based on your commands. Okay, on top of this question, does it support multi-line input? Um, sort of. So um, as far as I know, the, the package that I'm using, uh, CLI REPL, can support multi-line input, but I haven't actually tr like implemented that support in the Dart REPL as yet. So that's, I guess, another thing that I should have added on my to-do list is that currently it potentially could, but it doesn't at the moment. Okay. And another question is that about Dart, it's no not safety, but I didn't understand what is actually. Ah, okay. So I, I guess people are asking like, it, it, does it support null safety? And indeed it does. And that's one of the things that broke in the previous like proof of concept back from um, 2017 was the fact that it was written before null safety existed. So that was one of the things that um, had it not working with more uh, modern Dart. And yes, it does support null safety it actually makes life i null safety normally makes life easier so null safety for um, those who might not be aware is one of these really nice things now in mm -hmm. um modern versions of dart where uh you you know you can say whether something's allowed to be null or not it's it's a separate type that it can be null or not null okay so but mm -hmm. I, I was going to say yeah like it makes life a little bit more tricky actually on the command line because some of the shortcuts you might want to use well, like, no, safe to actually stop you because it is actually supported. So yes, that's mm -hmm. the long answer. Okay. Let's continue with the language because uh, <coughs> you talked about the difference between statement and expression. If I'm not wrong, uh, I did Kotlin for a long time. If I'm not wrong, you can return, for example, an expression in Kotlin, like if else. This is missing in uh, Dart. I don't know, is it possible in near future? What do you think? Uh, I, I, am, I am also an Android to Flutter. Uh, Conver convertee. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I did Kotlin for a few years before coming um, to Flutter and Dart. And unfortunately, that's the thing that I find missing. Hopefully it'll come in future languages of Dart. But that's what one thing I miss from Kotlin and Dart is the fact that, for instance, if it's not an expression, it's a statement in, in mm -hmm. Dart, whereas it's so nice for it to be an expression. Well, at least I found it like that to be a nice yeah. thing in, when I was doing Kotlin. So sadly... Yeah, it'll it'll just need to be a, a thing that cha gets changed in the language maybe down the road. I know a lot of people have asked for it because a lot of people like us come to Dart from uh, Kotlin and, or Swift <laughs> and miss having that um, nice yes. feature. Okay, let's get a bit more uh, the fundamentals because from uh, we have some questions like, I didn't understand the importance of using REPL. Can someone explain me more? Some example in one Flutter app. So how is REPL actually related to Flutter? Is it only Dart thing? It 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 is a Dart thing, but it doesn't have to be only Dart. Um, one thing that you, like I um, only mentioned briefly was embedding it in an application in your own code. So what can be really useful is to have some sort of uh, debugging interface into your app. Um, some people, might be aware that there um, have been um, tools that connected, for, for instance, in the Android world, there was a, I'm just trying to remember the name of it, there was a tool that lets you connect Chrome DevTools to your uh, Android app. It was uh, came from uh, Facebook. And so that gave you kind of like a debugging interface into your app. Now, that similar sort of um, principle can, be applied to using the REPL. So for instance, you can expose, say on a WebSocket into your app, a REPL. So you could essentially be, um, have like a, a custom debugger into or debug interface into your app. So you could do things that you couldn't easily do with the debugger. Like for instance, create um, new objects inside um, your app as it's actually running. 
So think of it, I, I guess, as a sort of um, interactive debugging experience that is maybe going one step further than you could with a debugger. So with a debugger, for instance, you can evaluate expressions. So when you're debugging your app with, say, a debugger in VS Code, you could, say, execute a function with that expression uh, evaluator that's built into the debugger. But if you have a REPL, what you can do is you can go one step further and do things like create a new function, then call that function to do something, which uh, is not possible with just the debugger by itself. So essentially, you can create, uh, the way I think of it is, is custom um, debuggers for whatever app you're working on and expose you know those kind of things that often people will put in like a hidden um, debug menu somewhere or mm -hmm. like a secret settings option where like if you tap it so many times like you get the developer options and you can like you know add entries into your um, local SQLite database or like uh, log in as a fake user all those kind of things that people often like hide away somewhere in the UI or in a debug build of the UI of your app you could actually not do it in the UI but you could actually create basically your own little custom command line um, inter debugging interface into your app and that's so, one of the things I would like to do with the REPL. When you have a breakpoint, when you're debugging, can you, for example, send a REST API call? Uh, not a breakpoint, because when if you hit the breakpoint, your mm -hmm. the um, Dart virtual machine is basically paused on that breakpoint. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing is, is that um, with the REPL, you don't have to be on a breakpoint. You could just be mm -hmm. actually doing things as the app's running normally. Like you don't have to pause it. You can actually interact with it while it's running. So you essentially have a kind of backdoor, if you like, into the app to help you like diagnose how it's working. And um, for those who might be familiar with um, Erlang or Elixir on um, in terms of backend development, that's a very common thing. And that's what, that was kind of one of the motivations that led me to working on this is that for those developers, it's very common for them to essentially have a REPL into a running app and just manipulate things on the fly. And mm -hmm. there's a long history of doing that, at least on backend systems. And I think it could be very useful for uh, app development. OK, looking forward to hear more about these things in the Flutter community. <laughs> and thank you for That's your great. talk today. And it was great uh, pleasure having you here. And see you in different conferences. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. It was uh, a you. pleasure to be here. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. OK, now we have uh, another speaker who is a community advocate and organizer at GDG uh, Lisboa uh, Flutter Portugal. So we have Filipe. Hello, Filipe. Hello. I am not muted this time. That's really no. nice. Okay, <laughs> And I can see the dash behind you. But to be honest, for the first time, I see you because I follow you on Twitter, but you don't have your picture on your Twitter. <laughs> But you look like that image, avatar on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, welcome today. And uh, how how are you? Doing fine. Uh, I was uh, waiting and attending to the REPL uh, talk. I really enjoyed uh, that we can have now REPLs. I think it's mm -hmm. important for. Might be not on the. Easy to understand, but REPL, it's interesting to, to keep on testing our apps and even maybe some unit tests. You can try it out. I'm, mm -hmm. I, I'll, I will keep an eye on that package for sure. OK, and today you are going to talk about microservices, right? Yes. OK, peak. because as a mobile developer, as a Flutter developer who has mobile development uh, background, I, again, don't know much knowledge about microservices. People talk about it a lot on Twitter. They make joke about should I, we should be make a microservice or not or not. So <laughs> yeah, it is really interesting talk for me. So today I will also learn one more thing. Thanks to you. And I will not take much time from you. Stage is yours. Yeah, I hope you enjoy. So first of all, yeah, again, thank you so much for for Kikl to invite me and uh, be present to everyone attending. Hope you enjoy this talk. Um, indeed, this is going to be about Dart microservices, but more more precisely, a in, in, uh, soft introduction to to uh, Dart in the backends. Okay, we are going to take it slow, so that this is going to be your. I am assuming this is going to be your introduction to this uh, topic. So, without any further ado. 
Uh, my name is Philippe Barrosola, as I mentioned. I've been working with, uh, with Flutter uh, now quite a while professionally, but even more time uh, as a, a committee organizer uh, of Flutter Portugal. Now it's going to be three years now. And uh, also um, I've been a, a, a lead uh, community organizer for Google Developers Group Lisboa. Uh, you might know from Portugal. Um, in terms of uh, career, yeah, I've been, I'm uh, a sync task team since uh, and with Android development. I had uh, a couple of years working as a machine learning engineer. That's where I got a small taste of backends, mostly with Python. Um, that gave me a kind of a segue to Dart back uh, in the backends. Um, I kind of enjoy it and for my project personal projects, I can mess around with Dart background, uh, with Dart in the back end. And of course, I'm a, a Flutter developer um, for the past years. So, um, as we all know, and we are aware, Flutter is our UI toolkit, right? It's how we built our apps in many different um, environments, of course, nowadays. But uh, behind Flutter, there's this, uh, what we always called about the it, the Flutter is supercharged by Dart. Um, as we could see in the previous talk, Dart uh, gives us uh, many functionalities and even we can build awesome tools like uh, REPL, right? And, um, and that's where uh, the power comes because we might be using, f working with Flutter, main, uh, most of us, but uh, indirectly we are learning the language Dart easily, more than others, but uh, with knowledge of uh, Dart uh, language, we can then cite and use it, use that knowledge to other uh, functionalities, right? And that's really good. And one of the functionalities is really, okay, so we, you already know Dart uh, through Flutter. You can grab that knowledge and try to apply it to Dart's backend. And that's awesome. And so let me introduce you to what we are going to do now henceforth. So, to follow up on this talk, uh, if you wish, um, there are some requirements, or at least the requirements for uh, working with uh, Dart for backends. Of course, you need Dart uh, for programming language. You need uh, Git to communicate with uh, the repositories and all the versions. Uh, Docker, it's a star because there are many other alternatives to Docker, um, and you, you can just replace it by your favorite OS level uh, virtualization, okay? And uh, I'm going to talk about just a sneak peek about Google Cloud SDK because it's the, going to be the host that I prefer to host our, um, our code, our small microservices, okay? So, and of course, um, this means you'll need to have a Google Cloud uh, account. Um, the star means if you use create um, a new account, you will have some credits free, but have no fear because um, everything that you will need for this um, talk, it's really free. You can use the free tiers uh, to run and uh, uh, deploy your apps. So besides this initial uh, presentation of the presentation, um, this talk divides in two parts, okay? It's how uh, I'm going to start to say why microservices and why uh, GCP, Google Cloud Platform. And then um, the biggest part of the talk is how to build a microservice with Dart Shelf. Now I'm giving you a, small, a small sneak peek about self Shelf. So let's start about with the, the why microservices and why GCP. Well, you can you have many literatures around uh, favors pros and cons for microservices but there's this synthesis that i i think it uh, resumes perfectly um, the microservice environment okay microservices development is a module approach designed to improve responsiveness flexibility and resiliency in overall application workflow so taking the mantra of uh, do one thing and one thing right um, uh, microservices can be simply that. It can be a service that is um, responsible for doing one action. That action can be 
uh, incrementing the value, it can be uh, authenticating, authenticating someone, uh, returning the status of a user. Uh, so if we have a lot of services with one task and one task at all, you have your microservices. If you have um, a full server that has connection with the backend, that has the authentication uh, implemented in all of those nine yards, that means it's not a microservices directly because it's a big bulk, it's a big monolith about it. So microservices divides that in small text, tasks. And that's the ideal for this talk and for this, uh, this work we do here, okay? So just a small moving around my windows. So uh, what we are going to use here and what you need it for um, ECP. So we are going to use uh, interactively the Art, uh, Artifact Registry API, API that you see on the right, okay? And also Cloud Run. Cloud Run is ideal for our um, project because uh, it's really, you deploy your solution and it will take um, all the responsibility of scaling up, scaling down, and it will only classify uh, the amount of requests that you have on that um, service, which is really what we want, okay? So I'm imagining that uh, you are working on your Flutter app. You need uh, just a, a service to run to test your, um, your projects, you know? You can leverage the Cloud Run, you can leverage the Dart backends and quickly scratch up uh, a, a demo or a mock uh, server uh, that you can run and uh, cross-check with your API, right? Before you have a full-blown. Of course, you can start from ground up, but speaking more as a Flutter developer, as an Android developer, it's always nice to have a real communication between your app and the services. So the GCP, you will need to have a, an account, but uh, everything will be in a free tier and you can check for other uh, nice functionality of GCP with uh, this link that I'm hi highlighting, okay? You could also use many other features of GCP, similar to AWS, similar to other um, hosts. Um, so one thing that I also use a lot is a cloud uh, scheduler just to trigger some runs also. So it's really common to, to have a scheduler triggering some services to process some data or even con con communicate with the existing uh, apps through webhooks or different things. Um, so this is just to make you in, uh, excited that you can try this out immediately in a free matter, okay? Yeah, that was the end of the first part. It's really uh, just a pep-up talk. And now for the GC part, that is how to build a microservice with that shelf. So let's go at it. First of all, as I mentioned, uh, I'm going to talk about shelf and why shelf, okay? so. Shelf is a web server middleware. Um, it's not a full-blown server framework my, like uh, Django or Express.js, Spring in Java that you might know, but uh, it has yeah, their advantages that I'm going to talk about. So Shelf is maintained by the Dart team itself, so that's really a big con, it's really a good thing. And before, uh, some years ago, we had two promises, promising um, uh, projects that were Akadat and Angel. Unfortunately, uh, we as a, a community, we didn't give them enough care or we didn't contribute to it. And it, they kind of simply stopped their development for many reasons. Uh, each project has their own reasons. You can read more about it. But uh, luckily, some other um, fellow colleagues grabbed these projects and tried to follow up. Uh, but this kind of have the same uh, problem. It's one project, person per project. Uh, they are still uh, Angel 3, the continuation of Angel and Conduit, a continuation of Accudate. Um, Conduit is still actively in development, so I won't recommend using it as production, while Chef is already mature enough. If you are paying attention to on Twitter, you might realize there's a new platform being developed. 
it's still in uh, experimental uh, phase so it, they also don't recommend using um, in production however one thing interesting about this uh, new um, uh, project is it relies on shelf for for the work so if you understand shelf um, you will be able to understand many other projects that might arrive because for sure they will be built on top of shelf so and what's also good about shelf being modular it has a modular um, uh, way of uh, defining you can find many add-ons that you keep you can add to your projects okay and some official other not official the water were um, created by the communities but i can i'm listing here a couple of them that are official and uh, when i say official i mean they are maintained by the dark team itself so you can expect some stability and uh, contributions not to stop all of a sudden and uh, there are many and you can simply install uh, add your add-ons uh, to your services as you need you can even add a shelf static to show static pages you can use even the web socket if you are in need of web sockets of course for of course our mythical course errors but and many others and even if you look for um, packages that depend on shelf you might find uh, one 108 packages so that by itself say, says a lot right says a lot of uh, other packages rely not only uh, add-ons but other projects that rely on shelf to work so it's an excellent starting point to to learn dart for the backend and that was the reason why i picked uh, shelf for this exercise uh, for this introduction to to backend development and so let's let's get at it so if you are new to Dart, uh, new to Dart in the backends, one thing I recommend is use uh, one of their templates. Start with one of their templates so that you have a common ground on how to work with um, Shelf. And uh, just a side note here is um, creating a template doesn't mean necessary only for um, create creating a server. You, you, if you list the, if you go check the available templates, you can find many of uh, predefined um, um, solutions like a console simple, console full for uh, full command applications, uh, how to start a, a simple package, and now then the two last ones really it's start a web uh, web server um, a s a server shelf, a server with shelf just a simple one and uh, also you have a possibility of starting a template from scratch that is just around um, it's a web server that will uh, present some web page to to your um, to your um, uh, users but what we are interesting here and for this talk is really this template this uh, the server shelf and we are going to use it as a, a starting point for our project that is called Tarts Microservice, okay? So in the command line, if you are following up this talk, you can simply run Dart create uh, dash T of template, and then the template that we mentioned, service shelf, and the name of your project, okay? What this will do is it will create a, a folder with uh, this following um, files created, okay? Um, you won't see, as we usually see in Flutter, um, the Android, the iOS, if you have uh, those activated web um, desktop uh, folders, if you have those activated too. But we, you will notice a, a bin folder, not a lib, with a file of a server, server.dart. Testing, of course, you, you won't uh, run away from tests uh, even in that backend and good for that. And, um, let me just move forward and of course the, the mythical pub spec yaml that i'm going to jump in and show you the file okay let's see what's inside of um, uh, pub spec yaml when you run the template when you start the template um, and the templates really add the minimum um, uh, dependencies that you need uh, it will add of course the shelf and the shelf router Okay, shelf is really the core of the project. Shelf router, I'll talk about it in a second. It's uh, an add-on. 
args is only for handling the arguments if you need to when you run your server and if you want to pass some arguments to into it args is your go-to uh, library so i i tend to keep it even if i don't use it uh, because more often than not i will have to pass parameters even if it's only for changing the the port even if it's only changing some other parameters like if it's in dev staging production i usually use uh, args for it but we'll keep it short and we'll focus on only on chef shelf and then of course dev dependencies that it's needed to to run uh, lint to just verify your project so Moving a bit for, forward, um, let's talk about uh, the file server.dart that is created. It can be a bit overwhelming when opening this, this project um, uh, to see this code, even more when coming from the uh, web, um, Android or mobile uh, environment. But uh, I will quickly explain this and you for sure will understand it. So, as normal, we also have uh, the, the main function, function. This list of args comes from also for the, the I.O. It, it, and the library args will help us managing this uh, input. But uh, let's ignore it for now, okay? Um, what we have it that is important to note is this handler, okay? The, the handler that is adding a certain router, this router right here and then add it as a middleware. So this router, what it's doing is we are defining what paths it will uh, be uh, aware of. So at the moment, what we will we'll do is it will, um, for any call that is made to the slash, it will call the root handler. But if you call um, when the service is running echo slash echo slash a message, it will call the echo handler. And these uh, functions are defined really these lines between 11 and 18. And it's really as it is. Uh, the ec the return, uh, root handle will return just hello world. And then the echo handler will grab the message that comes after the last slash and reply with that message. So this is the famous counter, you may call it, uh, as a server. And for this, after this is defined, the middleware, please rem uh, remind, uh, remember this uh, in the future slides. Uh, then there's so, just a small configuration in what is the port. If the port is defined as an environment, it will use it. Otherwise, it will use the default 88. Uh, this can be passed through the args. And then we simply um, say, OK, so serve start the server with this handler, this IP, uh, IP type, you can use the IP6 if you wish, and then the port, okay? As easy as it is. And then you see the server listening on port. So this is, again, just to give you an introduction of the server.tart. Let's move forward. As I mentioned, um, I, I decided to use doc docker for this case and one good thing of, of using docker is it already already comes from with the docker file what does the docker file means for those who are not aware of um, let me jump into the docker file to better explain it okay let's see so the docker file what it does is we it will grab this uh, the official uh, dart image in docker that we I think it's going to be one year now that we have an official Dart image. Correct me if I'm wrong, it can, I'm a bit shady on that regard, time flies. But then what it does is basically it will prepare your environment. It will run all the, uh, will copy all your codes that you predefine as a server into the certain image, Docker image. It will run the dependencies. It will uh, compile your server into the machine, okay? Similar to when we deploy an app to your phone. This is just compiling the server to run it locally. Um, it will just make some improvements. This is um, things that you, you might ignore. And at the end, expose the port 8080. This might be a mistake if you define a different port but uh, uh, that's a different discussion. And then uh, run the command, command uh, app being server app, given the work here is this one. So uh, if you wish, you could simply run the template, uh, compile this Docker image, 
you'll have an image ready to deploy somewhere, um, this Docker image and the container running. And then you can deploy it in anywhere you wish and you'll have a, a service that will just echo uh, a message. But we can do better, okay? Let me just quickly uh, go through the readme. Uh, the readme uh, gives you all the information you need to run this project, okay? Even with running the, the Docker with Docker, so that's why I kind of skipped and went through the Docker part. Uh, just explain the structure because you can uh, simply follow up the commands and you'll have the server running up and running. And even then, if you use curl or even your um, browser, you can just reach out to these endpoints and you'll see the, the replies accordingly. And yeah, as simple as it is. But now, um, with this setup, with this mindset, let's mess the codes a bit, okay? So this is our starting point. This is the server that, but uh, we can do better, okay? We can do better by adding more more handlers, and immediately we can start by adding the build runner. Okay, uh, I'm not going to, into full detail here. Uh, you might already know from other tools, and uh, I tend to run uh, the watch on my project. So every change I do, it will just compile the build, run the build runner, and have all the classes. And uh, I will also add this uh, shelf router generator. Uh, this is really helpful, uh, it will avoid um, a lot of boilerplate in my opinion and will, it will help you immensely, immensely in organizing your project, okay? So, given we have this project and we now add the, the shelf router uh, generator, we can now create a new class, a new, f uh, a new file uh, with a, a new structure. What does this mean? I simply rewrote the codes uh, that already existed to have the, the build render. And in this, in this case, we have the same message echoing, but then again, the slash will, besides this echo message, if you try to write ec uh, slash anything else, it will return the hello world, not only when it, you, you write the slash. So this is really important. Uh, unfortunately, it's regex, you might have some uh, difficulties in it, with it, but still it's quite helpful. And as you might see, it also uh, removes a lot of boilerplate uh, running the, the codes. You simply have to uh, shelf IO from the shelf IO Dart, uh, serve, and then pass the right uh, services handler, localhost, ATI, AT, and then that's it. And uh, with this, with the, the class service, in uh, like so we can move it into a different file that I just created service.dart and this way you can make it keep it clean the main function clean and only running what you need again just to show you um, this is the server the class I just mentioned and just to call you to attention that we have this service.gdart and what does it has well it has the code generated by the uh, shelf uh, shelf router right and the shelf router generator. And as you might realize, this is familiar with something, right? Well, that snippet of code, it's replacing the initial uh, functions that we had. We don't have to write the response, we don't have to uh, care about these functions. We can simply uh, generate the, the service.dart and then it, with those annotations, and then it will create all the necessary uh, routers and it will handle that for you. And this is really helpful when you are structuring and you might have multiple services. But since we are only talking about uh, microservices and doing one thing and one thing right, this is more than enough. Okay, one class um, of service. So, just a step back of what we've uh, done so far. Uh, this is where we came from. And this is where what the final uh, main class uh, function will end up with, as easy as it is. And um, yeah, that's it. With one um, shelf router generated edit, and note that I added as a dev, um, you, you have the code really more simplified and easy, easier to understand, okay? And of course, step by step, you can add more features as soon as you need. You can add more uh, handlers. 
and, and so on. But for my opinion, this is the most important one for code readability and code expansion and structuring your projects. So with the uh, remaining time we have, let's quickly deploy this. Um, drink a bit of water like I'm going to do. Because I'm going to talk a lot about command lines, okay? So, but before that, let's do just a, a small change. When before we had this service with echoing a message and everything else re ignores, let's change it to something more familiar to us. Well, let's create um, a, not a notation root.get. This means is expecting a get HTTP call that will add, just add. And as you might notice, this function, what we will do is simply increment this counter, that is locally. You might not need to do this, pay attention, this is just a case in point. And then it will reply, okay, add it. And then, <clears throat> of course, you can call counter and it will return this value. Um, then, uh, following this, you can simply add this uh, router uh, method that if the user or this other service calls, this service endpoint with any other path besides these two it will return nothing to see here you could improve it to have the page 404 if you wish but that you will need to add the um, the handler for static pages if you remember correctly and yeah and as is guess what boom we have a microservice because this code is doing one thing and one thing right it's using a, a counter that uh, as soon as you end or stop the service, it will um, reset to zero. So maybe you will need to improve this to save in a database, to send it maybe to another microservice uh, when it closes or uh, X amount of time to save this uh, counter. But this is uh, what I'm going to say. It This is really um, a stateless um, a server, okay? Because as soon as you close it, it will and the, it will reset it to zero. So yeah, it has a state, stateful, but it will be closed. And then we have a microservice. And if you want to run the, the project, um, you just run that run bin server. You point to the main, uh, where your main function was, okay? So how to quickly, um, I have to go a bit faster, but how to deploy it to call out run? Well, we are going to uh, upload our image to Artifact uh, Registry and then deploy the image itself to Cloud Run. How are we going to upload the Artifact um, Registry? Well, we first tag our image by running just Docker build tag, T of tag, uh, counter server, it's the, our server, and the dot is the current files of your project. And then we are going to tag uh, the image that we created, the counter, counter server, is this one, as the latest, and tag it to uh, eu.crr.io. Um, uh, this, uh, this CRR is just to say, um, I'll talk about it in a bit, it's just to warn up that you, it's important to you to remember the name that you gave to your image, because this image name will be used here. The project ID, uh, is simply the when you start a project in GCP, it will give you a pro project ID. Remember, take note of it. You will not use it here. You might use an environment variable for it. The eu.crr.io means that your container, uh, your image, will be hosted in Europe, Europe. But you have other registries that uh, you can use uh, worldwide. So, okay, you have tagged your image. You don't have to care care about this anymore. So now to upload the image to the registry. Well, now you enter the uh, GCP SDK that I needed to install and warn you about. It's the G Cloud. So you simply say, okay, let let's me let's build the the image that I deployed, this tag, okay, and submit it. So it will submit it to the to the cloud. Okay, it will submit it to the Active Factory. So at this point, what we have is on the cloud, we have an image that you can uh, deploy it to Cloud Run, okay? You could replace this cloud environment in your local machine, so you could de deploy your image directly from local to the Cloud Run, but I don't advise you to, you, you don't need to, and this way you, you have access to it uh, everywhere, okay? 
So let's talk about deploying it to Cloud Run. It's also it's some command lines, but you'll with practice and you'll see that this can be set up quite easily. So I'm setting up a, just a name so I don't forget uh, a local environment variable uh, to set the counter server run. Um, since this is to be deployed, a name to be deployed to Cloud Run, uh, the services names cannot include alphanumeric numeric and dashes. That's why I can only accept alphanumeric and dashes. So that's why I used dash instead of the lower case underscore, okay, on the underscore on the name. And then again, we have to use the Cloud GCP uh, SDK. I mean, you could replace this with your favorite um, uh, host. And then we deploy uh, our service to the service name with a certain image. There we go. And then allow on, 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 on authenticated. This is just for, for you to test, of course. Starting for production, you need to be more aware of security and authentication. This is just a proof, proof of concept. So, and that's it. So after running this first initial run, you just if you wish to update, if you make some changes and you want to deploy it again, you simply run these three commands. So you build your image, you update your um, Docker image to have the latest code, to copy your code into the image. You then uh, submit your image uh, tag that has this um, to this uh, Active Factory. And then from the Active Factory, you can just run this command to deploy it to the Cloud Run. Okay, and then uh, there we go. You can just add this as a small uh, script and run it every time you want, even uh, attaching to other things. Or you can prepare your um, host where your code at. You can even with GitHub Actions you can take care of this by you. Okay, but I, I prefer to understand it manually, and I advise you to do the same. Okay. Conclusion, and we were are almost running out of time, but. Cloud Run, for me, it was one of the best things that show up on GCP. It's really fast uh, to go from uh, code to production, okay? So fast that you might skip a lot of concepts, and that's troublesome. But uh, you can see it Cloud Run as similar as when you deploy uh, to Firebase, right? You can deploy it, you can de uh, use Firebase to host a, a web page, you can deploy your app now uh, more easily thanks to the latest uh, developments on Firebase. Um, you can deploy your app there, so it's quite quite helpful. You can have all the analytics and all. But with Cloud Run, you you don't need to worry about uh, a scale. You can need to scale down. Of course, if you you want to make this in production, be advised. I haven't talked at all about security, managing the persistent data. In this case, is the counter right? You need to persist it. It's it won't save the state. Uh, so every time you deploy a new version on the cloud run or stop and run again, it will use, lose all the data. So you need to persist that data somewhere. And also, and this is the biggest concern and the biggest uh, discussion about the microservice, is you need to handle the architecture around it. Again, but then again, we are not DevOps. Uh, I advise you to uh, delegate this responsibility to your DevOps or backend team, but at least um, this will give you really a tools to start with Dart and if you really like it, you can evolve it to something else. Maybe you can find your preferable um, uh, tool or framework to work with Dart backend. And so to uh, close up, I'm sharing some resources that I used here. Of course, the, the Dart official page for um, the Docker. You have uh, a lot of information in Dart dev in the server. Uh, about all the how, how to do everything um, for Google Cloud, and <clears throat> of course read about the Google Run on the website. And a small sneak peek is you can even s make everything more easily through uh, a functions framework, similar of what uh, uh, Firebase function does. It's just it has some functions and run. You can leverage function framework to to have quickly uh, some functions and microservices, per se, uh, using a simpler and a concise framework. And again, this is made, was created on top of shelf. And yeah, uh, that's it. Um, that's my time for the talk. 
Um, I'm open for questions for, from the community. I hope I have some. Yeah, of course, I'm muted again. <laughs> I'm muted myself. Okay, so of course we have questions and I personally have questions again because I'm a developer who has background on mobile development, slowly started to learn web development with Flutter and now I'm hearing about backend development with Dart. So we started to hear a lot about Dart in backend. Recently, very good ventures started this uh, frog. Have you heard about this frog? Dart yes, um, that's why why I mentioned the the emoji, <laughs> those <laughs> yes. emojis. I didn't want to mention the project itself. Um, again, I've noticed it. I looked into it. It's promising. It's still experimental, mm -hmm. but uh, it will really um, community ecosystem for Dart in backend. It's uh, a company or a project that will working on this work. It just works. At it. It's uh, you need to know some stuff. This new project will take a lot of our pain away. Okay, another question again. Like, um, where started Flutter and started to do web? Now, the question what? I get the same question. I have to do a question. I'm not from the but I'm not a very expert. Well, I know Java, but I, I want to run away from that. Uh, so, I'm not a that, uh, .NET Core developer, okay? So it might be useful for you to leverage um, your knowledge of Dart and work with uh, backends. Um, we might start hearing people saying that they are full stack developers of Flutter because they can do backend, frontend, and even other a lot of things. But to be honest, is it depends on the company. Uh, they might want to leverage someone uh, focused on darts for backends and then other people for uh, front ends maybe uh, mess around a bit uh, between both okay but of course it will depend on the company uh, even currently my current company uh, we use um, the uh, flutter in the front end and then golang for the api so it's really a matter of what's the goal of your project if you have people to contribute uh, with Spring, with Django, uh, I also work with Django, and if they are more mature in those regards. And of course, it really, in the end, it's just having services that reply to uh, app or web app. And so, uh, I hope I answered that. Yeah. Uh, the people that are more comfortable working with Dart for backend instead of using yeah. JavaScript. There are people like me who is trying to build a project from scratch. <laughs> one person <Yeah>. company <laughs> so yeah. then you do <laughs> everything yeah and that being so similar to other languages uh, even <laughs> when i came from uh, python uh, for a bit it's really confusing so similar and so your brain might be twisted and for me using dart for my infinite uh, personal projects it helped me uh, stay tuned and focus on using dart and improve my knowledge on that mm -hmm. okay another question is also again um, Recently, I heard about server pod. Have you heard about server pod with Flutter? Server, server pod. Server pod. No, I, I haven't. Open source scalable app server written in Dart for the Flutter community. <laughs> oh my. Ah, okay, I, you can check that. I, I need to check that, I confess. Yes, I, that's uh, actually, that was one episode in Flutter, uh, fly, flying high with Flutter. I would suggest that. <laughs> I will, I will check that. And actually, there was one episode from uh, Flutter community YouTube channel about full stack Dart. And they were saying that uh, there were like there are many things ongoing. We just need to be patient. So I think uh, we will hear more about full stack Dart. <laughs> Let's see. It's very exciting. I'm for for example currently I'm now uh, in, uh, talking about Flutter. Let's make this app in Flutter in the company because we have several apps. Like now backend people like okay maybe with Dart. <laughs> but one last question to you. Where is Flutter in your talk? So it's only Dart, right? Exactly, it's only Dart. As yeah. you saw, saw also, I only ran Dart commands, you only, only ran um, then other tools. 
but you notice that I didn't use anything from Flutter because mm -hmm. Flutter has that Flutter package or Flutter framework on top of the engine, you know, and it has all the widgets and everything you need to run on the on your devices and many other, right? But uh, here you only use that language, and that's yeah, it's that uh, the, the superpower language of that uh, in full effect. Yes, and and thank you very much for this talk. As I said. I had really great benefit from this because I never heard this before. Of course, I heard about microservices. And actually, there's one question as well, like maybe you want to answer this. I don't know how much related this. Do you want to talk about this? Sure, definitely. So the thing is, um, for my personal projects and some that scale up a bit more, um, working as a microservices, I, I'm more clear and concise of what I need to do. I need to have a cloud. I'm going to simplify. I need to have a service that counts how many people click ads. Okay, done. I need a service to to save that information in the backend. And then I have other service that will grab a certain web page first that is crapping. And then mm -hmm. other page to proce process that information in a PDF. Another service for signing. And for me to have everything separated. Um, it doesn't mean that if for some reason the the PDF microservice fail, well, what happens is everything else will stay in queue and it will continue working. If I had this in a uh, monolith uh, um, server, more probably than not, if that small endpoint failed for some reason, everything will be down. And when goes when we are talking about personal projects. I don't like to spend too much time maintaining it. I want to be running and easy to fix. So that's why um, I talk about microservices and indirectly I kind of cheat it because this is Dart in backend, um, but only limiting the functionality to one feature. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much again for this talk. It was yeah. a big pleasure. And if see you, you want in to know more conference? information, just sure. follow up my website, Flip, it's my name or my Twitter handle and mm -hmm. I have all the information on to run this. So Great. thanks again. Nice to see you. OK, I think now we can have Anna, Nick here as well, because now it is break time, I guess. Yeah, let's go on a short break, and we'll get back with a new moderator. OK. OK, everyone. And now we want to say a huge thank you once again to our sponsors, GuardSquare. And uh, if you're into mobile app development, and certainly you are since you're visiting this summit or you're just starting, uh, have you ever thought about this, uh, this idea? Is your mobile app really secure? Because new vulnerabilities, they pop up every day and malicious actors look for easy targets on app marketplaces to exploit daily. This is their business. And securing your app valuable IP and data is critical. And GuardSquare's security solution are built for developers and they protect your app at every stage in the development cycle. So you can start early and make sure your app is secure. And GuardSquare solutions are based on secure software development principles with ease of implementing and comprehensive polymorphic protection against threat actors at the very core of your application. The roots of this project is open source and their culture is to continuously collaborate on improving of the best practices which are used for this tool. Multiple layers of protection prevent reverse engineering and automatically detect tempering, making your app a difficult target for attackers. Learn more at guardsquare.com. Link is in the chat. Thank you for supporting us, Guardsquare. Have a great summit, everyone.
GuardSquare's developer-based security solutions incorporate the full spectrum of mobile app security technology with multiple layers of protection, automatically injected RASP checks, and polymorphic protection. GuardSquare, comprehensive mobile app security from the creators of ProGuard. Hello everyone, my name is John Betts. I am a system engineer with more than 16 years of developing software. I used to create Java Enterprise applications and for more than two years, I have been developing Flutter mobile apps. Then I will start with Anna Leuschenko. Anna will talk to us about basic and advanced networking in Dart and Flutter, the tight way. She's a mobile development expert, passionate about quality software and focused on Flutter. For eight years, she has been creating cross-platform apps using Xamarin and Flutter technologies. From sketches on a napkin to delivering functional and beautiful prose to happy end users. She is a developer, Google expert and in Dart and Flutter and is a conference speaker and author of articles on different topics related to Flutter and summary. Hi there, I hope you are having a great day. Let me introduce myself first. I am Anna, mobile development expert, passionate about quality software from Ukraine. 
I'm a Google Developer expert in Dart and Flutter, and I recently became a Women Tech Makers Ambassador. I have eight years of experience in cross-platform mobile development, and I have been dealing with Flutter for work and leisure for over three years now. I currently work as a senior staff mobile engineer at a company called Tide. Tide is the leading provider of small and medium business accounts and is one of the fastest growing fintechs in the UK. We are transforming the business banking market, providing a smart current account that gives time back to business owners. I joined Tide about eight months ago, and during this time we've been solving quite interesting technical challenges and developing some really exciting approaches to different parts of our mobile applications, which we create with the Flutter framework. And I'm here to talk about one particular topic, which is basic and advanced networking in Dart and Flutter, the way we implement it at Tide. Most applications, be it mobile, web, or desktop, depend on some kind of backend, right? Thus, an API layer is an integral part of application implementation. And I'm sure today you're going to discover something interesting for your particular Flutter project. I believe I should say it in the beginning. If you prefer written content, just recently I have published a series of six parts on the same topic. There you will find everything we'll cover today and even more. It has links to the GitHub repository containing the code we'll look into today. This talk will also consist of six parts. Parts one and two are dedicated to basic and advanced topics around data models with freeze and JSONs realizable. Parts three and four are about HTTP client and request interceptors with DO. And in parts five and six, we'll talk about basic and advanced implementation of REST API requests with retrofit. Each of these parts can be applied independently, but together they complement each other and form a full-fledged API layer implementation. Personally, I am most excited about the last part, where I'll show you how we hacked code generation to help us effectively implement hundreds of API calls. So be sure to watch till the end. For an example project, today we'll be developing a mobile application that displays a list of Marvel comics. Obviously, because we are talking about the networking layer of the application, we'll be downloading this list from Marvel Comic API. If you are going to run this application on your site, you will need to register and obtain your own API key. Here is a list of dependencies for today's project. We at Tide rely heavily on the code generating mechanism with Build Runner. Build Runner is a pub package that is added to the dev dependencies in PubSpec YAML file. When combining it with packages providing builders, like for example, Freest, Developers can only provide the configuration for what code to generate. And once this command is run, Build Runner consumes those builders and the configuration and creates additional files in the file system, which contain Dart code that you would be writing on your own otherwise. The build argument stands for one-time execution. While developing, we are instead using watch for constant tracking of the configuration change and code regeneration. Okay, let's get started. I will be showing you a lot of code today and maybe going too fast sometimes. Feel free to pause the video later and read the code more carefully or refer to the GitHub repository. The link is in the article. In order to receive data from the backend, the first task is to create some data structures to contain this data, right? We will be receiving a list of Marvel comics. So let's work on a Marvel comic class. Here is how it, a plain Dart object may look like, right? Just a list of fields and a constructor accepting parameters. Looks okay, but it might be much better. The default implicit two-string implementation will only print instance of Marvel comic. Implicit operator equals only compares object references and not their content. 
The images list is modifiable. There is no implicit copy with method. And if we were implementing manually, this typical implementation would not allow updating nullable fields with null values. That's why we at type use freeze for every data class. Here is the same Marvel Comic class declaration with freeze package. This is the configuration for the future generated code. Here we see a part file declaration, which provides a name of the file with freeze suffix to which additional code will be generated. The freeze attribute above the class declaration, the factory constructor declaration, and the list of fields that the generated class will contain. Freeze also supports positional arguments, but we at tight prefer named parameters. Non-nullable fields should be either required as ID field here, or contain the default value like images list. We typically provide an empty list as the default value for list fields, so there is no need to check if a list is null when reading its values. Once the build runner command completes, there is a new Dart file generated. I'm going to show it in several pieces here. The new file is a part of the main Dart file with a class configuration. This generated class is an inheritor of the one we declared previously, and it contains the same list of fields. Just an, as in the declaration, the ID field is required and all of the rest fields are nullable. The images list is given the default empty list value and it is wrapped into an unmodifiable copy. The toString method is overwritten to give output in a human readable way. The equals operator depends on fields values, performing a deep comparison of models and lists. And the same applies to the hash code method. Also, because the generated implementation of a copy with method gives all parameters a default value of freeze, it allows setting nullable class fields to null. Now that we have a Marvel comic data model implemented with freeze, it is time to teach the generator how to deserialize it from JSON. Actually, to make it serializable, all it takes is to add another part file and a special from JSON factory constructor. After these changes, Priest will ask JSON serializable to generate serialization logic to a new file with GE suffix. Each field is serialized to and from map by the key which is equal field name. Out of the box, JSON serializable can manipulate integers, doubles, strings, enums, lists, maps. Daytime gets automatically converted to and from string. The default value for an image field is used in case JSON doesn't contain any value. Looks good, but here is a problem. Let's say there is another data class, Marvel image. And now our Marvel comic contains fields of this type, thumbnail and images list. The generated code is somewhat unexpected. The to JSON method of the new Marvel image class is not called from the to JSON of the Marvel comic class. The fix can be to annotate Marvel comic class with a JSON serializable attribute with the explicit to JSON set to true. But we believe this should have been the default behavior for all classes. That's why we are configuring JSON serializable behavior for the entire project in a built YAML file, which holds the global configuration for all code generating packages. Now to JSON has changed. First, at the bottom, you can see thumbnail and images list are correctly serialized to JSON. And second, there is a new write not null method, which allows skipping null values when serializing Marvel comic to JSON. Now nullable fields, digital ID, title, modified, thumbnail, and format will be sent to backend only if their value is not null. Okay, now our models have a basic functional implementation of JSON serialization. 
Let's look into how this mechanism can be further customized. Every field can be annotated with a JSON key attribute, which controls how fields are serialized. Here, every field is given a name, format field is ignored, and thumbnail is given a different name. As a result, the generated code does not mention the format field, and the thumbnail is using that different name as a JSON map key. Even though most of the time JSON keys equal fields names, we prefer explicitly specifying key names for safe refactoring. The JSON key attribute also has the default value property, but when used, it only provides a fallback value for a field if it is absent in JSON and not when the plain constructor is used. Instead, we at Tide rely on the default attribute from the freeze package because it covers both cases when a class is created via the plain constructor and when deserialized from JSON. Let me bring back the format field because next we are going to talk about enums. Here is the Marvel comic format enum declaration. The generated JSON serialization logic declares a map and is using the exact enum item names as values. And here this map is used in from JSON and to JSON methods. In reality, for format field from Marvel Comic API, it uses human readable values with spaces. So how to keep using generation and configure enum names? We have to slightly adjust the enum declaration by adding JSON enum and JSON value attributes with the exact values as they come from the backend. Now the generated map is updated like this and Marvel Comic is ready to properly parse format field from JSON that comes from Marvel Comic API. However, what if over time the API is extended with new comic formats? How to ensure the application remains stable without the necessity of an urgent update. First, we add an unknown item to each enum we obtain from the backend. Next, we provide it as the unknown enum value to a JSON key attribute and to the default attribute. Now the generated code changes to use Marvel comic format unknown item in case JSON contains a new unknown value or null. This allowed us to make the format field non-nullable. We now have a Dart class Marvel Comic, which implementation is generated with Freeze package and which can be serialized to and from JSON thanks to the implementation generated with JSON serializable. Cool, we now get into the advanced stuff. We saw earlier that types int, double, string, daytime, enums, lists, and maps are supported, and out of the box, daytime is converted to and from a string in ISO format. But what if for some reason the backend uses a different daytime format? Or if the data type in JSON does not match the one in the data class? For that, JSON serializable offers a converters mechanism. Let's now see that we are required to have string ID and accordingly a nullable string digital ID. Let's start with ID first. To satisfy this requirement, we'll create a JSON converter class called int to string converter. This converter is designed to deserialize an int type field from JSON to a string type field in the Dart model. Here it is applied to ID field of now string type. As a result, int to string converter automatically gets applied in the generated file. Now, what about digital ID? It might seem logical that the same int to string converter can be applied to convert nullable int to a nullable string. However, in Dart type system, nullable types are not the same as their non-nullable counterparts. Because of type mismatch, int to string converter 
simply would not be applied to digital ID in the generated file. Instead, we need another converter, nullable int to nullable string. Here it is applied to the digital ID field of now nullable string type. And it also gets used in the generated file. So far, converting string IDs to int IDs and vice versa, both nullable and non-nullable, is the only use case of converters for tight projects. Moving forward to a feature of free packages called unions. Marvel Comic API exposes a story summary object that describes a story in a Marvel comic. And stories can be of three types, cover, interior, and promo. In plain Dart classes, this record would look like this. And in freezed unions terms, it will be implemented like this. Here, a Marvel Story Summary class is a freezed model declared in the same way as the Marvel comic. The difference is Marvel Story Summary has three named constructors, cover, interior, and promo. The challenge is to keep using code generation with JSON serializable and automatically parse this type of complex data structure from JSON. The generated G file contains instructions on how to parse individual model types. And the generated freezed file contains a switch that decides what model type to parse based on the runtime type value. So in order to properly parse Marvel Story Summary object to one of its union subtypes, the incoming JSON has to have a runtime type key with either cover, interior, or promo value. Obviously, it is unlikely that the backend would send such a property with exactly these values, especially the API we don't own. However, Marvel Comic API instead sends a type field that can be either cover, interior story, or promo. The freeze package provides ways to customize both the union type key with union key property and constructor names with freeze union value attribute. After these changes, the generated freeze file does switch on type field instead of runtime type. And now Marvel Story Summary class can be effortlessly parsed from JSON. But what if it's not that simple? or you need more control over what's happening during union parsing. Let's take a look at another example, the creator summary object. Marvel Comic API has all kinds of creator roles like editor, writer, inker, pencilier, colorist, and many more. So we have a new freeze union creator summary with named constructor for all creator roles we are interested in and other for all the rest. The API has two types of pencilia role, which we don't want to distinguish between and want them all to be parsed as just pencilia. So how to solve this task? Once again, the generated freeze file contains a switch that decides into which union model type to parse. The trick is to modify the incoming JSON map providing the required runtime type key with an appropriate value. So here, before passing the incoming JSON further to from JSON generated implementation, it is modified by append runtime type method. I have declared a map of correspondence between the role name coming from the API and the name of the freeze union constructor, which solves the double pencilia task. And other runtime type is provided in case the role name was not found in the map. Now Marvel's creator summary can also be properly parsed from the incoming JSON. Ready for the next union challenge? We looked at scenarios where a union type indicator is contained inside the union model itself, like the type field of a story summary or the role field of creator summary. But it's not the rare case 
when such an indicator is a part of the outer wrapping model. Let's take another example. Marvel series summary object. It has a format enum field, and depending on its value, the metadata union field should be parsed to different Marvel series summary metadata subtype classes. Essentially, the solution is the same. Somehow modify the incoming JSON to place a proper runtime type key. But this time I use the read value method, which supports logic that requires accessing multiple fields at once. Here I provide the method name to the JSON key attribute. And here is what is going on inside. The incoming JSON map contains the data for the entire Marvel series summary object, not only metadata field. This allows us to access both the value of the format and the JSON of metadata. First, I decode the format field from string to an enum, just as the generated code would do. Then I use the runtime types map below to pick the metadata union constructor name based on the format field. And then I put it inside metadata JSON map under a runtime type key. And that's it. Using read value feature does not change any of the subsequent decoding logic for the field. So read format metadata value method returns a JSON map dedicated to metadata. These were the three ways of parsing union types for the incoming JSON. Now to the last model related topic. Oftentimes, backend response with data wrapped into a generic response object containing request metadata, such as status code or timestamp. It is the right place to use generics for a data model that represents such a response object. This time, we are using JSON Realizable alone to create a generic Marvel API response class. Here, the FromJSON constructor accepts a second parameter, which informs how to parse the generic data field. The generated G file contains FromJSON implementation, which uses this parameter on data JSON value. Now, we can use this code to parse an API response containing Marvel comic class. Okay, so far we have prepared a full featured data model with default values, converters, enums, unions, and generic API response class that are going to be used later to parse and carry data obtained from Marvel Comic API. Next in our topics list is a Dio package which provides an object to perform network requests. When created, the DO object can accept base options that will be applied to every request, such as base URI, timeouts, query parameters, and headers. DO object exposes get, post, put, patch, delete, and other methods. In here, if example API is given a DO object configured as it was shown before, the get request will be sent to the get example path and will have two query parameters and two headers, one given here explicitly and one from the DO base setup. Post and other methods can accept data to be sent with the request. We just saw how each DO request can be complemented with headers or query parameters with static values. But what if, let's say, each request should contain a timestamp or another value unique for each request? As you can imagine, this logic will quickly be duplicated all over the project and may be forgotten about here and there. Instead, this should be implemented with an interceptor, like this one. It overrides the own request and appends the required timestamp as query parameter to each request. It now has to be attached to the DO instance used to perform requests, and that's it. 
In fact, the Marvel Comic API imposes a more sophisticated requirement. Each request has to have three query parameters, public API key, timestamp, and an MD5 digest of the timestamp parameter, your private key, and your public key. Again, such a requirement can be easily satisfied with DO Interceptor. To make the implementation closer to a real-life scenarios, the new Interceptor accepts the public key as a parameter. The private key isn't synchronously obtained from some service. After this Interceptor is attached to the DO instance, all requests it makes to Marvel Comic API are authenticated. Creating an array of interceptor is intentional here. In tight projects, we typically use multiple interceptors for different purposes. By now, we have a configured DO object capable of performing authorized requests to Marvel Comic API and a set of models to contain data. We are actually ready to perform a first API request. Here you can see the getComics method performs a get request to comics bus. The obtained JSON data is of string dynamic map type. We use Marvel API response from JSON constructor. The comics API returns a paginated list of comic objects, which on its own is a generic type. So we are using Marvel paginated list from JSON constructor inside response JSON parser. Now, because Marvel paginated list is also generic type, it's from JSON also accepts two parameters. And we finally pass the Marvel comic from JSON there. As a result, getComics method returns a parsed Marvel API response object with a Marvel paginated list of Marvel comic models. We discovered what is DO and how to leverage its interceptors mechanism, and also made a first authorized request to the Marvel comic API. Look at this repository, which uses Marvel comic API we have just implemented. If we were to create solitary unit tests for it, it would look something like this. We'd mock Marvel Comic API and check that the repository returns the data from the API class. Solitary tests only test one class in isolation. Then we'd need to have tests for the API class and also tests for parsing logic. Instead, we test them all together via sociable tests. That looks similar to this. At Tide, we came up with another interesting application for the DOA interceptors concept. Here I'm using all real implementations and am attaching a mock interceptor to a DO instance. This interceptor lets me mock the incoming JSON on the deepest networking layer with handler resolve call. This way we can test the JSON deserialization logic for all involved models with one test. There is an interesting side effect of this approach. Sometimes it may happen that the mobile application is being developed faster than the required API, or the backend dev environment may be down for maintenance, or even trickier. We may have to develop an integration with a third party service that is either being developed or can also be done for some reason over which we have no control. To unlock ourselves and keep developing the code as close to the production version as possible, we can use such DO interceptors outside of tests in order to mock a real API responses. So if I apply this interceptor to a production DO instance, it will not perform a real call to the Marvel Comic API to get comics list, but instead it will return a predefined response. This is a very flexible way to mock the backend behavior, including error scenarios. Now to another advanced networking topic, which is proxy support. 
There are multiple reasons the application should respect the device proxy configuration. Users might have a security setup configured on their device that prevents the application from using the internet at all if it doesn't respect proxy settings. The testing team might want to test the application against a mock backend, etc. By default, the device proxy settings are ignored by the application. Here is how we fix it. Internally, DIO uses an HTTP client to perform requests through the adapter. The default HTTP client adapter exposes on HTTP client create callback, providing a chance to interact with the inner HTTP client object. It exposes a find proxy field that is a callback that reads the proxy settings. The find proxy function will be called with each request to DO object, and it is where the inner HTTP client can be informed of the current proxy setup. Currently, it returns direct, which means no proxy setup. Reading device proxy settings is an asynchronous process, but as you can see here, the find proxy call expects to be executed immediately. To overcome this limitation, we developed a three parts solution. First is a shared in memory storage to hold and expose current device proxy settings. Second is a DO interceptor that asynchronously reads device proxy settings on each request and stores the result in that shared storage. And finally, a class that exposes a find proxy method that synchronously reads stored proxy settings and forms a proper response for the inner HTTP client. It is important that both interceptor and proxy finder share the same instance of proxy holder. When it's all put together, the on request method of proxy interceptor is called before each API call and saves current device proxy settings in the proxy holder. The find proxy callback of proxy finder is also called before each API call, but after the interceptor. So it can be sure to read fresh proxy settings from the shared proxy holder instance. If there is no requirement to immediately catch the new proxy settings, proxy holder could return cached values until the app is restarted. Now we are done with the more advanced setup of the DO instance used to perform API requests. The rest of this talk is dedicated to the efficient implementation of REST API requests. The getExample method here consists of four lines of mostly boilerplate code, while the meaningful information is only the getExample path and the example response return type. We at TIED don't implement such calls manually, but instead use the retrofit package. Here is the new example API implementation. The REST API attribute annotates the entire example API class, which is now abstract. Factory constructor accepts a DO instance and returns a generated class constructor. The getExample method now only declares its return type and is annotated with get attribute providing a request path. The part declaration informs the file name for the generated code. Now, uh, the generated class implements the abstract example API class declared before. In essence, the code is very similar to what was written in the manual implementation. The DO object injected in the constructor is requested for a string dynamic map via get request to the get example path. The response is parsed to example response object via from JSON constructor. Here is another example with more attributes. The REST API attribute now accepts a base URL parameter. The post example method is of type post and its path contains an ID, which is passed as a parameter to post example method with path attribute. 
The first example method sends data of type string dynamic map, which is annotated with body attribute. The put example method is quite similar, but it performs a put request. It also accepts a pass parameter ID, but additionally has a query parameter named API key. Its body is of custom example body type. Finally, the delete example method only has a pass parameter ID and performs the delete request. The generated code reflects changes in the configuration file. Base URL, request types, pass, and query parameters were copied from the abstract example API class declaration to the generated implementation. Let's now apply this new knowledge to the Marvel Comic API we implemented previously manually. If you remember, the API returns data wrapped into a generic Marvel API response object containing request metadata. Retrofit covers this case as well. Look how the API implementation changed. We only declare the getComics method and annotate it with get attribute. The generated code is almost identical to the manual. Can you see the chain of from JSON constructor calls for generic types? Retrofit has generated perfectly valid code for deserializing generics. Now we have re-implemented our Marvel API with only a few lines of code using Retrofit. Now I am going to talk all about request headers. Here is the first example. If a request is required to send a known set of static headers, it can be annotated with the headers attribute and specify a map of a header name and value. The generated G file declares a headers map with the same values and uses it in the request options. Now, if there is a need to specify this, headers over and over again, here is the optimization trick. Dart allows using any constant as an annotation. Here we create a popular headers constant of type headers and use it instead of the actual headers annotation above the request declaration. This implementation is completely identical to the previous one and it generates the same code. Now to another example a single dynamic request header. Here, the header annotation is used in front of the method parameter. In the generated code, the header value is a method parameter and it is put to the same headers map under header name key. The same trick with creating a reusable annotation is applicable to the header attribute. Here, the known header is saved to a const field popular header and used as an annotation. The generated code did not change after this modification. Next, to multiple dynamic headers. Here is again the headers annotation, but this time values in the map are dynamic. Check the generated code. The method accepts two parameters and uses them inside headers map under corresponding keys. Cool, huh? Extracting dynamic headers attributes to a const annotation is also possible. However, for it to work, the method parameter names should match values in the popular dynamic headers map. And that requirement is easy to forget if the annotation declaration is located in a different file. So far, we talked about individual request headers. If the same group of headers is required to be appended to all API requests. That can be done efficiently through DO interceptors. This interceptor here is pretty similar to the one responsible for making authenticated requests to the Marvel Comic API. It appends a static API key header, a timestamp calculatable header different for each request, and an access key header obtained from the external source. When attached to DO instance, it sends this group of headers with each request. But let's say, for example, the login and forgot password requests do not require access key header. 
If there are only few requests that should not contain one of these headers, this interceptor still can be used with minor modifications. Obviously, developers have to remember to update the list of exceptions with each new request. This approach may work well for small to medium applications, but we at Tide use a more advanced technique. Are you still there? We finally got to the part which I personally am the most excited about. At Tide, we have a pretty extensive networking layer with hundreds of API calls. When developing apps at such scale, it is a must to minimize code duplication, optimize around creating only the code that matters, and decreasing the boilerplate as much as possible. So here is our challenge. Among other headers that are attached with each request, there are five particular headers that are sent with some or most API requests. They represent information available globally in the application, like access keys, some identifiers, information about installation, etc. But let's give them simpler names. All requests to our API require two to four of those headers attached. So, for example, request A requires headers 1 and 2, request B headers 2, 3, and 5, request C headers 2, 3, 4, and 5, and request D requires only headers 2 and 4. Here, requests A, B, C, and D mean request types rather than some particular requests. Just imagine how providing these headers to individual requests with header attribute would look like. To use such API, developers would have to obtain the same information over and over again from the commonly available sources. Remembering that there are hundreds of requests such as A and Bs in our project, it is hard to imagine the amount of code duplication this approach would lead to. Wouldn't it be cool to attach a DO interceptor that appends headers only to required requests. The challenge is to inform an interceptor about which requests require which headers. Ideally, such an interceptor should look similar to this. But what that some condition should be? Given our project scale, the approach with an exceptions list is not a feasible solution. We needed a way to mark each request with a set of headers it requires which DO interceptor would be able to understand. I have to introduce you to a new attribute called extra, which is dedicated to holding custom fields. It allows providing an extra string object map to a request that can be later retrieved in DO interceptors. Here is the generated file where an extra map is formed and sent with request options. Now it can be read in DO interceptor like this. If request options contain the append header key and it's true, then add a header to options headers. We also clean up the extra map so no other interceptor processes the same data. Now back to the tied request alphabet. Following this approach, we divided all API requests into groups based on the headers they require, and created custom annotations for each group, request A type, request B type, etc. Now they can be applied over API requests. As a result, the generated file contains unwrapped extra map values. Now they can be read in DO interceptor to decide whether to append headers. And users of API are free from providing irrelevant from their point of view information and can focus on passing in only the data that matters. The created annotations can be applied over any retrofit request, including the Marvel Comic API we created previously. How cool is that? Okay, one last piece of information. Because our application allows managing members' bank accounts, some operations are security sensitive and require users to enter their PIN or use biometrics so we can access some sensitive data. 
For simplicity, let's say we naively ask users if they agree to share secret data with a simple yes-no dialog. The obvious implementation is to call this method before calling each security-sensitive API request. However, such an approach has the same downside as we discussed before. Code application when implementing each security-sensitive request and taking care of irrelevant from the point of an API user information. The solution is also the same. Create a view interceptor and find a way to inform it which requests should be preceded by a user permission dialog. You might think, hold on, I know the solution. Use an extra annotation and append another marker to required requests. We also thought so, but it appears only one attribute of extra type is allowed on top of API request implementation. So we had to use another attribute that could annotate a retrofit request and have an effect on the generated code, which is the headers attribute. The advantage of using an extra attribute was that even if no interceptor is attached to the DO instance and does not clean up the extra map, it's not harmful to have something in it because it's not really used when the request is sent to the backend. With headers, if no interceptor is listening for it, and does not replace marking headers with something meaningful, it will be sent as is and may cause a misunderstanding with the backend. So we created a new annotation and a DO interceptor that would wait for and process such a header. It detects if the headers map contains a header with a special value. If it does, the interceptor requests for secret data. If the request was successful, data is appended as a security header value and the request proceeds as normal. Otherwise, API request is rejected. And we remember to clean the irrelevant header value. Now this annotation can be used over an API request, which no longer accepts any parameter. And users of the API can forget about its implementation details. The created annotation can be used over any retrofit request. So here it is annotating the get comics request together with the previous one. Now each time user updates the list of comics, they are asked for confirmation. The same approach is applicable for post request operations. It all depends on whether the code in the interceptor is executed before the parent on request call or after. So we now have looked into various ways of customizing API calls headers on a retrofit per request level, as well as globally in DO interceptors. I have applied some really simple UI to display a list of Marvel comics we have been downloading today. So here is how it looks like. You can find all the code we saw today in the GitHub repository. The tools and approaches described in this series are very close to what we have created for tight production code. If you find this approach as exciting as we do and would like to join our company to learn even more cool stuff we apply while developing our mobile applications with Flutter, check out our careers page for positions in different locations. We look forward to meeting like-minded, passionate professionals. Images and music used today belong to Marvel Entertainment, and these superheroes represent true sympathies of our engineering team. I hope you have learned something new and useful today, and you will be applying some of this stuff in your projects. Cheers! Okay, now is the time for the question section. So welcome, Anna. I hope you are well. Hi, hi, thank you. I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation. I hope too. So 
Another tips from Anna, she's a mentor at programs like uh, Human Developer Academy and Road to GDE. She contributes to open source software and she also has an interest in mobile app design. Anna is a senior staff mobile engineer at Tide and Tide is the lead provider of UK SME business accounts and one of the fastest growing fintechs in the UK. So we have the first question to her. In terms of code generations packages like Frist or similars, is there a good way to understand their impact on bundle size? Mm -hmm. uh, good question. Uh, if you take a closer look, for example, Frist, JSON serializable, retrofit basically all generating code generating packages that I mentioned today are dev dependencies, which means themselves they are not included in the application, but the code they produce is. And this code you would be either writing manually or uh, using code generating packages. When you do it manually, maybe you will do it slightly more efficient with less code, but honestly, uh, it wouldn't be such a dramatic change to, to deny yourself the leverages of code generation. Okay, thank you, Anna. The next question is, I am a web developer, but I am willing to make a native mobile app and I am not sure how efficient is Flutter and should I learn a new language like Dart to use it? Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, I understand the uh, concern about learning a new language, but honestly, if you saw any programming language, Dart would look somewhat similar, familiar to you. I remember myself switching from Xamarin and C sharp background is what it was kind of obvious how to use it. And in terms of Flutter efficiency, come on, it's Flutter global summit. Of course, we're here all fans of Flutter framework and can talk uh, about its benefits. It's efficient in uh, the development experience, like you create beautiful mobile applications really fast. And it's also inefficient in the production, meaning how uh, how fluent and nice the UI is you build with Flutter. Okay, the next one is, what is some API needs timestamp in request and some API don't require? Then how to use interceptor? Mm -hmm. I believe this question popped up uh, somewhere around parts three and four. So I believe I have pretty much answered it in the parts five and six. So go check it out. Thank you, Anna. If retrofit, if retrofit is generating the JSON and also the frist, isn't it duplicated or somehow it's just one uh, the JSON generated? Mm -hmm. uh, to be more precise, retrofit only generates the usage of the JSON method, not the implementation itself. So retrofit doesn't even know from where that to JSON implementation comes from, whether you created it manually or it was JSON serializable, who did the work. Uh, retrofit just relies for the models to have this to JSON method. And if it receives a model, which it expects should have to JSON method, but the model doesn't have it. Actually, Retrofit will complain in the uh, terminal when you run this code generation command. Okay, the next one. Can you briefly discuss you use DO package instead of the building Dart HTTP package? Mm -hmm. uh, well, the reason for that was pretty pragmatical. Like it's what retrofit is using. Like the retrofit generates code relying on the fact that you will be using DO as in as your HTTP client. And we are perfectly fine with it. We didn't find some downsides of uh, using DO. And it tied uh, with the scale of the products we create, we just really heavily rely on code generation and we, it is a must for us. 
Thank you, Anna. The last question we have, is it okay from architectural point of view to use ripples in interceptors? Mm -hmm. That is a good question. Probably one of those controversial philosophical questions we can have about architecture. Uh, as you saw in the examples I showed, I use um, constructor dependency injection most of the time. I left the dependency injection mechanism out of the scope of the code I showed you, but actually uh, that is the way we develop. So we expect dependencies to be injected. And as long as this separation is uh, uh, always kept in mind, I think it's fine. Uh, to be honest, in at Tide, we also have an interesting testing strategy. So we test uh, multiple layers together through widget tests. So uh, for our tests, this kind of separation doesn't even matter. Okay, we have a new question. How to make our plugin that support work with Build Runner? Mm -hmm. As it is on its own a very uh, interesting and big topic. I remember there was a talk about it at Flutter Vikings on February. So I would probably advise you to go check it there because a couple of minutes is not enough to explain everything. But it's definitely possible and would be cool to see more useful packages for code generation. Okay, thank you, Anna. Um, another one. Is it good idea to use injectable plugin for main, main singleton and repos? That is exactly the plugin we are using. So we, for dependency injection mechanism, we use get it and injectable, which registers all the dependencies for us in that get it instance. Okay, this is the last question. Well, guys, if you have anyone, um, you can reach Anna through the, her social media links. We will share them to you. Thank you very much, Anna, for your presentation. Thank you, have a great day. You too, bye-bye. Okay, our next speaker is Andre Diaconu. He will talk about making a controller for a Flutter game. He makes foldable devices, play nice with Flutter, and he has a great time representing the Microsoft Surface Duo team at conferences. Andre is a Flutter developer with experience on Surface Duo at Microsoft. They enhance an existing Flutter game to take advantage of the second screen on the Surface Duo. In dual landscape, the top screen we will show the game, while the bottom screen will show a Xbox-like controller. Welcome to another Microsoft talk on Flutter. My name is Andre Diacono, and I am part of the Microsoft Surface Duo team. My job is to make sure that you, Flutter developers, have an easy time developing for all foldable devices but especially the Surface Duo. Today, we are going to do something a bit different, something fun. We are going to build a very small game, and then we are going to enhance that game to have a separate controller on foldable devices. So let's discuss Flutter 3. With this new stable version announcement, we can now celebrate the fact that Flutter developers can publish production quality applications to both macOS and Linux on top of Windows and mobile and everything that we had until now. But Flutter 3 is a very important version for us at Microsoft because with this new version, the foldable support that we've been working on is now considered stable and production ready. It also means that you can use foldable support today regardless of the Flutter channel that you are using. This talk focuses specifically on how to use foldable support. And even though we are going to be enhancing a game today, there are a few things that I would like to go over. 
Dialogs use the first screen to render. This way your dialogs don't end up overlapping the hinge. First screen means different things in different cultures, so directionality is used to pick the screen. The example I'm showing is in English, so the left screen is chosen. You can of course specify where you want the dialogue to go. You can specify an anchor point, which you can view more like a target. Imagine you tap a button on one screen and you want the dialogue to show on the same screen. You can use the anchor point for that. Pop-ups, like context menus, also work out of the box. The game that I'm building today is fairly simple. I want to build a game that needs a gamepad so that the gamepad can be the focus of our foldable enhancements. This part of the talk is mostly going to be code, but the code is not necessarily Flutter code. This means that the code is very specific to Flame and has very little in common with widget development. This code might seem a bit alien to you. Let's see what we're starting with. What I have here is a material app that contains a game widget. The game widget takes a game parameter, which is a flame game object. Mine is named ships and rocks game. And um, I guess we'll see why, why it's named that way. So if we run the app as it is, we will see that the game renders this gray color. It's not really black. It's like a lighter gray. And this is the background that I chose for the game. Next, we add a ship to the game. My ship in this case is a sprite component. A sprite component means that it takes some kind of bitmap file. In this case, we have a ship.png file. If you look at it, this is a nice design that I made myself in Figma. Let's have a look at how this behaves. And if we run it on the device, yeah, we see that the ship is in the middle and it doesn't really do anything. But still, it's nice to validate that images are being loaded and that sprites work. Okay, now that we have our ship, we want our ship to go places. We want to control it. And for controlling it, my idea is to add a joystick. This is a very typical game UI and we will be adding the joystick in the bottom left. This is the code to make a joystick. Um, this is a component that comes with Flame, um, but it does need a few parameters in order to know how to draw the joystick, because you probably want to customize uh, the look and feel of it. Uh, for my game, I'm just going to make the knob and the background of the joystick be circles, and they are both going to be different shades of blue. If we run this version of the game on the device, we can see that the joystick is being rendered in the bottom left corner. But even though it is reacting to my touch input, it doesn't move the ship yet. So this is the next step that we are going to go through. Since we now have the joystick component already created and initialized, we give it to the ship component. The ship then takes the joystick and on each frame checks if there is input. And if there is, then it changes the position and the angle of the ship. So this happens every frame. But since frames are not constant, we are given this delta parameter, um, which we can use to ensure that the ship has a smooth movement regardless of the frame rate. One other thing that I'm doing with the ship is to ensure that it is visible. This is a helper method that I added here, which simply repositions the ship if it ever goes outside the bounds of the screens. Let's run this version of the app to see uh, how it looks and behaves. As you can see, um, the ship reacts to the changes of the joystick and I am now able to move the ship around. This is quite fun already, I would say. So uh, let's continue with the next step. In this next step, we will be adding a few rocks on the screen. I call them rocks, but they are just circles. And our ship uh, is supposed to, let's say, break them and also avoid them. So if we look at the rock class, it's very similar to the ship that we just made. 
Um, the only difference is that it is not a sprite component and it simply paints a circle. What is different from the ship class is that rocks are not controlled by the users. Instead, um, when we load this object, we define uh, a random velocity for rocks. And um, this velocity is then used every single frame to propel the rock in a constant direction. So let's run the app again and see what we get. As you can see, we have three rocks. I'm very happy with the animations that I'm seeing and that everything moves around smoothly. But as you can see, the ship isn't affected in any way by these rocks and the rocks aren't affected by the ship either. So the next step would be to add collision to the ship and the rocks. Collision callbacks is a mix-in that adds uh, collision capabilities to your components. So because we want the ship to collide only with rocks, I am first going to check if the other component is a rock. Then I add an effect to this component. This will make the opacity fluctuate and it will make it look like I just took some damage. So let's run this and see what happens. As you can see, I can move the ship around and every time I hit a rock, the ship kind of fades in and out. Okay, but now since our space traveler can take damage from rocks, we also want to give them the possibility to defend themselves. So next, we are going to build a bullet system. So if you look at the code for a bullet, it's actually a copy paste from the rock, but the color is different. The bullets are red and the size for the bullets are way smaller because we don't want uh, rock sized bullets. We want small bullets. The hitbox for a bullet is also a circle and it also has a velocity. The difference between the bullet and the rock is that the rock travels randomly while the bullet needs to come out of the ship. One other small difference is that bullets don't live for long. They exist only for one second. This way, the player needs to keep shooting if they want to hit the asteroids instead of having bullets wandering around space. Now that we have defined how bullets behave, we also need to add a bit of code to spawn them. So to spawn bullets, I will be adding another button to the screen. This is very similar to a joystick. We are going to define it in the same place and give it as a parameter to the ship. And on the onload method inside the ship, we uh, give the button a functionality. In our case, we add bullets to the parent of the ship. In other words, we just add bullets to the map and we give them the same position as the ship. And we give it an angle such that the bullets shoot out of the top of the ship and not out the side of the ship. So now that we have defined bullets as small red rocks that shoot when we press a button, let's see how this looks like on the device. As you can see, I can move the ship around. It still takes damage. And uh, there are these small little bullets that shoot out when uh, I press the button. Now, the next step would be to make the rocks take damage from the bullets. Um, this means that we want to have a collision between the bullet and the rock. And similarly to how we programmed the collisions for the ship, we can program the collisions for the rock. So in the case of the rock, if the other object is a bullet, we remove this rock from the parent we also remove the bullet from the parent, so they both disappear from our map. And um, if the size of the rock is bigger than 20, so it's still a sizable rock, we make two smaller rocks take its place. So in this way, the rock will seem to split into two. Let's see how it looks. Um, okay, so... I'm moving around, I'm taking damage, 
and I'm shooting. And as you can see, the rocks are being split into two and tinier and tinier pieces. At this point, I would say that I am mostly done. I'm quite happy with the game. Uh, but as you may have already noticed, I only used one screen of the device while developing it. Let's enhance uh, our game for the Surface Duo. So let's pan the game. Seems to work okay. It's not a bad experience. If I'm holding the device in dual portrait mode, I think honestly this is the best we can do. I can't move the controller to one of the screens in this position because it would just be awkward to hold the device like this. But where we can enhance this game and make it a lot better is in dual landscape mode. So if I hold the device like this, the experience is quite nice, but the hinge can hide enemies, so I want the bottom screen to be exclusively a controller. This way, the player focuses on the top screen without any joystick in the way. It's also very comfortable to hold. In some ways, it almost feels like the device was made for this. Okay, so now we have the game running on both screens of the device, but there's a certain way that we want the game to behave on this device. So let's first see what tools we have at our disposal to get the job done. Let's first have a look at media query and display features, which are the most important part of the foldable support recently added to Flutter's table. First, I want to introduce a new term. The highlighted areas are called display features. These are areas of the display that your app needs to know about. These features sometimes prevent pixels from being visible or just curve the display. This is why you might not want to draw anything where the display features are on the screen. Your layout can avoid them or use them as a logical separator for your UI. So let's look at the Surface Duo again. Even though the device has two physical displays, your app sees one continuous screen. Judging by the size of it, your app might think it is rendering on a small tablet. Display features are pieces of data that come from Media Query. On this device, Media Query reports this area as being a hinge. I can hear you asking, Andre, how many types of display features are there? I'm glad you asked. Displays can currently have three types of features, hinge, fold, and cutout. Let's start with the cutout. It has been around for a long time. Your code already takes it into account by using safe area. The one in the middle is a fold display feature. In such cases, the device has one single display which is flexible enough to fold. The area where this happens is a display feature and it also provides information about the shape that the display makes. The one on the left is a hinge. It joins two displays to form one continuous screen area. Your application can render on this larger area with the hinge acting as a natural division for your layout. The shape the display makes is called the posture. If the device is sitting flat on a table, the posture is flat. When you are using it as a mini laptop or as a book, the posture is half opened. The code I'm showing you soon will make more sense now that you know what display features and what postures are. Let's have a closer look at how this new data is structured. Media Query gets a new property, display features. The properties exposed by this class are bounds, type, and state. The bounds is a rectangle marking the area on the screen where the display feature is located. The type is an enum and can have the values hinge, fold, or cutout. The state is the posture. It is also an enum and can be flat or half opened. Note that a device can have multiple display features at the same time. Samsung devices usually have a fold and a cutout at the same time, for example. This is why Media Query exposes a list of display features and not just one display feature property. Getting back to our game, this is how it looks like right now from an architecture perspective. All the game components are simply parented to the game itself. What we want to do next is group the game into one game component 
and group the controller in another game component so that we can display them separately and have their own logics. First, as you can see, I no longer add the ship, the rocks, or the bullets directly to the game. Now the game contains game elements and controls. The game controls uh, contains only the joystick and the button. And the game elements um, contains the rocks and uh, contains also the ship. Now the ship still needs access to the joystick and the button so it can read the input from the user. So the game controls are given to the game elements as a uh, constructor parameter. The one big difference is the positioning logic. Before, we used to take the size of the screen from game ref. So instead of doing that, we now have a property called position parent. And if I uh, navigate to it, you'll see that position parent is just uh, uh, mixing that I made so that um, I'm getting the parent cast as a position component. What this does in turn is allow me to uh, access the size and position of my parent, which I will need in order to position myself. Um, the rest of the code is mostly the same. Um, everywhere where we had a game reference, uh, I swapped that to a parent reference. Um, of course, there are some places like game reference load sprite. This um, is the kind of functionality that will remain the same. One other thing that these parent game components do is size themselves to be the same size as the game itself. I know it makes very little sense because we did all this work so they can have different sizes. So having the game elements and the game controller be the same size as the game should give us the exact same result that we had until now. All of these changes that we made are structural, but they are not different visually yet. Let's preview this on the device and confirm that we didn't mess anything up. So if I run the game, I still have the controllers at the bottom. I still have rocks and bullets and the ship still uh, reacts to collisions. So everything is good and we should go on to the next step. Make each of these parent components have different size and positioning when a hinge is present on the device. So for this, I am going to hook into two events that the game has. One is on game resize. This gets called every time the game has a different size. So um, in our case, when we span and unspan the app, the game will have a different size. And we also hook into on attach so that we can calculate the sizes when the game first launches. On these two events, we then resize the game parents using the context and uh, media query display features. So we start off with uh, giving game elements and the controls the same size as the game. So if none of the next bits of logic come through, we still have um, the behavior that we have right now. So nothing changes. But if the build context is null, and it can be null in this game engine if um, the game hasn't been yet attached, and there's some other situations where the context is not there. So if it's not there, then we do nothing. But if we do have a context, we find the nearest media query, we get the display features, we go over the display features. And if there is a display feature that's a hinge, or if there's a display feature that has a half open posture, so if the display is in a mini laptop posture, let's say we want the bottom part to be controls and the top part we want it to be a game. So moving over to the last bit of code, if the boundary, um, which in, can be a hinge or a fold, if the boundary is not null and the boundary is not at the top of the screen, we set the game elements height 
to be the top part above the display feature. What this does in the end is it sizes the game elements to be the same size as the top screen. If we want to um, run this now on the device, you can see that nothing happens when I'm in single screen mode. And really, if I span the app and I'm in dual portrait mode, still nothing happens. This is because we checked for the top coordinates of the display feature bounds to not be zero. So we specifically didn't want to enhance the game in this situation. What we want instead is when we flip the device in dual landscape mode, we want to have the controls at the bottom, as you can see here, and we want to have the game at the top. Now there's something that I want to make a bit clearer and I'll just go ahead and explain it. When the application runs on one single screen, no display features are reported. That's because your application is not actually intersecting the display feature. So only the display features that your application overlaps get reported. Uh, in this case, when I'm in single screen, this doesn't happen. So the display features array is empty. I hope that makes things a bit clearer and why I didn't have to check for different types of states or listen for changes in display features. When the display features are outside the bounds of your application, they don't even get reported. Now, I'm quite happy with these results, but I want to take this a step further and also use 2Pane as a specialized widget for enhancing four foldable devices. But before I jump into how to use 2Pane, I think it's worth discussing where you can get it from. So 2Pane is part of our dual screen package that you can find on pub.dev. Apart from 2Pane, this package also contains some other things useful for dual screen development. So going back to our game, to make this work with 2Pane, we first need to separate our game into two separate widgets. Right now, the architecture of this application contains just one game widget, and inside that game, we have two parent components, which then house the game elements and the controls. What we want to do next is separate the game elements and the game controller into their own game engine so that they can be housed inside separate game widgets. This is because 2Pane works with widgets and not flame components. Let's see how this looks in code. First, our material app no longer contains a game widget. It instead contains this separate games with 2Pane widget, which contains a 2Pane widget configured in a certain way. It receives a start pane and an end pane, both game widgets that run different games technically. One of them is called Ships and Rocks Game, and the other game is called Ships and Rocks Control. If we go over to Ships and Rocks Controls, we can see that this is a very, very simple game. It simply houses the game controls parent, and it does nothing else. It also has a different background. I want this one to be a deep black and no longer be gray. You'll see why in a minute. If we go over to Ships and Rocks game, this is also fairly simple. It no longer contains logic related to media query. This is something that 2 Paint does for us. It still resizes the game elements, so it doesn't have a zero zero size, and it only houses the game elements. The reason why we do this is that we still have situations where the controls should be rendered on top of the game. This happens when the application is not spanned or the application is running on a device that is not a foldable, in which case we, we still want the joystick and the button to be on top of the game. To know if we show the controls or not, we have a constructor parameter show controls, which gets populated in our main widget. If we dive into this bit of logic further, we can see that this is very similar to what we had before. We are looking for a hinge or a fold that is half opened. And if we find it, then we conclude that we have two panes 
And if we have two panes showing, then we do not show the controls. If we only have one pane showing, then we do show the controls. The parameters that we give to two pane dictate how it behaves both on foldable devices and on non-foldable devices. For example, we give it a vertical direction and we give it a pane priority start. What this means is that if you only show one pane, then I want it to be the first one. I want it to be the game, not the controls. Now, pane priority can also have the value both, in which case we show both panes. So, whenever the direction can be made vertical, I am allowing 2Pane to override this parameter. What I am asking 2Pane to do is to display both panes vertically if the display is in dual landscape mode. Let's preview this on the device in order to understand things a bit better. As you can see, when I'm in single screen mode, the controls get overlaid on top of the game. When I span the app and I'm in dual portrait mode, the layout is the same as in single screen mode. But if I turn the device sideways and I'm in dual landscape mode, I can see that the controls are at the bottom and the game is at the top. If I unspan the app, I can see that the game goes back to single screen mode and the controls are overlaying the game. Let's go back to spanned since this is the version of the game that I first envisioned. Before I end this talk, there are a number of resources that I want to show you. The first resource is our collection of design patterns. These are five design patterns that you can pick up and use right away when enhancing your foldable application. You can find all these design patterns on our website, but they are also part of the design kit. The design kit is a Figma file that you can give your designer to help them figure out how to enhance the designs for foldable devices. Second, a Surface Duo emulator. It's free and we do our very best to make sure the experience is one-to-one -one with the real device. Where this emulator differs from the foldable emulators you find in Android Studio, is that this one simulates the hinge area differently. The Android Studio emulators have continuous screens, like the Samsung Galaxy Fold and Flip, and the Surface Duo emulator has two separate screens, like the real device. So if you want to study the design patterns, download the emulator, grab the design kit, or see how other frameworks deal with foldable enhancements, head on over to aka.ms slash dual dash screen. And also please make sure to follow us on Twitter. We're quite active. We write a blog post every week and we also have a Twitch stream on Fridays. So give us a follow and um, until next time, thank you very much for attending this talk and see you at the Q&A session. Andre will have the opportunity to answer questions after our next speaker presentation, where we will have Andre and Lucas answering questions. Next, we will have an announcement. I hope everyone is having a great summit. And uh, we also wanted to mention our community partner, Somnia Software. And uh, their company is 100 specialized in uh, providing Flutter services for both mobile and web applications. And they have been working with Flutter since its official release. And uh, it's probably safe to say that they are Flutter fanatics. Uh, Somnio helps both startups and big uh, the market players with both custom software development and also nearshore staff augmenting services. So basically Somnio focuses on becoming technological partners for your team and they offer help throughout the whole development process in order to achieve this. They have both Flutter developers of each level of seniority, QA testers, project managers, UI, UX designers, business analysts, and strategists. So basically, if you need any help with Flutter development, contact them and become partners in transforming your ideas into innovative and successful apps. And uh, thank you, Somnio, for supporting this, uh, this event and this community.
Now, I'll present Lucas Klingsbow. He will teach us how to build a game in Flutter in less than an hour. Hello, John. Hello, Lucas. How are you doing? I'm doing all good. So yeah, I'm Lucas from the Blue Fire team, and uh, we're most famous for making the Flame engine, which is, uh, well, the game engine for Flutter. And I guess since we don't have that much time, I guess we should get started right away. Great, Lucas. Uh, Lucas is a developer, keyboard builder, and member of the Blue Fire Open Source Collective which focuses on bringing great libraries to the Flutter community. He's a senior Flutter developer at Bluefire. And he's mentioned their biggest project is the Flame Game Engine. So Lucas, what do you prepare for us? Well, we're going to code uh, a little uh, like Flappy Bird scheme. So uh, yet another uh, Flame Game coming up. Awesome. Now it's time to see his presentation. All right, let's get started, shall we? In this talk, we're going to code a little Flappy Birds clone in, uh, in Flame. And since we don't have that much time, I have uh, prepared a few files here to get us up to speed faster. So we can just dive straight into it. Let's start with the main file here. Looks pretty much like any main file in a Flutter project. So we have the run app here where we uh, run the game widget, which is something we expose in Flame. And uh, the game widget simply wraps uh, a Flame game. And you can also have things like uh, a loading builder in there if you want to show like uh, a loading screen or something uh, before the game starts. Or meanwhile, the game is loading. Uh, yeah, so we can dive straight into the skeleton of a game class here. So usually in Flame, you just extend a Flame game. And you usually want to have to override onload method. So in onload, you want to add, uh, you want to load assets and uh, like generate things. And so meanwhile, the loading builder is running uh, in the game widget, the onload methods will be running uh, behind the scenes. So that's a good place to load things in. And in Flame, pretty much everything is a component. We have something that we call the, the Flame component system in Flame, which or FCS for short. And the Flame component system is so that everything is that is a component, it can have uh, child components. And if it is, for example, a position component, which is one of our most common components, which is something that is somewhere on the screen, it has a size and it has a scale, it has an angle. Then all of the child components will be transformed in the same way as their parents will, or their grandparents, or and all the way down the line. And the flame game is also a component, and it is usually the root in uh, this flame component system. So that's that one has uh, uh, children, and those children can have children uh, that are components, etc. You could also have uh, flame games that are children of other flame games, but if you're making like a lot of mini games or something, for example. So the flame component system is uh, quite powerful. Um, right. So and. In, we, we're using something called uh, a, the classic game loop. And in the game loop, we have uh, two methods that is always running, update and render. So first the update method is running and that updates the state of everything. And then the render method is running and then back and forth or back and forth. And those ones should be running 60 times per second at least to get 60 FPS or like 120 if your device supports that to get the smooth experience. Um, and uh, yeah, we can get started with, uh, I have prepared a little player here that we're gonna use. And we're gonna use uh, our mascots, which is called Ember, like it's the flame mascot. So we can have a look at that one here. So this is something called a sprite sheet. 
And you can see this one has uh, just four different uh, black sprites in it. And if you run those quickly after each other, it'll look like an animation. So then in for this player, we will use the sprite animation component and we will set the animation to uh, load this image that we have put in in our assets. And then we will say that there are four of, uh, of the sprites in there and that each of the sprites are 16 pixels big. So it's like a very low resolution animation, uh, quite nice for like pixel art games. And it should be uh, 0.12 seconds between each animation. So then we can get started on adding that to our game. So let's go ahead here and add the player. And uh, as you can see down here, we're already running the game, and but it's yes black because nothing is added yet. So if we run this again, it is still yes black because in this class, it doesn't have a position or a size or anything yet. So we can start by adding that to, uh, so that we can see that it's there. Uh, so in, in Flame, we use Vector2 for almost everything. Uh, positions and sizes and uh, yeah, whatever you think of. Uh, and uh, a lot, like I said earlier, a lot of the classes are extending something called position component. And all position components have position, size, scale, and angle. So here we're going to set the position and size to start with to see if we can get it showing in the game. So there we go. Now you can see the little animation running here, which will serve as our player. And uh, since the background is uh, quite boring here, we will uh, start by adding something for that. And if you're like me, like uh, completely incapable of designing anything, I can really recommend uh, itch.io because they have lots and lots of game assets that are either free or very cheap. So for this presentation, I just bought uh, like a, a pack for doing parallaxes and it had maybe 50 files in it or something with amazing trees and everything. But since we don't have that much time in this presentation, we'll just use very few of those uh, files. So right now I'm thinking of putting this sky as the background, for example. So we can uh, start with doing that. Uh, so let's name that one sky. And that one is uh, not going to be an animation component, but it's just going to be a sprite component. So a sprite in, in like game dev language is basically just an image. Uh, and we don't have to have any uh, position or size on this one, or we need the size, but that one we don't know in the constructor. And the position by default is zero, zero. And we, and Zero, 0 is up in the left corner so that and that is where we want the background to start showing so in in the sprite component we just have to set the sprite to uh, right and oh, here we go that one actually let's uh, let's get that image then and in Flame, we have a, a different caches, and flame.images is a global cache that you can use from anywhere. And you also have images on the game itself, so that that cache is specific for the game. But if you're making a simple uh, game like this, you can use just use the global cache. Uh, and our image is called sky.png. So let's load that one first and put that one into the sprite here. So right now it doesn't have a, uh, the background doesn't have a size and we want the background to uh, always fill the full screen because in this game we don't have any like sense of world or anything. We're just, uh, we're just always showing the same part of the world. So we always want to cover the back with, uh, with a full, uh, uh, background. 
and so we will override something a method that we call uh, on game resize and that one is called once before on load and then it is called every time that we like change the size of this window and that one gets a vector true too and uh, so then we just we simply want to set the size of this uh, component to the game size and uh, we should get uh, get it to show up here if we add it to the game let's add this guy here oh yeah i need to import it and let's run it and boom we got the sky but our player disappeared and it disappeared since we added the sky after the player and in this case we could just add the sky before the player but in a lot of cases you don't know beforehand which order things will be added in because things can be added from anywhere it can be added as like reaction to input or yeah, or just randomness but you still want them to maintain the, set, the same set index or like the same uh, in flame we call it priority so if uh, if i always want the sky to be behind everything else we can set the priority to be minus uh, one for example the default priority is zero so usually uh, what i usually do is put like backgrounds as negative and then I can keep everything that is supposed to be like in the middle as zero and then things that should be in the foreground they can I can put those ones as higher priorities so now if I add priority minus one there then we see that it is rendered behind uh, the, our player even though uh, we're adding it after the player so that's good then we can continue with adding so right now it feels very like uh, stiff like no, there's nothing happening here so let's talk a little bit about the parallax component that we have and a parallax is something that you can easily use in a 2d game if you want to give it a sense of depth like it's several layers of images that are rendering behind each other and the one that is closest to you is moving fastest and the one that is furthest away is moving slowest like imagine sitting on a train for example and you look out the window and the bushes and trees that are really close to you they're moving by the window really quickly but the mountains and things far far away they're moving very slowly so you can emulate this uh, this sense of depth, which some call a parallax. But in this uh, this talk, we're only going to use one layer. So we, it's not really a parallax, but it's the parallax component. It makes it easy to make something just move. So we'll start with adding a parallax component. And that one we will call ground. It will just be some ground thing by here. And uh, with that one, we will extend the parallax component. And that one can also have uh, priority minus one, so it's like behind the player. So in here, I was thinking we could use this image for the ground. Uh, so here, we'll just load. Uh, so that one and that one is called ground or png and in here we yes, set the parallax so and the parallax you can set in a lot of different ways depending on how advanced you want your parallax but since we want a really simple parallax now we'll just add uh, a list of parallax layers and it will only be one parallax layer in there uh, but you can have things like animated parallaxes and yeah all kinds of crazy things uh, so we need a parallax layer here and the parallax layer take the parallax image and the parallax image is the ground image and we don't want like by default it's uh, uh, 
like trying to fill the screen on uh, one of the axes. So I think the default is to fill it uh, horizontally, no, vertically. Uh, but right now we don't want it to fill, fill it at all. We just want it to run by on the bottom. So then we have uh, the layer fill dot run. Let's see if this one can fix my formatting for me. Thank you. Um, all right. We don't have to set anything with the sizes or anything here that is all handled by the parallax component. So hopefully we could just add this one to the game and it should work. Let's try that. That one was called ground. And if you want to add multiple player, uh, multiple components here, you can also do add all and then uh, list here. Okay, so it's not showing up. Mm, why would that be? So we have probably forgotten to do something. We have priority minus one, and but we're adding it after the sky, so that means it should be in front of the sky. Um, we're not getting any errors here. Mm, what could it be then? Hmm. So, what the hell? And uh, when you're doing presentations, your brain is always thinking a little bit slower, so it takes a little bit longer to figure out what is wrong. Uh, maybe it didn't. Oh, okay. Maybe it just didn't restart properly, I guess. And uh, we want the we want to have some form of uh, speed in the game, so uh, so that the ground is moving, etc. So let's just add a speed parameter and like two hundred, say like two hundred pixels per second will be. Yeah, we'll see if that, that is a good speed to have. So then in the ground here, we can add some uh, a mix in that we call has game rep. And the has game rep, you can you give the the game that you want to have access to. So then it gives you a variable called game ref, which is uh, the game that it is the component is attached to, which is quite useful if you want to store some global variables and things like score or yeah, or anything like that. So our game was called uh, Lappy Amber Game. And I guess this wasn't imported. And now, okay, why is it angry now then? Oh yes, because the Parallax component already has a game ref. So now we will just give, give the generics directly to that one and it will have a game ref. And now we will override the update method that I was speaking about in the beginning of the talk. And this will run all the time, like 60 times per second at least. So here we can set the parallax has something called a base velocity. And since we don't want to, we don't want to move the ground up or down, we just want to move it sideways, we'll just set x here. And x should be the speed that we set on the game. And the game is our game ref here. And this one is complaining because the parallax can be null, but so we can just do like that. We also know that it won't be null. That is fine. Super.update. And the, the dt value that you see here, uh, it's delta time. Uh, so that is the time from the last uh the last tick that we call it uh, and that's the last time it ran update which makes so that that makes sure that everything will run in the same way even if you're losing fps so if you're running on like a slower device or something so you always have to take dt into consideration if you're moving things manually as we're doing here there's there are also ways of not moving things manually but using uh, flame to move things, uh, which are called effects, which will come into later. Um, 
but right here on the base velocity here we're not mo uh, moving anything manually we're just setting the base velocity to the speed and that one already expects it to be pixels per second uh, so to set it directly to 200 here is fine and we don't have to care about the dt so now if we restart this let's see if we yeah there we go we have a, uh, our ground moving and it gives it a little bit of sense that the uh, ember is moving the player so what should we do next then yeah we can uh, we can show the debug mode so this is very useful especially when you're new to plane or well new from Mox, new to plane too uh, to see what is going on in the game so if i restart here and you can see when i set the debug mode to true on the player here and we can see that we get its position in the upper left corner 100 100 and its position in the bottom right corner 150 150 and if we have any shell components of that uh, that components that we're setting the bug mode equals the true to they will also show these boxes and if they have hit boxes so a hit box is something that can collide with other hit boxes those will also uh, show here because usually they're invisible um and if you set debug mode equals to true directly on the game then all components everywhere will be rendering with debug mode so that can be very useful too uh let's start to add so right now this one is just floating forward let's add some like velocity so that it's falling downwards uh, so maybe we want to it as we have a speed of 200 in uh, sideways maybe we can try to have it as 200 downwards too so we don't want it to move x in x direction but we want to move it downwards in y direction so let's try or 200 might be too much let's try 100 and then we do the same Thing as we did in the parallax here we override the update method and here we will have to take dt into account uh, and here we have the position and we want to set its y value and we want to add uh, the velocity uh, y value here and we want to times that with dt because if we just set it to, if we just add 100 pixels for every tick, then it will add 100 times 60 pixels for one second, since it runs this 60 times per second. Uh, and we don't, uh, we don't want that. We want it to move in a sensible way. So now you can see it's just falling down and falling, falling, falling. So it will probably be at like 10,000 pixels soon. So we want to add, uh, I guess we, we want the player to lose when it hits the edge here. So first of all, we have to, we can add a hitbox on, uh, to the player. And since this one, uh, you can add one hitbox or many hitboxes and you can place them in different places on top of the, on top of your component. But since this one is quite round, we can just add a circuit hitbox and if you we don't add any arguments to the hitbox it will just like fill the component as much as it can which i think will fit pretty well here so if we restart this one i'm not sure it's pretty hard to see it for you i guess but it's a circle right around right around the amber here and if we would do a rectangle for example it would be exactly the little square that was already there around the player but since the since the circle is uh, like more exact we'll use that that one for now but uh, yeah by just adding the hitbox nothing happens because uh, right now we don't have any collision detection system active so if we go back to the game we can add with as collision detection and it will run a collision detection system in uh, the background 
and by default it doesn't collide with the uh, side of the screen but uh, if we add a screen hitbox that is built into flame then it will uh, then it can react to collisions on the uh, with the screen too so if i do it like this and run it again it will still just go straight through the screen because we're not acting on the collision yet so we have to add uh, uh, collision callbacks here to see that like something should happen when we are uh, colliding with something and if we go in here we can see that it has an on collision start so let's just copy that signature so we can override it override oh that was not the right one Oops, this is not going very well, clearly. I think I copied 44 lines instead of 4. There we go. And on collision start, it takes, it gets the intersection points and what other components that it has uh, collided with. You can also get uh, the collisions on a hitbox basis, so you know what hitbox that it has collided with, but that we're not going to use now. And we're not really going to care about the intersection point style, so we can just put it like that. And every time it collides with something, we can say, uh, so you can have like a game over or something, or we can just pause the game. And in this, I think we don't have a game ref, so I can add a grid as game ref here, so that we can uh, get that one here and we just run pause engine and this one then is also called super too and now if we read on this we can see that when it hits the bottom the engine pauses so now usually you would do you can put like menus from flutter and stuff here and have a restart and whatever, but I'm not going to show any of that. Uh, but you can use Flame's overlays system to use this for a reference. Uh, so let's quickly add, we don't have that much time left, so let's quickly add a, a box that is going here so that we can uh, uh, collide with something. And that one, oh, that one should also be a sprite component so we can copy the sky there since that was also a sprite component we can rename that the box and oh and that one should not be uh, behind everything so that one should be on the same level as uh, the player so we don't have to have a priority there and we can use a box image here and have two boxes up there one and two um, but we'll just use one directly and add the box image and we don't have to have any on resize or anything but we want the box to move too so we'll add we'll add a all right update here too and we want we also want the box to start outside of the screen uh, so we can have the position is equal to, and here we need uh, the game ref to the, and the position should be the size of the game, uh, or we can do it like this. Uh, So the size of the game, it should we could want to start it outside. So that is the game size dot x because that will be like right in the right hand corner. And then we want it to have uh, we, we still want it to show on the screen because right the norm the anchor of uh, the default anchor of a component is top left. 
So if you put the position as the size of screen, it will be rendered right outside of the corner. But we want it to be rendered outside of the corner in X axis, but not on the outside of the corner in the Y axis. So we'll take the size of, uh, of the component itself, and minus there. Or you can also set the anchor to like bottom left or something instead. And I see that we have forgotten to set a size here for this one, so let's do that quickly. Um, that one can be it can be the same size as the player, which was fit there correctly. So there we go, an update, and we want to move that with the same speed as uh, we're moving the ground. So we we'll do position dot x uh, and we want it to move uh, leftwards so we'll kind of have the speed in game of course oh right and we don't have we haven't given this to generics yet so lap the ember game and speed times dt and oops and then we'll try to add a box here and see that it comes into play in the way. Oh, not imported, I guess. And let's run it. And there you can see our box. And our box should also have a hitbox. And that one should be, uh, since it's a rectangle, we'll just add a rectangle hitbox to it. Okay, we're running very short on time here, but uh, we'll do one last thing. Uh, and that is uh, giving uh, the player some speed up when you're pressing it. So let's add a little uh, method called fly here, maybe. And here we're going to add something called uh, an effect talked about earlier and we can uh, call it the or it's called the move by effect and we can move it uh, upwards or right upwards with so not in the x-axis but we want to move it upwards with I don't know 100 pixels and for the effects you need something called an effect controller and in the effect controller, you can handle how, what it should do during a certain time step uh, in the effect. So first we can set the duration to, uh, I don't know how fast that should go upwards, maybe 0 0.2 seconds, we can try out a bit. And then have a curve. And if you don't know what the curves are, uh, they're quite used in uh, for um, animations in Flutter too, and Flutter has a great way, a great documentation of showing the different curves and how they will act with different animations. So here we'll uh, just choose a curve called Decelerate. And on the game we'll add, uh, so we want it to be able to tap anywhere on the game and make the player fly. And since we don't have, we don't have a variable for the player here, we can do that. Uh, a file uh, player, and then we can just set the player to do that here. And then in we override on tap that came from that mixing that we had, and on tap we want the player to run the line. Let's see if we put any sensible values in there. If we Oh yeah, so now you can see that it's every time we press, it's flying a bit upwards, so that we can actually have play. And when we hit something, it just dies. And uh, yeah, since we're running out of time, I will just uh, add uh, add like uh, we want to stack those boxes. So I've prepared that file here. So something that we just call box stack. And it just takes uh, those boxes and puts them on top of each other. Uh, right, and that one expects us to have something called initial size here. So let's add that. Uh, 
And I'm gonna close all that here. And let's see if this one is complaining yet now. All right, and we also, it also wants to have a position. So that uh, the, oh, is this one complaining at me too? Oh, and required keyword. So that the box stack can uh, like place the boxes on top of each other and we don't have to care about that. So we'll see here. Uh, so that one is happy now. And that one will also move them uh, sidewards. So then can, we can remove the box from here. And we can override the the update method here too. All right, and we can say that we have a double here with the time since box and bucket zero, and then we'll have a double with uh, what is that called like uh, time between boxes there is a better word for that uh, maybe like box interval okay. and we can uh, say that we want the box to appear once every second and then we just add time since box then we add the dt to that one and once uh, time since box is larger than uh, the box interval, then we want to add one of these box stack things uh, like that. And we also want to set time since box to uh, zero. And then maybe maybe we want to make it a little bit add a little bit of speed to it. So let's add. Uh, I don't know, in speed. Or you, you can have something else controlling the speed too, but right now since we don't have that much time, we'll just do it like that. And you could you could like change these afterwards, etc. And this one is complaining because must call super. Uh, and it must call super because our otherwise our collision detection system won't run. So now let's see if we have some boxes coming in here. Oh, now I set the speed to 20 instead of adding 20. Okay, there's one box, two boxes. Okay, the boxes are moving faster than the ground. Uh, I'm not sure why that is. Let's just set this one to set it. And since we don't have time to investigate that bug now. They're still moving faster. Pretty curious. Let's see here. Uh, oh right, because we're still we're still updating the position in the box and in the box stack, so it will gain double the speed. So now if we run it, we should get some boxes here. And the boxes are disappearing for some right and they are of course disappearing because we're setting the position in both the box itself and in the box stack so let's show that oh here i see another error we have add rectangle component here instead of hitbox rectangle uh, or rectangle hitbox so a, a rectangle component is just something that shows as a rectangle and, uh, but we want the rectangle hitbox, of course, otherwise we won't be able to collide with it. Uh, we can remove the debug mode from there too. And let's see what else we have here. Let's try to run it. Okay. Okay, it's not falling very fast. Let's just speed up that and save it. Play. Okay, so here we can see all the box stacks coming and we can collide with it. So that is uh, 
pretty much all for this game and my time is uh, out so yeah you can uh, i will put the link to the source code and you can continue playing around with it or play around with your own game or whatever and uh, join our discord if you need any help or write on stack overflow or whatever and uh, yeah please uh, you can ask some questions now if you want to Okay, I think we lost our moderator for a moment. I will fill for, because yeah, we're running out of, out of time for our Q&A session. So let's have Lucas and Andre back with us uh, and start with our questions, right? Hello again. Hello. Okay, so the first question that I have here, there was a question for the demo that was why do you set ground and sky in the same priority or minus one why not minus 1.0 and one yeah right uh so uh, if you have the same priority of something then uh, they will appear in uh, the same order as they were added so if you know everything in beforehand which order they are then you can just add them in the correct order but now we knew that, okay, we just know that the sky and the ground has to be behind the player and the sky was added first and then the ground. So then they will automatically be ordered, but you could have anything on the priority. You could have a hundred, 200 and 300 on them, but as long as they are in the correct order. All right, we got our moderator back, I think. Hey, John. Okay, guys, uh, is block best state management library to use with Flame? Uh, most of the time you don't need a state, state management library to use in Flame because in Flame, everything is always updating anyways. But we have uh, something that we call a bridge package for block, which is called Flame, uh, Flame block, uh, if you're used to that uh, type of state management. But since it is updating all the time anyways, you can uh, you don't have to handle the state uh, in like a reactive way like you do in flutter you can just uh, uh, pass the data around that you want to update since the update method is already running 60 times per second um i see that there's also a related question from rafael which uh, he asks about the entity component system is that the architecture that flame uses it is not so we have uh, we we have built something of our own that is called fcs which is flame component system but we also have built uh, or are uh, a team member of uh, bluefire who's called uh, Joachim. he has uh, built something called oxygen which which is a separate ecs system and to the component system and you can use that one in flame if you want to but that one is much earlier stages than uh, than uh, FCS, but it is uh, still very usable. Cool. Sorry, John, for uh, jumping on your job to ask questions. But don't worry. <laughs> don't I, worry. The, the question okay. was basically about uh, state management, and I think this was a very interesting, uh, like it, side side thing to discuss. Yeah, it's okay. So don't worry. Um, another question is: Can we have OpenGL shaders on Flutter or HLSL? And how about three D graphics? So currently, uh, like since Flame is based up on Flutter and Flutter doesn't support 3D yet, we're kind of, uh, we have two things that they need to support a bit more for us to be able to handle 3D. And that is a uh, set buffer and uh, uh, shaders, like they say here. And shaders are supported to some sense now, or as some types of shaders, uh, but they're not supported on web. So on desktop and on, uh, on uh, like uh, Android and iOS, you can use some shaders, uh, and they are you compile into something called Spear V, I think, and it's uh, a quite like it's a, it's an old implementation of uh, of one of the shader uh, uh, standards. If you 
you want to check out more about shaders, there are some great articles on uh, on uh, Medium, which are written by Dev Owl and Wolf and Ryan. I can send some uh, links to them later. And you can check out the a project called Umbra, uh, which is uh, uh, statically typed shaders that is also written by Wolf and Ryan. Okay, next one. What are limitations on floor games? I guess I'll take that question too. <laughs> um, uh, right, so the limitations, like I uh, said earlier, like you can't have 3D basically. And uh, since uh, since we don't we don't do like any like pure C plus plus code or anything like that, uh, performance can be an issue if you have like really complex games. You can't do the same kind of uh, like memory technique hacks and stuff that they do in some games to make it more performant. Um, I would also add another thing to the list that are miss is, is kind of missing. So I was uh, trying to do the controller for my game. And another thing that is not necessarily missing, there are some libraries, but I'm not, I'm not so sure of how advanced they are, is for input systems. So if you go with something like Unity, like if you're really serious about your game, then that will have a, a ton more support because they, they take consoles super seriously. Um, I'm not even sure you can build Flutter for PlayStation, for example, stuff like that. So yeah, no, you can't. Yeah, yeah. but for for yeah for desktop support and uh, like a keyboard game, Flame should be and Flutter should be like a super good uh, fit. Yeah, and for uh, uh, if you want game pads on Windows, that is uh, possible to do today with the Win32 mm -hmm. library. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we have, we have thought about writing our own uh, uh, like library for just supporting controllers on all platforms, but it's a lot of native code to write, so we haven't really get to, gotten started with that yet. Yeah, and there, there is a library for Android and iOS. I haven't actually tried it, so mm. yeah, I get, I guess there is something to get you started. Yeah, the the Windows one I would trust is very well built since it's yeah. uh, built by Tim Sneath himself. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay, last question for a turn-based board game: Who you re recommend regular Florida or Flame? I'd say that it depends a bit on how your graphics would look, but uh, Flame will uh, surely help with a lot of uh, like. Uh, the things that you need for the game, but you could definitely build it in a regular Flutter too. Like uh, during the, um, what was it called? This uh, P Flutter puzzle hack, we saw like a lot of uh, great games that were built in pure Flutter. Um, yeah, maybe I would go a bit further with, uh, and be a bit more opinionated since th this person is asking for an opinion. I would build the menus and everything in Flutter and I would build the, build the game itself with uh, with Flame. Just because yeah. at a certain point, maybe you want to add some kind of particle system or stuff stuff like that. That's just going to be a lot more difficult with uh, vanilla Flutter. Indeed, and Flutter is so great at doing menus and stuff that, that like that's its real strength. So I agree with you there. OK, guys. This was the last question. So thank you so much for your participation. And we are going to have a, a break. So thank you, guys. I have to leave now. Super. Thanks a lot, John. It was Bye. great to be here. Thank you, everyone. It's nice to meet you, too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, everyone, and now we want to say a huge thank you once again to our sponsors, GuardSquare. And uh, if you're into mobile app development, and certainly you are since you're visiting this summit or you're just starting, uh, have you ever thought about this, uh, this idea? Is your mobile app really secure? Because new vulnerabilities, they pop up every day, and malicious actors look for easy targets on app marketplaces to exploit daily. This is their business. And securing your app valuable 
IP and data is critical. And Guardsquare security solution are built for developers and they protect your app at every stage in the development cycle. So you can start early and make sure your app is secure. And Guardsquare solutions are based on secure software development principles with ease of implementing and comprehensive polymorphic protection against threat actors at the very core of your application. The roots of this project is open source and their culture is to continuously collaborate on improving of the best practices which are used for this tool. Multiple layers of protection prevent reverse engineering and automatically detect tempering, making your app a difficult target for attackers. Learn more at guardsquare.com. Link is in the chat. Thank you for supporting us, Guardsquare. Have a great summit, everyone. Well, hello there. My name is Scott. You can probably hear me a little bit better now. Oh, boy, that looks funny. Let's try that. All right, a little bit of confusion about who was driving there for a moment, but that's all right. My name is Scott Stahl. I am with Flutter Community, and I am here to guide you through the summit for the next couple hours. So let's take a look here. I would tell you all about Guard Square, but that's already been done. We have Ryan Lloyd here, and he is going to talk about how to keep people from reverse engineering your apps. Now, native technology and built-in obfuscation, they do some, but the question is, is it enough? Okay, the typical process of reverse engineering a mobile app and how it affects you as a mobile developer is something everybody needs to know about, and that's what Ryan is here to talk about. So Ryan, why don't you uh, join us here? And great. How are Hi, you? I'm well. So without further ado, um, I think the best thing for me to do is just get out of your way. All right. I appreciate it. Okay. I'll see you in a little while. Thanks, Scott. Okay. Uh, Thanks, everyone. And first of all, welcome uh, to this talk. I'm super glad to be here to talk about the current state of reverse engineering with Flutter apps. Um, I'm making a few assumptions today about the audience here. Uh, I'm assuming most of the attendees for this talk are developers, uh, presumably building new apps written in Flutter, or maybe you're trying to sunset uh, some native written apps um, that are going to be replaced with, with new hybrid uh, apps that your, your, your organization are building. Um, when I talk to my customers who are all mobile engineering teams, we see a lot of interest in Flutter. Um, so about six months ago, we focused on releasing support in our mobile app security solutions for Flutter apps. Um, of course, the other assumption I'm making here is that you have some level of interest in security. Either you're on the good side, so you want to understand how people can attack your application uh, what the security risks are, or maybe you're on the wrong side and the track really, uh, the talk intrigued you and you're attending to learn some tips and tricks. So maybe you can earn uh, free coins or power-ups in the, the casual game you like to play. Um, well, the good news is this talks for developers, uh, developers on the, the good side. Uh, we want to talk about how you can protect your app, what some of the risks are. We won't go into as much technical depth to show you exactly how to reverse apps, um, so if you're looking for scripts to bypass in-app purchases or get unlimited coins, uh, you'll have to keep searching. Um, you may also be wondering how myself or, or GuardSquare generally knows about this topic. Um, and there's sort of two reasons why we have so much experience in this area. One is um, we have teams of engineers and, and security researchers that are 
building mechanisms to prevent reverse engineering and tampering in mobile apps. Um, so we have a large and, and growing team of researchers and engineers that are looking at all the different ways people reverse and tamper mobile uh, mobile applications, whether they're uh, you know native Android or iOS languages written in Java, Kotlin, Objective C, Swift, or, or native level code written in C, C++, maybe in the SDKs you use, or hybrid apps um, that you've written in in different hybrid frameworks like Flutter. So we're constantly looking at different attack vectors uh, and researching how people reverse engineer and tamper these technologies. Um, the second reason we have a lot of expertise in this area is because the way our tools work is we operate by post-processing the app you build. So a developer will build an app, pass it to our tools, and as part of that process, we will seamlessly inject various forms of security protections into the app uh, to protect it before re-signing it and before you release it. Uh, to the app store. Um, and as you can imagine, this process employs some of the same techniques of decompiling and disassembling applications to rebuild them with this added protection. So um, just by virtue of building our tools for mobile app uh, protection and mobile app security testing, we have to implement a lot of the uh, uh, technical gritty details of, of reverse engineering in automated ways. So that's why the topic is so interesting for us. Um, and I hope it's interesting for you. You know, there's a massive uh, security skills gap in the industry right now. Um, and so I hope this talk kind of inspires some of you to think about uh, as developers, how can we build the knowledge and skills to think about the security uh, of our application? So let's start by talking about, uh, you know, what is reverse engineering uh, and, and tampering uh, in applications? Um, we'll start by describing the, the process. So there's kind of two aspects to it that complement each other and, and work in combination to achieve a goal. Um, the first step, the actual reverse engineering, you know, the disassembly and decompiling is the process of analyzing a compiled mobile app. Usually it's pulled from the app store or, or off a device and you're analyzing it to be able to extract information uh, in source code form um, with the goal of really understanding and comprehending the code. We want to understand the logic of the application. Um, we may want to examine how security sensitive uh, aspects of the application work, um, crypto uh, logic, uh, secrets and API keys and things that may be embedded in the application, hopefully not, um, or just different endpoints that the app connects to, uh, to analyze them and figure out uh, where the communication flows, right? Um, and then we may also employ reverse engineering to hot, to find uh, hidden features uh, in applications, things that aren't maybe public knowledge yet um, and discover that, that new functionality. So the first step in reverse engineering is, is that disassembly, decompiling, sort of acquiring a lot of knowledge and information that can be used uh, for our, our purpose or our goal. Uh, the second aspect is maybe the more uh, active uh, aspect of reverse engineering, which is tampering with the application. So once you have a deep understanding of the application logic and its behavior and how it works, um, there's cases where you may want to tamper with it. Um, so you may connect a debugger uh, or run that app on a, a virtual machine emulator um, and use different toolkits uh, to connect to and debug that application while it's running. Um, almost like stepping through a code in, in your IDE. You want to kind of observe, um, set breakpoints and inter intercept different functionality of the application using hooking techniques to, to hook these functions and modify maybe the behavior of the app, either to inspect how it, how it works and behaves under different conditions dynamically while it's running. Um, so a good example would be if there's a communication with an API endpoint, you may want to hook that and see exactly uh, what's in memory at that point in time, um, uh, or to perhaps manipulate or change the communication that happens or the behavior that happens, maybe um, prevent it from communicating to that endpoint and proceeding to the next uh, part of the application. Um, so this is often used to figure out how to bypass certain aspects of an application. Maybe if there's simple protections that have been implemented, you can use this mechanism to, to bypass them. 
Uh, you may want to just dump the data uh, from the app at a certain point in time. Um, and then additionally, what you can do once you've tampered with an application is you may want to repackage and publish it somewhere uh, for other users to download. A few different scenarios for that is a lot with uh, mobile games, right? If you search uh, different web forums for mods or cheats for games, you'll see repackaged, republished versions uh, of, the, of those games that give you unlimited resources or the ability to see through walls and, uh, or auto aim uh, you know, if it's a shooter game, for example. So those are kind of the examples of, of why you might repackage uh, from a gaming standpoint, or maybe it's just to bypass ads or paid features uh, in, in a simple application. Uh, and you publish that modification out for other users to, to benefit from. So that's kind of the, the concept of what reverse engineering uh, is generally. Um, so what kind of apps are impacted by reverse engineering? You know, a lot of people think, well, you know, no one's really going to target my app. It's not that important. But the reality is any app that contains something of interest uh, is likely a target for reverse engineering. So what does what does something of interest mean? Well, it could be apps with sensitive data. So these are probably the most obvious examples that jump out uh, to folks. Thinking about financial applications, banking apps, um, uh, payment uh, services, applications, or SDKs. Um, sensitive data could also include healthcare uh, apps or medical apps. You know, you see a lot of um, telehealth uh, applications out there today. You see a lot of uh, companion medical devices, you know, physical connected medical devices that have mobile apps to, to gather and acquire data. Uh, those can be uh, targets. Um, uh, for attackers or security researchers that are looking to uh, deliver the next great keynote at Black Hat or, or one of those uh, security events. Um, other apps that are important are ones with monetization. So monetization uh, is, is you know, particularly a, a target for folks. Gaming, uh, as I mentioned, is a huge target. Um, it's probably the most uh, uh, volatile in terms of uh, reverse engineering. Uh, and it moves quickly. Um, but also those small sort of niche apps that, that rely on paid features or in-app purchases to pay for the maintenance of, uh, of these apps. Um, you know, those are targets for reverse engineering. People will publish modified versions just so they don't have to pay or to bypass um, the advertising that may exist uh, in your application. We also see cases where um, really high profile consumer technology apps um, can be a target. Um, so you think about cases where uh, a hobbyist just wants to tinker and change the way the app works, um, uh, you know, particularly in sort of the IoT use cases, maybe. That seems pretty innocuous and, and maybe not a huge concern. Um, but then there's tech journalists out there that want to leak the newest unannounced features uh, that might be coming that are um, built into your app ahead of time. Uh, hidden with feature flags. Those can be discovered um, through, through reverse engineering as well. Um, apps with reward programs or, or loyalty points, um, or, you know, you see, um, you know, during the pandemic, there was a lot of focus on food delivery services and different uh, apps like that that offer uh, rewards um, that you can uh, redeem uh, in the app. Being able to bypass and manipulate those to get free uh, goods, um, and publishing those uh, mods or, or hacks online uh, is a big uh, focus as well. And then lastly, you know, I would say any app with large numbers of users. Um, so what is, why is that important? Uh, because where there's users, there's, there's data, uh, there's email addresses, there's passwords, things that you want to acquire. Um, and as an app developer, if your app has large numbers of users, uh, there may be a brand uh, issue at stake there. Um, brand loyalty can be uh, a huge problem. You know, what you don't want is someone reverse engineering your app, creating a clone of it um, with maybe some added functionality or some small tweak or enhancement. Um, and then they package that on third-party app stores with malware and trick users into downloading this enhanced version uh, of your app. 
and that starts to erode trust and, and loyalty in your brand. Um, so preventing uh, app cloning and, and modification can be another um, challenge for organizations. So hopefully that gives you some, some color and some context on uh, some of the um, use cases uh, and how apps can be impacted by reverse engineering. So by this point, you're wondering, okay, so how does this apply to Flutter apps? Um, and I kind of use this analogy, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Great Western movie, but also uh, a good way to think about the current state of reverse engineering uh, with, with Flutter apps. So let's start, uh, let's start with the good, the good news for developers, that is. Um, you know, reverse engineering, it isn't easy. Um, generally speaking, you know, it's a, there's a small subset of individuals that maybe have the skills and the knowledge of the tools to be able to, to, to do reverse engineering. Uh, but it is a lot easier than it ever used to be. The tools are much more accessible and uh, you can find tutorials and instructions online that guide anyone with, you know, uh, reasonable coding knowledge to, to be able to um, digest and understand how an application works. But the, the good news with Flutter applications is that reverse engineering is a little bit harder. Um, the difficulty level, I'd say, is, is hard. Um, so that's, that's one part of the good news. Um, the other good news is that the number of apps written in Flutter is still relatively small. So for now, um, it's not the biggest and easiest target for fo folks to go after. Um, but of course, with conferences like this um, and with the way the market's developing, um, if everyone here is successful, that's going to change very quickly and the target uh, will, will change as well. So um, why is the, the reverse engineering of Flutter app uh, difficult? Um, well, even though reverse engineering generally is, is a little bit complex, there are often tools out there to help us um, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel and create our own you know, disassembler or decompiler each time we want to start reverse engineering. An application. So, for instance, a lot of the popular reverse engineering tools uh, that are out there, Ida Pro, Ghidra, Binary Ninja, etc., you know, they're able to parse the ELF or Macho or PE files to extract a lot of useful information, right? They'll gather and use the, the symbol table and perform automatic renaming of defined functions. They'll locate um, references, cross-references between string definitions and where they're used. Um, uh, they'll help identify function parameters. So for, you know, traditional languages like Java, Kotlin, uh, JavaScript apps, uh, et cetera, Swift, Objective-C even, there's some well-worn paths, right? Um, tools that have been built on the, the shoulders of giants, people that did the, the hard rock mining uh, for those languages and frameworks. Um, but when it comes to Flutter, these tools are, are limited um, in how they can be used for now. So, so why is reverse engineering Flutter hard? Well, part of it is, is the architecture of like the VM um, architecture. Um, and, and it's compounded by the fact that uh, the language is still young and, and it evolves quite a lot. So specifically um, the format of the, the Dart snapshot, right? Which contains all the compiled machine code and data for a Flutter application, it keeps changing. So even if you can find uh, some tools online, which they do exist, um, to parse a Flutter snapshot, uh, they tend to only work for older versions of Flutter. Um, so, uh, you know, new version of Flutter will drop, uh, the formats change and these tools break uh, and, and they can't uh, help you reverse engineer those applications anymore. Uh, that doesn't mean people aren't working on it and trying to create tools to automate this. Um, it just means there's a lot of maintenance work involved to keep these tools functional and, and up to date, which makes it a lot harder than, than some other applications and languages to, to reverse engineer. Um, another aspect is the the size of these Dart snapshots. They're quite big compared to traditional um, native libraries that are embedded in an Android app. Um, the main reason for this is that all the Dart frameworks are embedded into the Dart snapshot. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, 
uh, it's a bit like you were statically linking all the native libraries that you use. Um, so it could be okay to deal with these large binaries if we know where to start. Um, but unfortunately, since a lot of the classical reverse engineering tools don't have Dart snapshot parsing capabilities yet, um, uh, or signatures to identify those framework functions, you know, you can't easily find what code is the app specific code. Uh, and we couldn't end up wasting a lot of time reverse engineering Dart open source frameworks. Um, and that's maybe the important point here is, is reverse engineering takes time and people, people value their time. So uh, that's why, you know, we would consider the, the difficulty level to be, to be hard. Um, and it's a difficult area for someone to reverse engineer. So that's the good news. Um, the bad news is uh, the reverse engineering community inevitably always wins. Uh, they're persistent and, uh, you know, eventually the language, the framework uh, that we use becomes more stable. It changes less as more people adopt it. It can't uh, change so frequently. Um, and also as the number of apps in the app store uh, that are using Flutter increases, um, the target area becomes bigger and, and the focus on it increases. Um, and the thing about the reverse engineering community is that it really only takes uh, a small number of talented individuals to pave the way for the rest. Um, they'll build great scripts or automation tools um, and those early successes will then get built upon uh, by folks that are, that are following. It, it's interesting, it's, it's one of those things that it's, it's very much an individual sport in terms of doing uh, the reversing, but it's also a team sport at the same time. Um, like any good software development project, you build on the, the scaffolding that others have, have put in place. Um, and so the fact that the reverse engineering community always wins is, is especially true in the mobile industry. Um, and the reason for that is because the person doing reverse engineering has a natural advantage. Uh, the way mobile apps are deployed and sandboxed, um, they can be quite restrictive uh, compared to uh, other classical places where, where an application runs. So those applications don't have all the context and the visibility of what's going on on a phone or a device. Whereas the person doing reverse engineering has full control of the device. Um, they may be running it in a, a virtual machine, an emulator. They may have uh, jailbroken or rooted their device. So they can see a lot more than what your app can see, which means the app is, is at a bit of a disadvantage in, in that way. Um, uh, so yeah, that's, that's the biggest challenge in the, the mobile industry. So the other, uh, the bad news is that, um, there are some examples of the reverse engineering community establishing some of these wins. So, um, reflutter is a really good example of, of one of these successes. Um, in fact, instead of trying to, uh, reverse engineer, uh, these dark snapshots, like some of the other projects that I mentioned earlier, where there's a huge maintenance burden, uh, Reflutter takes a different approach to the problem. Um, rather than trying to parse the dark sna snapshot, it's modifying uh, the Flutter runtime library so that they can make the, the application information, dump it out at runtime while the, the VM is parsing the snapshot. So, um, you know, when you're trying to perform efficient reverse engineering, um, you've got to really avoid spending too much time on um, open source, well-documented frameworks. You really want to get to the, the important part of the application logic to understand um, how it works and, and what that application specific code is. So using something like Reflutter, um, it gives us uh, an advantage now to get a lot more context to work with. And that context is super important. And with a bit of scripting work, um, you can start to create reformatting scripts now for tools like Ida Pro um, that'll rename all the functions and, and easily identify uh, those using those tools. So, so now you start to get a lot more uh, understanding and ability to, to comprehend the application code and, and get to work on, on whatever it is your, your goal or incentive is uh, for reverse engineering. Um, and sort of the ugly aspect of this is 
just how confusing the market can be in terms of, well, how do we prevent uh, this reverse engineering from happening? Um, right. For, for developers, it's hard because, uh, you know, there's, there's ways and means to, um, to help protect your application. There's some tools that exist to help. Um, Flutter provides some built-in options uh, for obfuscation of Dart code. Um, and obfuscation is a good thing. I know it gets kind of a bad uh, rap in security communities, um, but it's a good thing as long as it's used in complement with other layers of uh, security and protection because obfuscation slows someone down and makes um, automating things quite difficult. Um, but of course, uh, an obfuscation strategy needs to be robust and have different layered approaches to it. Um, so defaulting to uh, leveraging the, the Flutter built-in option, you know, it's a good first step, but you do need to be knowledgeable and aware of some of the limitations and weaknesses there. Um, it's limited in what it applies to, right? It's only obfuscating certain um, as the commercial options that, that are available out there. And um, another thing to be aware of is that uh, obfuscation, you know, simplistic obfuscation can be combated with uh, binary diff tools. Um, so if you, this is particularly true if you've released uh, versions of your app without obfuscation. Um, so if a developer forgets to add that obfuscate flag um, and put something out in the, the app store that's unobfuscated, um, now you've got a baseline to compare against, uh, which can be a pretty significant advantage of, of um, trying to reverse an application. Um, but even if you haven't done that, um, because there's sort of the standard uh, flag available to all developers using Flutter, um, you know, a smart person is going to run that across a catalog and sample of apps and get a pretty good baseline of what that obfuscation looks like for common uh, patterns of library code um, and then know how to uh, omit those when looking at, at your application. So the, the really ugly aspect of reverse engineering um, and protecting your app is that the situation is constantly evolving. Uh, you know, working at Guard Square, it's it's interesting because uh, every week we're reviewing uh, information from our security research team on new attacks, new findings, new publications uh, that are out there. Um, so it's a fast-paced environment to to work in. So anything you learn uh, today or in in your research, uh, you need to treat that as a point in time understanding of. Uh, of the security landscape. Um, the, the real recommendation and best practice here would be to have, have yourself or someone in your team who becomes a security champion uh, for your app and your team. Someone who can really geek out and stay on top of the latest research in this area um, and to help incorporate uh, and recommend practices that are gonna protect your application. And maybe even do a little bit of uh, validation and and pen testing and, and assessments of your app before you release it to the app store to make sure that all the measures that you're taking, you know, you've set the right flags, uh, you've taken advantage of uh, the latest practices and tools. Um, uh, because the biggest mistake we often see is uh, even companies who have the right intentions and want to protect their app will still make small mistakes in, in configuring those, those protections and end up accidentally releasing unprotected apps. And once you do that, you kind of uh, undermine uh, the protection strategy that you that you have. So, based on on the current state of reverse engineering with Flutter, there's a few key pieces of advice there for developers. Um, and the first thing that I would I would stress that's most important is not to defer protecting your app. You know, it may seem like reversing Flutter apps is hard, and it is. It's it's not as pervasive and widespread as um, reversing Java or Kotlin apps on, on Android, for example, or, or Objective-C or Swift apps on iOS. Um, but it's not going to stay that way for very long. Um, and the more you release an unprotected version of your application, um, one that hasn't been considered from a security perspective, the more of a baseline you're establishing and providing people to work from in the future um, to compare to. Um, you know, the old saying in, in security is there's no MVP, no minimum viable product 
in security. Um, you really have to look at it uh, comprehensively. Um, so you also need to be realistic about the limitations of uh, the tools uh, and the features that you use. You know, really understand how they work. Uh, learn about the mindset of uh, an adversary. Uh, threat modeling is a great practice for, um, you know, thinking about how people are going to bypass uh, features um, and, and how they might attack your application. Um, and, and that usually requires someone in the team, uh, either within the team to have a security mindset or to enlist uh, someone in your organization who's responsible for and has experience in thinking about security. Um, and then lastly, you know, do your homework, uh, research what additional protection uh, is available, the supported technologies, um, look for depth of features and tools, uh, ones that have a philosophy and, and approach that is grounded in, in key security principles. Be a little bit wary of tools that claim to be a quick solution that you can just turn a switch and you get one click protection of your app. Um, the security world is rarely that, uh, that simple. Um, but lastly, the, the, the good news is you don't have to be a fortress um, when you think about protecting your application. This isn't about um, uh, building a, a, the, the most comprehensive defensive strategy for your app. It's just about making it cumbersome and difficult and making it so that your app isn't an easy target to automation and the scripted approaches that make reverse engineering so easy. So I hope that information and insight is a little bit helpful as you think about developing your Flutter applications um, and thinking about how uh, they may be impacted from a security standpoint. Um, there are some resources where you can learn more. Uh, there's a great article uh, by Andre Lipke, uh, two-part series on reverse engineering Flutter apps that does get into a lot of the, the technical details of things like we've discussed today. Um, there's some GitHub repos out there that show some of these snapshot parsers, Darter and Doldrums. Um, if you click on those GitHub repos, you'll see the warnings about uh, the versions they support and the maintainability challenges of them. Um, and Reflutter, the other one I mentioned uh, that has a bit more of a sustainable approach to this. Uh, you can learn more on their GitHub repo as well. And then stay tuned uh, from GuardSquare. Uh, we've got some upcoming blog posts from our security researchers where we're gonna do a multi-part uh, blog post and a deep dive sort of technical workshop and content with some sample scripts uh, that'll really explore this topic further and, and cement some of these concepts for you. So I will uh, stop there. I think I've, I've used up most of the time for the presentation and um, yeah, look forward to some, some follow-up discussion here. Hey, really, really appreciate everything there. Let's see, questions. Do we have questions? Come on, folks. I am not seeing, oh, where is the link to the GitHub repo? Kevin would like uh, to know. Great question. Let me uh, drop that in the chat here for everyone. I'll just stop sharing my screen here and grab those links. Uh, first link I'll drop into the chat is to uh, the article that I mentioned. Uh, let's see here. I'm not quite sure how to add to the uh, the comments or the chat. Uh, let's see here. Pri private chat, but not the. Uh... There we go. Yeah, it does. It tends to block links. So for everyone who's been trying to be helpful and share links, doesn't always work so well when you're in a YouTube live stream. There. There we go. Can you get source code by just having the APK or the app bundle? Uh, yes. So great question. Um, that's typically how these reverse engineering uh, projects work. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll grab the APK from uh, the Play Store or 
any number of downloader sites uh, or just by extracting it from their, their device or phone and then use uh, a variety of tools to um, decompile and disassemble that, uh, that APK. Um, so yeah, th usually the starting point for reverse engineering is the binary uh, artifact or the packaged artifact rather than uh, the source code itself. All right. Um, a question, where can I drop my questions from? Well, I'm assuming that means you should put your questions here in the chat. But um, if that is everything, we still have a few more minutes. Let's, that's rather interesting. Every time my bar comes up, my camera blanks. If you have an app already on the app stores, is it too late to obfuscate it? Yeah, it's a good good question. Um, it, it depends on what you're trying to protect it against uh, with obfuscation. Uh, if your goal is to uh, hide certain features, um, maybe that you haven't released or announced yet, uh, that are in your application, yes, it's probably too late um, uh, in that people can obtain the older version uh, of that app and examine it. And if they're persistent and uh, you're a high profile target, they probably will. You can assume that they will look at older versions as well. Um, that said, if your main concern is tampering and, and, and whatnot, um, it isn't necessarily too late because um, you may need to implement a more robust obfuscation strategy because um, uh, a simple obfuscation will probably be easy to baseline and compare against using differencing tools. Um, but a more robust uh, obfuscation strategy that's got multiple layers to it can, can be super helpful. Um, and you can also start to do things like force uh, upgrades of your app and uh, remove older versions so that you can um, uh, limit kind of the exposure to those older versions. So it, it depends a little bit on your threat model. Okay. Let's see here. We have a few more. Um, as a beginner, where do you start implementing even basic security? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I'd say there's, there's two um activities that you can undertake as a beginner um, the first is to open a dialogue with people in your organization around what the security risks and threats are for your application um, there's a there's a formal and structured way to do that it's called threat modeling but even just having informal conversations with people can be quite uh, enlightening and insightful um, that's one aspect the second place i would start as a as a beginner is leveraging some automated tools to do security analysis of your app. Um, there's free services and tools you can use uh, online to, uh, to run a security assessment of your app. Um, GuardSquare makes one of them, it's called AppSweep. Um, uh, and using uh, standards and frameworks like the OWASP mobile security testing guide, um, it can walk you through some basic security tests that help you understand some of the, the vulnerabilities and concerns you might have. In your application there's an interesting question in chat uh is there any kind of linter that guides you through the best practices of securing an app um i'm not aware aware of um a specific linter tool um optimized for for a flutter app and security use cases but i would say a linter tool um as a general rule is a good found, fundamental tool to have in place to um, catch a lot of common coding uh, mistakes that can lead to security vulnerabilities. So it's a good baseline practice as well, and it, it will probably prevent certain types of security issues showing up in the automated testing, uh, security testing that you do. All righty. We got about time for one more real quick. Does Flutter obfuscation increase the APK size? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, the logical answer is yes. Uh, any obfuscation uh, and application protection that you implement for any application is going to have some impacts on uh, the app size, the build time, uh, various things like that. So there's always a trade-off uh, in security. It's kind of like two-factor authentication. You always make compromises in implementing certain security practices. Um, so you've got to make some decisions on, on what your tolerance is and app size uh, 
and, and where the impacts are. Um, you know, the right tool for mobile app protection is going to give you fine gain, fine grained controls to be able to set those boundaries and 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 also hopefully implement other optimization and shrinking techniques that uh, can balance out some of those increases in app size. All righty, good deal. Well, really appreciate you being here, Ryan. And yeah, thanks uh, so much. Thank you very much. There are still a few questions left. Uh, you might want to take a look at them on Twitter or something. Um, whether or not GuardSpace has cybersecurity courses, what is the downside of the current obfuscate flag, um, and are, if your products are supported by pipelines like CodeMagic. So okay. those are all great, great. questions. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time, but take a look uh, at their Twitter, and I'm sure Ryan will make sure you get your answers there. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Ryan. All righty. Coming up, we have a gentleman whose name I will not even try to pronounce. We will just call him Mr. Kozlowskis. And he is coming on to talk about observation-based product development using Flutter. Now, everybody knows that Flutter makes performant portable apps. Okay, but usually we don't just want to create an app. We want to build the whole product. We want to create the user experience and something that they're going to use every single day that's going to make their life easier. So it's crucial to keep your fingers on the pulse of users' behavior and understand their needs. And making observation-based decisions about this will help you improve your products. Now, he's going to talk about some real-world tips and tricks that they've used developing products with Flutter. And welcome, sir. Hi, Scott. How are you? Doing well, doing well. And I'm just, I'm curious, I didn't want to mess it up, but how do you pronounce your first name? It's Meingerdes. Okay. Actually, I, I, I received the same question from your colleague uh, during the Flutter Festival London, and you could expect what, what was that colleague, right? Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so I, I know some people who should never try to pronounce your name. Trust me. I, I will believe in you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I am going to get out of your way. Here are your slides, and I will see you in a little while. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, hello, everyone. And as Scott mentioned, observation-based product development using Flutter. Let's go. So, first of all, you know, uh, today I'll cover the basic idea behind the app observation and, uh, you know, what are the parts of app observation. And later we'll check, uh, actually, uh, I prepared two case studies where we used some techniques from the app ob observation and how we apply them uh, while building the uh, real Flutter apps. So, uh, shortly about me, uh, I'm Eingerdas, I am a software engineer from Lithuania. Currently, I am a mobile tech lead at Below, where, you know, using Flutter is my day-to-day -day business. Uh, I'm also a Google developer expert for Flutter and Dart Technologies, organizer at Flutter Lithuania. And, and yeah, shout out to Flutter Dartis. So we are a group of uh, Flutter-minded people, I would say, who are organizing Twitter spaces. You can call it if you want to, a podcast. And we review the Flutter news. And, and yeah, we are just an active uh, group of people on Twitter. Uh, so... Moving to the to the main topic, app observation. So, what what is this thing all about? So, uh, to begin with, uh, I believe that, uh, and specifically to me, app observation consists of three parts, uh, of three quite separate parts, I would say. So, first of all, it's an app performance, or uh, you could call it an app monitoring. You know how the app is performing from the technical point of view. Then we have product performance, which is basically uh, covered by analytics, uh, all kinds of analytics, but uh, differently from the app performance, product performance, you know, measures how the app is performing as a business, as a product. So how basically, you know, whether it's used by the users or not and, and, and how it's performing in general. And lastly, uh, it's UX or user experience. And basically that's the feedback that we see from the clients, from the users, how they enjoy using the app, how they enjoy using the product and, and you know, how it performs from, from their point of view. And you may ask, you know, uh, 
why we need to introduce the app observation, why we need to even think about that is basically app observation helps you to learn from your mistakes as soon as possible. So meaning if you implement some, uh, some, some guidelines, if you implement some fundamental uh, parts of the app observation in your app early on, you could notice you know, whether your app is performing as a product, whether your app is performing as a Flutter app, you know, and, and yeah, and, and how people feel about your product. So uh, to divide those three uh, fundamental parts even, even further, so uh, I just separated it this way that app behavior basically consists of logging, consists of crash and error reports, which is basically the same as crash lytics and, and performance metrics. The user feedback part uh, consists of internal and external feedback. So internal feedback is basically the feedback you receive from inside your team, uh, from other fellow developers who are working on the same code base. And external is, yeah, it, it's basically the feedback from your user base, from your clients, and, and from, the, from those who are using the app outside of your company. And product metrics is basically you know, the analytics part. So I divided the, that into two parts. So one of those is app metrics. So this is basically publicly accessible uh, app uh, uh, app metrics of your product. So, you know, download counts, ratings, reviews, and so on. And then we have analytics, which is basically the internal uh, part of, of analytics. So basically the data that you analyze and, and later on, based on that, you make some uh, data-driven decisions. So jumping to the first section uh, or the first segment of, uh, uh, of app observation is the app behavior monitoring. And I want to introduce some, some numbers. So 42% uh, of one-star reviews on Google Play mentions bugs. And also 84% of users abandon an application after seeing two crashes. So these are the numbers provided by the bug snack, which is an error monitoring and app stability management tool. And they provided those numbers in their surveys and in their uh, reports. Uh, but basically, the main idea is that the technical performance of your app is really crucial. It's really important because uh, if your app is not performing, you know, from technological point of view, maybe your app is slow, your app is crashing, you, your app has a lot of bugs. Uh, it means that, you know, eventually the user base uh, will collapse, I would say, or at least less users will use your app. And since you are building apps, not for yourself, but, you know, to, 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 uh, for, for someone to, to make their life easier, it's, it's, it's not a good metric to follow. So basically the main point is, you know, to reduce those numbers uh, as, as much as possible. Uh, so talking about logging, I strongly believe that all logging, all logs matter, uh, meaning that if you are uh, developing uh, locally, uh, you know, you're checking the console logs. If you are, if you are, if your app is now published and it's public, then you are checking remote logs. Uh, logs about your own code, logs, logs about the framework, about Flutter logs, maybe logs about your uh, use dependencies of your app. All logs matter. You, uh, you should probably should collect as much uh, logs as possible because eventually they will really help to improve your app if something wrong happens. And you may ask, you know, how much should I log? <laughs> Pretty much I already answered that. Basically, as much as you can pay for. Uh, if if you are you know if you are not limited by any any restrictions on, on the payment, just log everything out of the box. And later on, you know you'll shift your focus. You'll start noticing logging patterns. You'll start noticing that some logs are covering each other, overlapping, and so on. So then you could you know reduce the noise and and only leave uh, the most important logs to you. So so yeah. So that's uh, that that that's how logging works. And also. Uh, have in mind that logging is only a prerequisite for app monitoring. Logs is basically just uh, your app entries or, you, you know, uh, just some kind of entities of coming from outside your app. But these are just, you know, uh, a strings, a uh, just a simple pieces of, of lines in a text file. So to make, uh, to make, to get um, the most out of those, you need to analyze them. You need to the uh, recognize patterns you need you need to see what's what's happening good or bad in your app and then use those logs for your own needs uh, so yeah so that's about logging and also i can provide how we handle logging in in our apps so, so basically i really li like this idea of creating an abstract logger which basically covers you now three main methods to to uh, to log uh, which is uh, debug uh, war warning and error so 
you know it locks different uh, levels of, of locks and then uh, uh, i prefer creating basically a static lock class uh, you know a class with static methods so you could basically call these locks without any dependency injection just simply calling static methods on this class which basically calls the corresponding methods on the abstract logger and and yeah and uh, and what else i like to do about logging is basically using the composite design pattern uh, and create basically a, a, a logger of multiple logs. So basically a multi-logger, you know, it's, uh, you can pass a list of logs and once you, once you need to lock something remotely or, or locally, you just pass a log and this multi-log takes care of uh, iterating all, uh, through the, all the loggers registered in the class. And basically all of these loggers take care of, of this specific entry. And what's the benefit of that is that you can really, uh, create a versatile version of your, of your logger. So basically, if you are uh, developing uh, locally, you could enable console logger. If you have some kind of third-party integrations like Datadog, uh, you can you know, enable that integration and, and send logs to the Datadog servers. If you, for some reason, maybe it's needed, you want a file logger, you can enable it, or basically you need to add any other logger you want, just inject that, uh, register it, and it will take care of your logs. And, and yeah, and that's the log examples visible there. So basically, you know, just a viewer of the logs. And actually, uh, sp this specific example uh, comes from the data log. So each log has a lot of metadata around it. So you could check uh, in Flutter case, you know, you could check what was the app version, what was the device model, device type that logged this. And other context, uh, context information, for instance, you could add uh, extra data, for instance, user email or user ID. So you could basically check if something wrong, wrong happens for a specific user based on this ID, this email, you can see all the logs that came from, from, from the device of this user. And then you could basically backtrace your, the problem that occurs in the logs. Uh, so yeah, so that's it about logging. Uh, now we can move to the crash and error reports, AKA Crashlytics. And the first things about uh, the first thing about Crashlytics to, to have in mind is that apps is basically distributed system. So if something wrong happens in your app, it you cannot really blame that it it works on my machine because it definitely does not work on on some kind of machine, you know, on some kind of remote machine. So the main goal is that if something wrong happens on that remote machine on that app. Uh, you need to take care that you have all the needed information to check what wrong happened and of course later on fix that you know so for for this problem not to be uh, so for this problem won't occur on other devices as well and yeah and i consider crashlytics just logs with benefits because crashlytics is basically just logs but a little bit extended version of that uh, because Crashlytics is basically a log entry, but it provides more information and more metadata. And it also connects the analytics uh, to your log. So meaning it can group your uh, related logs. You could, it could, uh, you know, monitor what, uh, what new uh, error occurred in your app and you could later prioritize it to fix that or, you know, or just uh, analyze what kind of errors happening in your app, whether these errors happen because of your, uh, because of the problems in your code base or in some kind of internal tooling or, or, and whatnot. So basically, yeah, Crashlytics is logs, but with uh, some extra benefits uh, coming with that. And for instance, if you are using, uh, by the way, getting back, you know, there are uh, the, the most popular technologies to, for the crash analytics is basically Datadoc, Sentry, and also uh, I hope you watch the Google I.O. Uh, event and, and uh, Firebase crash analytics is also is working really great with, with Flutter and it's already enabled. And by the way, I think it's free. So why, why not, right? Why not enable that on your app? Uh, in our case, uh, we use Datadoc since we use that for logging, we use that for Crashlytics, and we use that for, for other places. We use that for, for our backend services, so it makes sense to use the same service uh, for, for, for this. And for Datadoc to ena enable Crashlytics, our crash reports is really simple. So basically, on the uh, Flutter error, on error callback, uh, basically all of the errors that are caught in the Flutter uh, scope, these are using this handler. So we just register Datadog, uh, Datadog handler for those errors. 
and also for other errors that happens maybe under the hood, maybe it happens internal dependencies, maybe platform level. So we, uh, we run our code in a, in, in a zone and then we can also, if something wrong happens, we can catch this error and send it to Datadoc. So that's basically the tracking of our, of our crash. And as I mentioned, with the crashes, we have a little bit more information. So first of all, at the top left, you can notice that we have uh, the total amount of errors uh, of the same error that happened during the speci specified amount of time. So basically, you can track you know, what errors are relevant, so what kind of errors occurred as a new errors, and, and so on. Also, uh, the, the crucial part of this is that you have the full stack trace of your codes, you know, in which code line something wrong had happened. And also, you could notice that at the bottom, we, uh, when using Datadog, uh, so uh, we even have a timeline. So basically, we can even check the whole session of a an user and how the user gets to this specific error. So later on, when we want to reproduce the issue, we can basically replay the session and, and see how, those, uh, how this error did occur. And yeah, so that's about the crash lytics. And lastly, uh, performance metrics. So basically, that's uh, you know that's that's a part of UX monitoring because app performance. I think, and and I consider this as a part of user experience. You know, whether you have frozen frames, whether something uh, uh, slow is happening in your app, maybe slow load times, maybe your app loads uh, load times are also slow. So you know, so that's a part of UX monitoring. So that's also very important because that's kind of user focusing and user facing. Um, and uh, you know, to, to see the tendencies or, or so something wrong is happening. Uh, for that, you could application performance mod monitoring or APM could be used, and it means basically end-to-end -end application performance monitoring. So uh, you could uh, check like. Uh, something like request latencies, like uh, identifying degrading requests, uh, identifying slow requests. Also, there's a, a very useful tool as a distributed tracing. So you could basically check the, a specific request and all of this lifecycle of this request. So all of the backend services that, that you know, were propagated uh, by, by this request, you could investigate that. And I will have a, a photo of that. Uh, what does that mean? So I'll show it a little bit later. And also have in mind that uh, at the moment, at least, uh, this uh, this uh, application uh, performance monitoring is not 100% reliable. At least I notice that uh, sometimes there are hiccups. Sometimes, for some reason, I see that the uh, application launch time took five days. Let's say, which is maybe maybe that's true. I don't know. Maybe that, that's a terrible app. But I hope that's some kind of hip, hiccup that happens. Uh, you know, in the in the tracing mechanism. So just have in mind that it's not. You know, 100% reliable, but to notice patterns, it's 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 a great tool to have, and how it could be implemented by using again that Datadog because we are using that. So uh, basically, we just init initialize the Datadog tracing. You know, when creating the data Datadog client, we initiate tracing as well. Then when we instead of creating uh, the default HTTP client, we create that Datadoc tracing HTTP client. So it basically under the hood creates the same Dart HTTP client, but also adds some some headers uh, to your request automatically. You know, it it tracks your your request. It, it sends some info, some more information to the Datadoc server. So that's really helpful for those uh, Datadoc tracing. And also maybe not really related to tracing, but also something that Datadoc offers out of the box. So you could add. Uh, route observer uh, to your app, or if that's Datadog observer. So basically, when you want to reproduce those sessions, when you need to uh, to notice whether the error that happened in a specific view or not, uh, then this observer sends the additional information that could be visible in the dashboards. And this is the flame chart I wanted to show you when talking about the distributed tracing. So basically, this flame chart shows the whole lifecycle of your request. And you could see that the request started at the top, you know, from the Dart HTTPs, where, where we sent the request from our app. And it basically propagated through the, those green services, which is, which is basically our backend that we use. And also, you could see... Uh, a lot of smaller parts distributed around there. So those are, you know, SQL uh, queries. Those are uh, other microservices that are called from in from the inside. These are maybe you are using some kind of caching. So you could also notice if your request hit the cache or not. So this is really useful when you want to debug the lifecycle of this and, and so on. So, so yeah. So this is really uh, really recommended tool to have in your in your ecosystem of your app. So 
just wanted to show you that that's an available option and just have this in mind. Uh, moving to the to the next part of, of uh, app observation, which is user user feedback, and I want to start that from the quote by Bill Gates, which uh, basically uh, who uh, mentioned that your most unhappy customers are your greatest source of, of learning, and and yeah, feedback is all about you know, of course it's satisfying when some when someone says something nice about your app about your product, but the main goal of the feedback is to receive some negative feedback so you could improve the product and you can you could improve in general. So I think that's that's the main goal of of collecting feedback and improving uh, and you know iterating on that. So about the feedback, uh, the first thing uh, you should uh, you should request those feedback from yourself and from your internal team. Uh, even though uh, not all of us are unicorn developers, you know, developers who are uh, aware of the programming are also really aware of what's happening in the UI and UX world, and they, they can take care of that by themselves. But once you get requirements, once you get the designs, always question those, you know, if something is not really clear to you, most probably that won't be clear to, to the end users as well. So. If, if there's something wrong, if you notice uh, some wrong patterns, do not hesitate to ask your team for the feedback. Do not hesitate to ask uh, you know, um, other internal parties because that's the initial uh, step where you, can, uh, where you could ask this feedback from. Um, also, when you want to uh, ask about feedback of your product, try to avoid direct questions, uh, but ask for stories. So basically, uh, instead of asking directly, would you like if I would introduce this feature to the app? Most probably, you know, the users would say, yes, do it. And we would use that. But the thing is that not always user knows uh, what they want, you know, from this product. So ask for the stories, you know, ask how was the last time, you know, how was the last time you used the app and did that? And they will tell you the story. They will tell you the steps, how they approach the same thing. And then, out of that, you'll realize that maybe the user is not using the product as you expected, and that could be really valuable for feedback on improving the user experience or improving your product in general. And also, one of the main goals of this is to automate the feedback loop. So basically, how uh, what uh, what I have in mind about this is that for the internal feedback, let's say you are using some software for communication like Slack. So if you want to receive the feedback from your internal team, uh, maybe you, 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 not maybe, but you, sh you should definitely use some uh, some extensions, some automated bots, you know, to collect that feedback so they can fill in the forms, and maybe this uh, this data could end up at the, at your product management system re registered as a bug, as a as an improvement, and so on. Also, if you are talking about external uh, external parties, so. Basically, just provide you know uh, maybe an open calendar where users could uh, register to the interviews. Maybe they want to give feedback about your product. Uh, always be very open about that. Be open-minded and and yeah. And once this you get into this feedback loop, it will get it will get better. You'll get more feedback. You'll and you'll have more information you know to iterate on. And also, do not hesitate to test in production. And even though I do not see the audience, I can, I can, I can, I can hear your eyebrows, you know, raising at this point. And what, what are you talking about? Testing in production. But basically, I wanted to say that sometimes you do not know how your app will be used by the real, uh, real customers, real users. So maybe you know, use tools like Firebase app distribution and. Uh, you know, uh, start with beta testing, especially if you are launching launching a new product. Start with beta testing, see how the uh, how the users interact with our app, and later on do the improvements. So yeah, a lot of different things that uh, you know could be elaborated about the feedback. Uh, and one way of how you could at least uh, start getting feedback from your app. For, so for instance, this implementation example is coming from the intercom service. So basically from your app, you could initiate uh, your intercom uh, service. So if you create a survey uh, in this platform, you could ba basically open it in your app and it, it just basically works you by using this code that is visible here on the screen. As you could see the implementation and th the trigger is really simple. And, and yeah, and that's basically a very easy way to collect the feedback about your product, maybe asking some open-ended questions if needed, getting feedback about the, your app in general, getting feedback about the specific feature you just implemented and introduced in your app, 
feel free to use the tools available and, and make your life easier. And lastly, uh, product metrics and you know the last part of this app observation. So again, I want to start with a quote for, for, from the co-founder of Stack Overflow, Jeff Atwood. And he mentioned that we have to stop optimizing for programmers and start optimizing for users. And basically, I already mentioned this, you know, uh, Flutter, React Native, Xamarin, you name it. Those are just the tools, but eventually you are building products that 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 goes to the to the to the end users and they will use their product. So basically, it for some users, most probably your really high-end, you know, implementation details does not really matter as long as your app is not performing. So Basically, you need to focus on the end goal. Basically, uh, you should focus on improving the, those products and make your make the life easier of, of the end users. And you know, uh, thinking about this, how this could be measured, how we could get data about that. Uh, some of the data uh, comes out of the box, pretty much. So, for instance, if you're publishing your app using Google Play Store or, or Apple App Store, uh, those stores already have some metrics, some analytics like download counts, like crashes in your apps, maybe some uh, ratings, reviews, and any other uh, extra extra info. So this is available to you. Use it. Uh, analyze the, the 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 tendencies of your app, and and you know, uh, and see how it goes. Um, however, uh, when you want to move a little bit further and you want to improve your app. Uh, then it's time for AESO, which stands for App Store Optimization. And for this, uh, I would recommend using some external tools. Some of those are free, some of those are not. So, so one of those free tools are App Follow. App Figures, I guess, I guess it's uh, behind uh, some kind of payment. But for instance, App Follow is a good starter tool, you know, to analyze uh, your uh, your app a little bit broader, like not only check the download counts, but also check uh, uh, how your app is performing in the App Store, what's the positions in each category, uh, what keywords work, uh, what keywords do not work, and so on. So that's a good start. And if you want to push those numbers up, you need to uh, use those tools. And also, uh, what I really wanted to mention, uh, get, the mouse, get the most out of your, your app ratings and reviews. So basically, uh, the thing is that those app ratings and reviews are publicly visible to all the users who are who are potentially uh, will download your app, right? So if you get even get a negative rating, be active, respond to those reviews, re uh, respond to those ratings. You say uh, say that you know uh, maybe even leave some uh, contact information that these users could contact you, and maybe that's again another source of feedback. But also that will uh, provide some. Uh, some confidence and it provides some publicity to, to all the users that you know that you are active you really want to improve your product and you are really open-minded about your product so yeah get the mouse to, out of that uh, be public uh, be open and and that will eventually help uh, help uh, you and your product and this is an example from the app follow of how the keywords you know work so basically you can track several keywords and you could see the how they are performing and later on, once you notice that some keywords are working better than the others, you could use those keywords while adjusting the title of your app, the description of your app. And you know those keywords will basically make your app more visible. Eventually, you'll get uh, more users of your app. And after that, you know, just profit. Um, and lastly, uh, product metrics. Uh, the, the last part of product metrics is analytics, which is you know kind of obvious. It's that internal metrics of your uh, product performance. So for that, uh, analytics is yeah is there for you to make better decisions. So you are no longer uh, your app. You know your decisions is no longer based on your opinions, but on the real data what you see in your app. So analytics uh, and analysis tools really help you with that. Also, I already talked about it, outcomes over output. So basically, uh, end users uh, care more about the outcome, how this app uh, help uh, them, how this feature help them, and not about what specifically you have coded in your app. So yeah, prefer outcomes over output. And also avoid analysis paralysis. This is a thing when uh, once you have a lot of different kind of data and then you get into the position, oh, if, if we want to implement something, we need to check the data first. Uh, 
yeah, that, that's a good thing to have, especially if you have the data available over there. But also do not get paralyzed by that. If you have a really strong gut feeling that something will improve your apps, something will improve your product, feel free, implement that and see how it goes later on. And then, of course, measure it and analyze that. And in, in our apps, how we how we implement analytics, it's, it's really similar how we implement logging. Again, uh, the abstract uh, analytics event handler. And then we have the analytics class that basically has uh, several of those handlers. So in our case, we are using Facebook, Mixpanel, or Intercom. And, and yeah, once you... Uh, publish an analytics event, it will be published to all of these, uh, these integrations. And for instance, we have a, a huge class of all the analytics events we, we have in our app. Uh, so in this case, we have a freeze class with a lot of uh, factory constructors. And later on, if you want to you know, track something specific, in this case, we want to track if uh, you know the user registration event, we just basically uh, all the analytics, all, all the event handlers that need to take care of those events, they just basically implement their handler and send the corresponding events to those integrations. And, and yeah, and this is an example how the analytics are used. So for instance, here you could see the uh, sign up method. There well, we finish sign up. And then also uh, after that, we instantly log the event that the user has signed up. And then we can you know, inspect this a little bit further. And once you have all of those data and using some kind of tools like Mixpanel, feel free uh, to create some fancy dashboards, some colorful ones, you, like put the funnels, like how, how your app is performing, put all the analytics and statistics you have, like what's the referral source of your app, wh how, how did user uh, hear about your product and so on. Since you have the data, you know, you need to make it usable for you. And at a quick glance, by creating those dashboards, you could see the tendencies, you could see whether the performance or then or, or how your app is, is behaving in public. And now uh, I think I'll spend about five uh, or so minutes uh, talking about the case studies or real world examples, how we used uh, those approaches uh, and we improved our app. And throughout this presentation, I, I used we and our app. So I was talking about Billow. This is the company I'm working in and all of these, uh, or at least most of these uh, uh, tools that, 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 that were described this in the presentation we are using uh, for our app. So Billow is, uh, shortly is a market list for e-commerce videos. So on one place we have brands who want uh, uh, who order videos for their products. So that's you know maybe they want to promote their product, maybe they want to uh, record the video of, of the product unboxing, how to videos and so on. And on the other part there's a creators, basically creators, influencers who who uses our Billow app implemented in Flutter and they register to the app. They check all of those offers registered by the brands. They apply to those offers, record the video, upload it, and then earn money you know, by doing that. And the first case study I want to uh, talk about is unsuccessful experiment. So uh, in product development, experiment is basically validating a, a hypothesis about your idea. And yeah, I'll just give you a quick example of what we thought and what was the result of that. So since below, you know, we, we consider ourselves as a video company because we uh, brands are ordering videos and creators are providing videos to them. So an obvious step for us, it seems that it, it would be nice to have, you know, in-app video up, upload, in-app video recording, in-app video editing, because users could download our app and then go through this workflow by using only a single app. So that's really convenient. That, that would be really helpful. Uh, we discussed this inside the team. Uh, all of the team jumped into the hype train. We are really excited for this, but then we start realizing, is this really the, uh, the feature or the thing that our users need at the current state of, of, of our app? And then we realized that we can make a short experiment. So basically in our app, we have uh, upload video pitch functionality, which is basically uh, a creator video CV. You know, uh, that's me, I am creator, I can create a video for you. So that's my video CV. And this simple feature has upload video functionality. And for this video upload, we are using image picker uh, package uh, by the Flutter dev, which is really useful you now to upload the video. But also I double check that it's possible to use this package, not only to select the video from your gallery, but also record your video in app. So basically by using this, we could experiment whether uh, users would use the in app recording functionality. And you can see on the right, basically when you uh, press the upload button, you could select whether you want to upload the video from the library or you want to record using the camera. 
So yeah, so we shipped the feature. I think it took like several hours to implement it. Really quick experiment. Uh, yeah, after the, all the app review process, the, um, the feature is out there. Uh, this is the implementation code. So basically, you know, the upload uh, method uh, checks what's the video pitch upload source, whether that's camera, record the video. If that's gallery, you know, uh, up, uh, pick the video from your gallery. And then we send the analytics event, which is very important part for this experiment, you know, because we want to investigate what people are actually using to upload their videos to the app. So we send an event with this specific, uh, with this specific uh, source of, of, of their video. And you could see the source is either camera or gallery. And then after 30 days, we see the, uh, the results of this experiment. Of course, I, I picked the 30 days, but but basically the tendencies were visible after a week or so. And we noticed that only 6.46% uh, of users are using the, uh, the camera feature, meaning only 6% uh, users are using the in-app recording feature. And that was an indication for us that maybe in-app video editing or, or at least recording from this experiment is not something that we should implement at the current state of our app. So. The main takeaways from this is that, of course, think big, think about big, big features, but start small, you know, experiment and move fast. So basically create a, a really minimal viable product or minimal viable feature, uh, verify that. And if, if that, you know, if that's confirmed, then move on. Also have in mind that failed experiment does not mean a failure, even though our experiment kind of failed because we, we didn't confirm that our users need this feature, but, that's, that's definitely not a failure because we saved a ton of probably a ton of development time, and we do not didn't need to implement the whole in-app recording workflow for for our users because of that. And also take the results with a grain of salt. If this experiment showed that uh, maybe users do not really use this feature, it doesn't mean that it will happen for all of the use cases. It doesn't matter matter if people didn't use the in in-app recording that they won't be using in-app editing, and and yeah, so take it with a grain of salt and always iterate over your experiments. Maybe, uh, yeah, make this experiment one more time to verify it and, and move on. And the last case study, a uh, really quick one I want to introduce is, is Know Your Product. So that's basically a case study about how your gut feeling sometimes is even more important than the analytics. So basically, uh, by looking at our app, we noticed that our app is not really performing based on the app ratings. You know, we have under the three star rating in the app store, we, we receive a very, not a very huge amount of app reviews and app ratings. And, you know, you, you could think of the, C, the angry CEO, that wasn't in my case, but, you know, the CEO comes to, to your room and says, improve this and make our app usable. And then as a group of developers, product managers, and so on, we're thinking how we should implement, where we should implement, and where we should, where should, where, when we should ask for those app reviews in the app. So the how part in our case was very easy. We have a package for that, as usual in Flutter, it happens. So in app review, it basically offers you could trigger a, a function, and basically it opens the in app rating re rating or review pop up where you know user could rate your app and and leave a review if, if wanted. And then we started thinking at which moment and where we should provide this pop up. And then our gut feeling was that the user is most satisfied, you know, when the user receives money. That is kind of obvious, but, you know, we we didn't really have data about that. We, we didn't make any service, you know, uh, when you are the most satisfied about your app. So, so yeah, so for this, uh, we just introduced this, uh, this feature in our earnings page. And we, uh, we know we say that it's a payday. Uh, you receive the app, and then instantly we ask the user whether you want, you know, uh, to rate our. How was your feeling about the app? If the response is great, I really enjoy using Billow. Then we ask for the app uh, rating. If not, then then we pretty much hide this app rating model, and we say that okay, if you have any feedback, please reach out to our support and you know uh, and explain what's wrong happening with your app. So this, uh, there's uh, two advantages of that. So basically, we reduce the risk of receiving uh, like uh, not that great reviews, but also we get uh, we get a lot of valuable feedback from our from our users, which is also the case. And and yeah, the results speak by themselves. 
you could see the point where we released this feature and how our app ratings increased. And we received three times more ratings from that feature. And we also, our average rating increased to 4.1 stars and, and it really helped our product in general. Case study from that, uh, gut feeling is important. Note the key moments of your product when your clients or users are satisfied about your product and so on. And also do not forget to collect the feedback, especially in negative moments of your app. So, so yeah, feedback is always useful, uh, both for you and for your product. Whew. Save trees, stay solid. Thank you. And yeah, that, that's it from me today. Hey, and there I you go. Thanks. God has some question, right? I have lots of questions, you know, meaning of oh, life, my. things like that. However, um, there is a question that we actually need to look at right now, and that is, does Datadog offer something similar to the Sentry breadcrumbs? Uh, maybe, Scott, do you know what are Sentry breadcrumbs? I was hoping you would. Exactly. Uh, I think if that's, if I imagine it's like, you know, you can backtrace the problem if you can investigate maybe the uh, exception or the stack trees if that's the case yes but i'm just guessing uh, i i can only you know i need to verify what the sentry breadcrumbs are all right well i really appreciate you coming on lots of great information and uh, i agree you know no f experiment is failed if you learned things that you didn't know before and uh, exactly you know all right well we appreciate it and cool. we will see you around sir thank oh my bad hate it when i do that we have another gentleman coming up here in just a moment we're going to take a look at using flutter to build native looking apps for windows and mac this is definitely possible. You can definitely make adaptive native looking UIs for Mac and Windows desktop with Flutter. Now, our next presenter is going to be taking a look at the methods and tools used to build and ship a Flutter desktop app for Mac and Windows using a UI that matches very closely to each of those platforms designs. They will be going into packages, techniques, other resources and things that they found useful to build that app and make sure that the users feel right at home. Um, please say hello to Minas. Hi. Did I get that hey. right? Minas, Minas? Uh, Minas. Minas. Okay. Yes. Always good. I always try to get people's names right. Yes, I understand. Yeah. But uh, yes, is there anything else you wanted to say as far as uh, introducing? No, I would be interested to know your questions afterwards. All right. Sounds good. And uh, looks like we are about ready to get going here. If the magic producer in the sky who has the video will do that. Everybody, my name is Minas Yanekas, and today we'll be talking about my experience with using Flutter to build a native looking desktop app for macOS and Windows. So a few things about me first. I am a self-employed app developer. My main background is in web development, but I discovered Flutter a couple of years ago and I have been using it since for mobile and desktop uh, development. So for a quick overview, I'm going to use as an example here a small app I created. It's called Shortcut Keeper. It's built with Flutter and it's now available on both macOS and Windows. It features a native looking user interface for its a platform. So it's rather a simple app in terms of functionality. It allows you to save and keep your favorite keyboard shortcuts in one place. So let me bring this up for a minute. You can see that we have a list of the shortcuts we have saved. And so when you come across a keyboard shortcut you want to keep, you can add a new shortcut. You can record the shortcut. You can add what it does. For example, create a new tab for Google Chrome. You can add some tags and then you can save it and uh, come back to it whenever you need. If you need to be reminded of how to do a certain action in one of uh, the apps that you use daily. So my main point here will be that it is indeed possible to use Flutter 
and build an adaptive app with a native looking user interface for each desktop platform, focusing here on uh, macOS and Windows. So here you have its main screen for macOS and Windows. And you can see that while they are different from each other, they both try to look similar to other native apps and programs that you may have used in macOS or Windows. So an adaptive app, as its name says, is simply an app that adapts to the other length platform. So in our case, the desktop operating system. So it is mostly about respecting each platform's idioms and norms, how things are usually displayed or done on each platform. So it helps a lot with improving user experience since users expect apps to behave similarly to other apps that they use daily. So the classic example of this is how on macOS or Linux, the confirm button is traditionally placed on the right side, while it's the exact opposite uh, on Windows. Another one, of course, is keyboard shortcuts. So when selecting the appropriate shortcuts for your app, you have to keep in mind that the uh, command is the main modifier button for the macOS, uh, while control is the main one for Windows or Linux. And there are also differences in how these keyboard shortcuts are displayed and which ones are traditionally used for certain actions, like the command comma shortcut in macOS, which almost always brings, brings up the preferences or settings uh, menu for its app. Yeah, you won't want to use a command comma to another action, as that would be confusing to users of your application. So all these may seem to be small things, but they eventually add up to make a real difference in how a user perceives and uh, faces your application. You can, of course, configure this stuff and uh, build an adaptive user interface for your app with Flutter's material UI or your own custom design. However, you can also take it one step further and go for a native looking user interface. So what's a native looking user interface? It's simply a design for your app that not only respects the adaptive guidelines that we saw previously, but also tries to get your app closer to a native look and feel for its platform. So for example, you can see here, you can check here, how similar the macOS version of Shortcut Keeper is uh, looks to other apps of uh, macOS, mainly the, the Notes and the Reminders apps. You can see that we are able to follow the same layout concept with the sidebar on the left and the coded on the right. You can also notice the search field on uh, the top uh, toolbar and the icons that uh, reside there where you use a similar uh, design and icon styling. The same can be said for Windows as well. Again, you can look at the search bar or the icon buttons that now have a label next to them. There is also a line indicator in uh, the sidebar to signify which menu item is uh, selected each time. And we also use a similar font for the text and the icons so to the one that is used uh, across uh, Windows applications. So this approach can build trust with users of your app. It also feels as a more natural user interface that they can easily navigate and be more productive with. And finally, it also means that you as a developer uh, can immediately take advantage of each platform's best design practices. So the recommendations from Apple or Microsoft uh, respectively. So just as you might use the Material and Cupertino libraries for building mobile apps for the Android and iOS version of a mobile app, it makes sense to adopt the corresponding guidelines for desktops as well. So that's the Human Interface Guidelines for macOS from Apple and the Fluent Design Guidelines for Windows from uh, Microsoft. You can check these resources to see the suggested design guidelines for its system, like how a checkbox should look, where a toolbar should appear, or how to handle opacity or uh, animations. And now let's see how we can get to a native looking user interface uh, with Flutter for desktop. So we mostly use two great packages for this. It's the macOS UI package for macOS and the Fluent UI package for Windows. They both provide a wealth of uh, useful UI widgets like buttons, dropdowns, list tiles, and so on, as well as a basic layout scaffold to work with. They also provide uh, the default colors and styles that you can find in each system. These packages are both actively developed and you can also contribute to the development uh, yourself. So the real challenge is to get both these libraries mixed in the same code base. 
then to handle all the conditional logic of this integration, and of course to extend or customize each UI library in case where some functionality or some component is missing. So let me now show you some of the methods that we can follow. First, in our main.dar file, instead of a material app, we build a macOS app or a Fluent app depending on uh, the platform. This is necessary in order to be able to use its package's custom layout, its widgets, animations, and so on. And we do that with, with a simple conditional check. We then create so-called platform aware widgets. These function as simple forks that decide which platform-specific widget to build in runtime. For example, here is a simple implementation of a, Mac, uh, of a platform text field, which builds a macOS text field if we are on macOS, and the text box from Fluid UI if we are on Windows. This rendered differently for each platform. You can see here how the macOS text field looks from the macOS UI platform uh, package, and the text box from uh, Fluid UI. You can notice the more rounded borders or the different uh, drop shadow that you can find on Windows. And the same can be done for other components that already have widgets in macOS UI or Fluent UI, like the Confirm button or the Loading Spinner. This way we can use this uh, platform text widget throughout our application anywhere we need. And we can also pass the same properties and uh, values to increase our code reuse, just like we do here with the controller and, and the placeholder uh, properties. This is pretty convenient, but uh, since both libraries are still in active development, there are some UI elements that may not uh, be available in either macOS UI or Fluid UI or both. So, for example, this was a case with a drop-down button. There was, no, there was no macOS style widget available in the macOS UI library at uh, that uh, period. So, the app initially used the material themed uh, drop-down button widget, as shown on the right. So what I did and what we can generally do in such cases is to extend the library based on Flutter's basic uh, widgets. So this means that we need to adapt it to the platform's uh, guidelines. So in this case, the, we try to copy the pop-up button from Apple's human interface guidelines. It's the classical select button that you can find uh, system-wide. So we customize Flutter's drop-down button to implement a macOS pop-up button. This has a different design. It has a different size, padding, drop shadows, borders, and so on. It has the characteristic double carré icon on the right. It has macOS specific colors and uh, transparency. It has no, scro no scroll bar when it's open. And there is a different behavior when there are uh, items that are not visible. You can see on the right how the final result looks. So this way we have a native looking component that we can reuse across our application and which tries to replicate the one that is found natively on macOS in this uh, particular case. So with these simple strategies, we are able to build a simple Flutter desktop app like this that looks and behaves natively for each platform. So here are some comparison screenshots to see the final result. On the left is the app on macOS and on the right is the Windows. So here is the home screen. You can see the different font and typography that we use in its uh, app version. And here you can see the difference in animations as we move around the different screens of the app. And when we open the dialog, you can see that uh, the macOS version has a white backdrop, while uh, the Windows version has a more uh, darker backdrop shadow, which is what is used mainly in its platform. And also you can see here some uh, form elements like checkboxes, buttons, and text fields, which look native to each platform. And of course, the one I would talk about earlier, the different horizontal order of the confirm and cancel button uh, for this platform. Now, some things to consider if you try to follow this approach. So first, platform design. So how things look in macOS and Windows apps is changing all the time. It may not even be that consistent. I have found that Windows is uh, more notorious for this. Here are, for example, five different uh, Windows text boxes that you may find across the operating system. So you should know that uh, you may not be able to achieve and follow 100% uh, all native user interface design. But it also won't matter that much. These libraries get you far along the way to a native uh, result by default. So users will not be that supported if, for example, 
your text field is slightly more rounded than the one in the latest macOS version. If the core of your app looks and, uh, and works fine, it don't find it too much. And uh, what about Linux? So I haven't worked on importing this to Linux yet, but it's definitely possible. There is a Yaru package that tries to replicate the Ubuntu Yaru style and achieve the look and feel of a Linux desktop. So we can follow again the same strategy by adding Yaru widgets to our platform where widgets and do some conditional checks in uh, runtime. And finally, here are some resources that you may find helpful if you are going to try something like this. So first, an article on building adaptive apps from uh, the Flutter documentation with a lot of examples and guidance. Then we have the design guidelines from uh, Apple and Microsoft, respectively. And lastly, there are some Flutter packages that you can use. It's the free platform uh, uh, libraries, macOS UI, Fluent UI, and Yaru for, for platform-specific design. There's also the Beach Window, the window package, which is useful for customizing the app's uh, windows. And you can also check the Flutter platform widgets, which follows a similar approach, but for Android and uh, iOS, using the Material and the Cupertino libraries to build a different version of a mobile app. So this was a short intro on how we can leverage Flutter's desktop abilities and community packages to build a great native looking uh, app easily. So I hope you found this useful and you try to follow and expand on uh, this approach for your own apps. And that's my cut. I say goodbye for me. So thank you for listening. I was really happy to be able to do this. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And uh, welcome back. Thank you very much. <laughs> nice to see you again. Uh, very nice cat. Um, <laughs> I have a question for you. Yes. Do, did you prepare that whole talk in Flutter? All those slides, everything? Uh, you mean in Flutter? Yes. Did you make a Windows Flutter app that shows all your slides? Ah, no, no, no. It's a classic uh, a keynote uh, presentation, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, hey, there's an idea for the future. Yeah, a presentation uh, app for, uh, with Flutter, yeah. Yeah. It should work. I think, uh, in fact, if I remember correctly, I believe Tomek Polanski did something similar to that. He had it on his phone and he yeah. cast it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw it on Twitter, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, one more quick check. I'm not seeing. Well, okay. We do have one question here. If I make an Android and Windows app from a single code base, should the project contain both Material and Fluent UI, or should I make a separate project, one for each platform? Uh, no, you can follow the same uh, logic and uh, keep one project for both the Android and the Windows version, but with the platform checks. So if platform is Android, build the Material widget, and if platform is uh, Windows, build the Fluent UI widget. So you can share the business logic of your app. So how things are done, uh, uh, the state management, the data um, uh, applications, and so on. All right. Well, I, we really appreciate you coming. Thank you very and much. thank you, and we'll, we'll see you around. Thank you very much. Bye. All right. <laughs> a little confusion about who's driving there for just a moment. That's all right. Uh, coming up next, we have Daria Orlova. And she's going to talk about animal-friendly pet projects, such as um, we have heard about cases using Flutter for production for big companies. But what about for solo developers? You have to do this in your free time. Your free time is very limited. The resources you have really boil down to you, you, and you. So the good news is that Flutter is great for solo projects too. You know, Bunny Search is a Flutter app. It was created and launched by a single developer and it was produced exclusively during their free time. In this talk, you're going to learn how they built this pet project from scratch within a realistic time frame. Okay, how to select the tech stack, when to choose existing experiences versus learning new tools, and what you need to know in order 
to publish the app as an individual as opposed to a large company. So with that said, uh, let's take it away. My name is Arielova and I'm a mobile developer from Latvia. I work in a mobile agency called Chile, where we create various client applications. But besides working on someone else's apps during the day, I'm also an app developer in the evening. And last year, I've launched my own app called Bunny Search, and I'm the co-founder and the only developer of this app. And I worked on it exclusively during my free time, which usually were occasional evenings and some of the weekends. We have heard a lot of success stories about how big companies and products are adopting Flutter, but what if you're an individual developer? Is it possible to create and launch an app all by yourself? Well, since you're here, you probably guessed that yes, it is of course possible. And I learned from practice by turning an idea in my head into an app in the store. So while doing so, I've encountered various problems, found solutions to them, and learned my lessons. I've combined, I've combined this into a pet project roadmap and we'll share it step by step with you today. Also, before we move on, even though pet project, side project can mean basically any project that you do in your spare time, in this context, I will assume it is a mobile app that was created from scratch and launched into the stores. So why create pet projects? Well, option A, because you have an idea that you want to implement, that's easy. Option B, well, I'll give you several reasons why you should invest your time into a side project. Since this is your own application, every technical decision will be your responsibility. Some of them will be successful, some not so much. But nevertheless, it will be your, exper your experience from which you will learn. And there's a great chance that your app will need to communicate with remote data in one way or another, so you will gain full stack experience. If you've ever questioned your product or project manager decisions, then this will be a unique opportunity to get a perspective from their side. Managing your time, ruthlessly prioritizing features, and sometimes compromising on time decisions, all of these are inevitable steps along the way to a successful product launch and will make you a more empathic developer in your day job. Well, portfolio is obvious. If you're just starting as you, <coughs> your career as a mobile developer, then this is the best way to show off your skills. After all, potential clients want their apps to be downloadable from the stores and not only from GitHub. If you're an experienced developer, then there is a chance that a lot of your work might be under NDA. Uh, pet projects are your opportunity to share your acquired knowledge with the community and engage with other developers. Besides sharing the code itself, you can also create content around it. Okay, we have learned a lot of hard skills. How about soft skills? Being paid for creating an app for the client is one thing, but working on a project of your own that doesn't pay yet, at least, and that you need to sacrifice your free time on requires a heck of a lot of discipline and responsibility. Those qualities are essential both in tech and in life in general. Deliberately working on a project for a continuous period of time and actually delivering it will grant you with skills that no self-help book can. And after that, there are several things that you can do with your side project, such as contribute to the open source or turn it into a monetized side hustle. Why not? And here are some content, potential concerns that might stop you from working on a side project and we will debunk them along the way. Concerns such as pet project require a lot of free time, a lot of experience, a lot of money, and people with specific skills. Okay, amazing. Let's get building. But what should we build? If you already have your own idea, great, go on with it. But if you don't, no worries. Good old Google got you covered. 
Seriously, if you just search mobile app ideas, you will find a lot of them. So browse, get inspired, adapt them to your, to your, to your needs and start building. To understand how the idea of bunny search was born in my head, you need to know a couple of things about me. All of my life, I was growing up with various pets, dogs, cats, and bunnies. I'm absolutely obsessed with cats. If you follow me on Twitter, you can be sure to see them in your feed. I'm a vegetarian since my teenage years, since my teenage years, and I love makeup. Okay, that last fact is random, Dario. What does it have to do with animals? Well, the problem is that before getting to the counters, the makeup needs to be tested for safety. And one of the methods is particularly cruel. It involves animal testing. Is it required? No. Is the makeup safer than the one tested with other methods? No. Do the animals suffer? Unfortunately, yes, and a lot. But this is not the only way to test, hence there is such a notion that's called cruelty-free makeup. And there are special organizations such as PETA and Living Bunny that give brands the cruelty-free status certificates. I've checked the existing apps at the time and found very old apps that had bad UX, old data, and some weren't even available in my country. So that is how the decision to create Bunny Search was made. Okay. Great, we have the idea, but what should we do with it? So let's remember our, our goal here for a minute. Publish an app to the store and do it in a limited time frame with limited financial resources. Why limited? Well, if it's unlimited, it will never get published. <laughs> Those who have a backlog of half done projects know what I'm talking about. Uh, so the first step, we will define an MVP. What is an MVP? Uh, it's a basic version of your app that has the minimum of features implemented that can be shipped to the user as fast as possible to get first meaningful feedback. MVP stands for minimum viable product. So let's strip your idea of all the fancy machine learning, Web3, blockchain, whatever other hype to where there is, and leave it with a minimum of plain features. For example, Here's what the MVP of Bunny Search sounds like. There should be an option to see certified brands by organization. There should be an option to search for a brand by title among all of the brands in the database. And you should be able to see details of this brand. And for initial version, those details include only the list of organizations that this brand is certified by. And now that we know what exactly we want to develop, for our initial version, we need to decide how it will look. Now, one might argue that design is not the most important part of the app. While that might be true, I think that at this point in history, we are pretty much spoiled with beautiful applications that besides looking beautiful, do their job too. So even if you don't do anything fancy at first, it pays off to make a little effort to make your app look decent at least. So what are your options? Well, the obvious one, but probably not the most possible one, not the easiest one, is to collaborate with a designer. You can search one on social media or among your friends. For example, you can decide that they create um, design for free, but they can use it in their portfolio, in their dribble shots, and so on. Who knows, it might work out. But a more realistic and probably the best option for this case is to search for a ready and a free UI kit. This is a very great option because there are many beautiful and free UI kits out there. Again, just Google it. For example, healthcare uh, app free UI kit. Uh, but the downside is that it will probably won't cover all of the features. Uh, but then again, you can decide on one of the UI kits and assemble missing screens or missing features out of it. And the third option, the crazy one, is to become the mythical unicorn developer, which means that you are a designer and a developer. And if you somehow are good to go, and if not, you can follow an algorithm that I followed. So the first step is to browse Dribbble, Behance, and Pinterest for ideas of ready designs for your apps. 
they can be from different domain, but you just need to find the ones that look and feel nice for you. Then screenshot the ones that you like and put them all together in one mood board. <laughs> and then the fun part, try to make something out of it yourself. And for the tools, I used what most designers use nowadays. It's Figma. It is very beginner friendly and you can quickly get a hang of it to make some basic things. And then the fact that Flutter is cross-platform really shines here because you don't need platform specific design and you won't need to adapt it to Android and to iOS layout specifics. And in fact, for Bonnie Search version 0.1, I did design I did the design myself. It took me a couple of days, evenings actually, and a lot of frustrations because I had zero prior experience with design and because UI is generally not my strongest side. Yet, I'm still proud of what I came up with. <laughs> Although later on, I still recruited a designer, my coworker Alexandra, who agreed to work with me on this nonprofit app for free. And that is how Bunny Search got its final look. So, a couple of words that I mentioned here now it's a nonprofit app, meaning that I don't get any profit from it in any way. Uh, no affiliations, no ads, no subscriptions, no paid content, nothing. And this is a decision that I made on purpose because I want this app to be available to as many users as possible for them to make the cruelty-free choice easier in order to help as many animals as possible. Okay, we have now designed our app. Let's actually start coding. And we will start coding with frontend. So this is the point where if you already have prior experience, you'll be often greeted with a dilemma what to do, try something new and experiment and spend more time or go with something that has already proved itself and focus on delivery. I think that balance is key. So in some cases I chose experiments, but in others went with experience. And if you don't have experience, don't worry and forget about this. This is exactly where you'll gain it. So as I've already mentioned, actually have I? Well, Bunny Search was actually my first attempt at Flutter. And even though at first I considered doing uh, going with uh, native development, uh, native Android, since I already knew it and had a lot of experience with it, but I was too tempted by a lot of positive reviews of this new cross-platform framework called Flutter. And I'm really happy that I did because I fell in love ever since. Now, the funny thing is, even though it was my first Flutter project, it was halted for more than a year for unrelated reasons. So when I returned to it in April 2021, I already had some experience with Flutter apps. Uh, more specifically, we at Chile have worked out a great architecture and state management approaches that I liked enough and decided to use in my pet project as well. So in this case, I chose experience. But uh, since I now had time to experiment, I decided to spend it on UI. When I was working with Android, to my dismay, UI wasn't my strongest side. And I often avoided doing anything fancy due to time constraints and because I didn't <laughs> like working with Android custom UI. But in my pet project, though, I decided to work on my weaker sides and not shy away from UI challenges. So when I saw that the when I saw that the designer had come up with a pretty yet I have no idea how to implement it kind of search bar, I dived in. Uh, I spent some time on it. I think maybe one full day, for example, that would be like eight hours in my full day. And in the end, I found a solution that involved math and animations, things that I was far away from in Android and also wrote a tutorial about it. And in case you want to check it out, you can find it on my Medium. Also, while we're here, I mentioned that all of the resources that I mentioned, the source code of the app and everything uh, will be all gathered in one link and I will share it at the end of the presentation. Okay, so now that we have our app UI done, let's connect the most important the most important part, the data. So before hooking up any kind of backend solution, we first need to get the data. 
Okay, so relevancy of this step uh, depends on the business logic of your app. If your app revolves around on-device user-generated content, good for you. In my case, Bunny Search is the source of content, content that can change over time, uh, so I couldn't skip this step. And there are several ways that you can get data for your app. First one, obviously, generate it yourself. For example, if your app is your personal collections, a collection of recipes, then there is no other way than well, to put the data together yourself. In this case, you will only need to think about how to model the data, like what fields it will have, how to fill them in, and where to store them. And second option is use free public APIs. For example, you can check out this GitHub repo. It has a huge list of available public APIs, ranging from weather APIs to APIs that generate random facts about cats. So I guess I have an idea for my next, <laughs> next pet project. And, or you can just Google any specific one to yourself. For example, um, food products information API. And the last option is to web scrape the data from the website that you need. Now, it's really important to know here that there might be legal consequences and you only want to do that if you're allowed to do that, if you're sure that you can do that. Um, for example, this is how we get data from some of the organizations for the Bunny Search app. But before we went this way, we contacted the organizations, asked them if they have an API that we can use for our app. But for example, Peta said that no, they don't have the API, but they might have it in the future. And what we can do at this moment that we can scrape their website. So that's what we did, but we have a written permission to do so. And this is also a reason why we don't have Leaping Bunny apps, uh, apps brands in the app at the moment, because we're still negotiating that part, uh, because we can scrape the website, but we don't want any trouble. Also, at this point, I think it's important to remember the fact that I'm a co-founder. So I have another co-founder and my other co-founder is Jana. And she is responsible for communicating with organizations as well as creating and creating our very own list of Bunny Search verified brands by reaching out directly to them. So now that we have the data, how will we pass it around? Well, generally you have three options. First one, all backend, all on device. For example, you can use such libraries as Hive and ASAR for NoSQL kind of data or Floor and Drive uh, for SQL type of data. Second option, by using backend as a service, such as Firebase, AppWrite, Superbase, and others, or going all in and developing your custom backend. Let's evaluate those options. So first option, no backend. No backend, no problem, right? Well, sometimes that can work. <laughs> if your app doesn't require any communication with remote data and it can all be handled on device, then you can rely on local storage only. Benefits of this approach include, there's nothing extra for you to integrate and data is always available and doesn't rely on the network connection. Uh, but the major drawback is that in order to update the data, you need to ship a new version of the app. Definitely not convenient. Plus, you won't gain the full stack experience after all. Also, when I meant nothing extra, I meant nothing uh, third party extra. So second option is backend as a service. And chances are, is that you've already heard about Firebase at least. So while well, Firebase, among many other vendors, such as AppWrite or Superbase, offer what is known as backend as a service functionality. Basically, it is what it's called. They offer such a common things as user authentication, database, cloud file, store, file storage, and many other things that you might need for your app. They abstract away the implementation and the scaling, offering you an easy to use API. All of this comes at a cost, Although most offer a free tire that will be enough for most of the pet project and especially at their initial stages. So among the benefits is fast integration, easy scaling, 
and it's free up to a point. And the drawbacks, of course, are it's free up to a point. And in case you have a lot of users suddenly or a lot of data, or you just somehow configure it in, in a very bad way, you might run into, um, into it being pricey. And also, it's you're still relying on a third party SDK with all of its implications. And Firebase specific is that it provides the no SQL database only. Uh, in my case, for bunny search, I went with Firebase uh, because at this point I had experience with it. And in this case, I decided to deliver instead of experiment, at least at first. And I already spent enough time and nerves assembling the data, scraping it for the app that I didn't want to spend an eternity developing my own backend. Why I didn't use other vendors? To be honest, I don't know. At that time, I didn't have second thoughts just because I already had experience with Firebase. Uh, but if I was presented with this choice today, I'd probably reconsider, both for the sake of experiments, because I have already made a lot of projects with Firebase, and also because of functionality. As it turned out from practice, NoSQL doesn't really work great for my type of data, and it will be even more so when I will be adding new features. Um, but Actually, I have a complex solution, and in order to save on cost and traffic, I only query Firebase in case there is an update in the database. Otherwise, it's all on device, after the initial download of the database. Now, if for some reason the previous two options don't suit you, and you want more control and more problems, then this is for you. Write your custom backend. First of all, all practical things aside, this is the coolest thing that you can do in terms of learning as a front-end developer, um, because as a front-ender with hands-on back-end experience, you'll find it easier to communicate with real back-end teams in your day-to-day -day work and participate in more meaningful conversations, planning, and development. So if you need only one reason to do it, here you go. <laughs> But my advice in this regard is, if you don't have any previous experience with backend, and that's number one, and number two, backend as a service works for you, and you do indeed want to publish your app, then at first, launch the MVP into the stores with backend as a service connected to it. And once that is working, all is fine, and you have more time and room to experiment, then develop your custom backend. You might not even actually use it in the end, but at least your app will be a real use case to develop for rather than something random. And also you won't be able to fail your app because you already have a working version. Win-win. Okay, so I give advice and I follow it. After the app was already launched, I realized that I'm interested to expand my skills a little and tap into the backend domain. And since I already had an app that could benefit from a custom backend, and I've also watched a talk about Dart being used on the server, I decided it's a perfect opportunity to experiment. One can ask why use Dart for backend if there are already so many uh, time and production proven solutions for backend. Well, first of all, because I'm on a backend dev, uh, backend development is a whole new domain and it is different from mobile development. So I've decided to ease in my transition and start with something that I already know, and that is Dart. Maybe in the future, I will try other frameworks. Why not? A second is because it's fun. <laughs> I'm really curious to see how far it will go. I think that the success of a tool uh, from my perspective at least, is tightly coupled with how the community reacts to it and how it contributes to building an ecosystem around it, like libraries that can be used, uh, tools, and so on. And maybe Dart on the server is the next big thing? Maybe not. <laughs> Who knows? But hey, we already made so many logic-based decisions. Let's hype a little and have some fun. Okay, okay, back to being practical, there's also code that can be reused and shared from your existing Flutter projects, for example, your data models. So in order to develop a backend with Dart, I've used a package developed by the Dart team 
called Shelf. And it took me about 10 hours altogether to write my API for the Bunny Search app from scratch. And it currently mimics uh, Firebase one to one, but I will refactor it to be more convenient. And I followed a couple of tutorials I found on the internet. And basically I really created a fully function API that covers all of the current endpoints that I need. And all I've left to do is to actually host the production version of it. And also just recently, Very Good Ventures have released their own framework called Darfrog. And that wraps shelf library underneath. And according to their roadmap of features, it has really great potential. I've also challenged myself and spent two hours refactoring my pure shelf implementation to Darfrog just for the sake of fun. And that's another really um, nice aspect of working on a side project. You always have something to uh, play around with. Okay, look how far we've got. We have a fully functioning app and now it's time to distribute it. So what's the best way to do it? Well, the easiest one would probably be to assemble it locally, manually, and just send the version to your beta testers, the APK file, for example, for Android. But if you have ever tried any CI entity tools that assemble and distribute your app, you'll probably never want to do manual distribution again. And if you have never used CI CD tools, then this is your opportunity to do so. Continuous, continuous integration and continuous delivery tools um, is <laughs> allow you to automate the building, testing, and distribution phases of your apps. Uh, you can set up pipelines from sharing version of your app with your beta testers via, for example, such services as Firebase app distribution, um, as well as to deploying straight to the stores. And CI/CD is an important step in release management of real products. I strongly encourage you not to skip these steps. You will minimize possibility, possibilities uh, to do something uh, wrong while deploying and will learn new skills that will pay off in your day job, as well as just save some time on it for yourself. Um, there are many great service providers of CI and CD, and in Chile we use Bitrise and are pretty much satisfied with it. But in my personal projects, I, want to try, I wanted to try something different. First of all, it would be boring to, so, to set up the same pipeline uh, for a zillion time. And second of all, I've been hearing a lot about the service called Kelp Magic and how it easily integrates with Flutter. So on the delivery versus experiment scale, this time the experiments are overweight. So the setup of the pipelines that assemble Android and iOS build and distribute them to Firebase app distribution it was very easy and fast. I was satisfied with this, but what surprised me the most were the build times of the apps. For some reason, they were much faster than Bitrise. We are so close to the finish line now. One last step, the publication. Amazing, the app is created, feedback from beta testers is implemented, and it's ready to be released to the public. But not so fast. There are still some things that you need to do before your baby will see the world. While you're developing your app, it can be signed by the bug or development certificates. But once you decide to publish it, you will need to generate and sign with release certificates. So you will need to explore this topic. You might also consider flavoring your app so that once it goes public, you can continue developing it without being scared to miss any production data. And in order to publish your apps, you will need to create a developer account for Google and Apple. And Google Play account has a one-time fee of $25, but Apple developer account costs $99 per year. Uh, also, those prices might depend on the region, but this is how it is in Latvia. App assets, and this means that both stores require you to provide some information as well as visual assets in order to be shown in the stores. They include short and long descriptions, app icon, app preview screenshots in specific formats, and if your app requires sign in, then they will need to also provide credentials for users so that the app reviewers can log in to check the app manually. You will need to provide privacy policy as well as terms and conditions in form of a web URL that can, that can be accessed 
find that if you use any third party RDK, such as Firebase, you will also need to specify that. And also, if you work with a lot of user data, you might consider running, running it by the legal department. But in general, you can find a lot of templates free and paid on the internet. For Apple, you also need to provide a support website. In my case, I've created a simple page on WordPress that just features the support email. And yeah, you'll also need to specify support email and other contact information. Now, the worst step that I hate is the app privacy questionnaires. This is an extensive multi-step questionnaire in both stores about how user data is used in your app and what type of content does your app provide that is required to be filled in in order to publish your um, app for the first time. And you're done. Time to publish your app for review. Once it's reviewed and hopefully no problems are found, it will be available to download. Congrats. In case there are any problems, don't worry, this happens to everyone. Apple and Google are notorious for disapproving due to very random reasons. Just fix what they ask and publish the updated version. And reviews can take some time, ranging from several hours to several days. Okay, what's next? Well, first of all, field test, use your app. Then, of course, monitor your crash report system for crashes and fix them if they occur. Gather user reviews and feedback and analyze analytics to see what parts of your app are used and how and what you can do with it. Then you can also open source it. <clears throat> if you decide to do so, you may need to read up on software licenses or turn it into your side income and wire up some kind of monetization, such as in-app purchases or subscriptions. This will motivate you to work on it even more. So here's our finished roadmap, which we created step by step. And hopefully your concerns regarding the impossibility of creating something on your own have vanished. All of the resources mentioned today, as well as slides and links to Bunny search source code can be found in the GitHub repo that you will see on the screen. Thank you for attending my talk. I hope that I've inspired you to work on your pet project and debunked the myths and concerns that you had among this journey. And this version of Bunny Search took approximately eight months to develop, considering that I have a full-time job, family and hobbies, and I only spent occasional evenings and weekends. And there were even several weeks in a row when I didn't touch that all. I spent <laughs> zero money, excluding the ones <laughs> spent for creating developer accounts. And I've learned tons while developing this app also create content around it and implemented my small dream that hopefully helps to save animal lives. And I will continue working on making this app more useful as well as another, as another pet project. I mean, I have Flutter. Why would I not utilize this opportunity to the maximum? Happy coding. Scott, you're on mute. I had to do it at least once. <laughs> yeah. I do it once a week, every week. I, you know, yeah. It's great to see you again. It's great. How to have see you it. been? I'm sorry. I said, "How have you been?" Oh, I, I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Doing good. We are hanging in there. Let's see here. Um, we've got a few different questions here. Um, what kind of an architecture did you use when creating your app? Um, yeah, okay, maybe I can share my slide for a second um, to focus on the slide with architecture. Uh, sure, go right ahead. Yeah. Okay, so can you see my slide? Uh, basically, um, the architecture of my app um, is called clean architecture. Uh, I have three layers, uh, the presentation, domain, and data. And they are split into features in each model. So um, basically, each layer has a feature model. And for state management, I use block library. And inside of block, uh, we have um, a special class called result that can be either loading error or success. Um, it's called a segmented state pattern or a triple state pattern. And we use it because we, 
I say we because, as I mentioned, uh, we developed this approach in Chile. So I adapted it in my pet project too. And we developed it from app to app, making it um, more useful and covering the use cases and solutioning the problems that we have um, in our real life app development. So we found that this works the best at this moment. Nice. I also noticed you a lot of repositories there. Is that some use of the facade pattern? A solid pattern? The, uh, the um, sometimes the repository pattern is also called the facade pattern. Yeah. That's a yes. lot of use there? Okay. Yes, yes. This is what we use. Basically, uh, you have repositories, um, interfaces of the repositories that can be substituted uh, to different implementations, and they basically handle most of the um, like they're those big big classes that handle most of the features. Very cool. Um, someone's wondering now. The answer to this question is always it depends, <laughs> which is more effective, Firebase or AWS. But in your opinion, uh, what what's your experience? Well, I don't have much experience with AWS. I remember that one time we had a case where we needed to implement AWS, but there was limited support, at least at that time, with Flutter um, libraries. So we went uh, with Firebase um, for that case. But yeah, I can't, I can't, I don't have any field details because I haven't used it. But yeah, I guess it depends on features that you use and how much of the data and the traffic is involved. All right. Well, I see you've clearly uh, inspired at least one person. I'm really happy that was my goal. There you go. Um, there's one other question about just how to make an open source project in general. Um, <laughs> I don't know how much you might have on that one. That's really kind of a little off topic. Uh, well, how I, I debated with my app how to do it because at first I um, developed it in private. It was a private repository. And then when I decided to um, pub publicize it, I w was weighing the options to actually publicize the repo itself, but in the end, I went with a copy of the repo because I also had some stuff committed there that I didn't want it to be committed and the commit history and everything because initially the project uh, was built without having um, open source in mind. Um, so I created a copy of my project from scratch and published that repository and also um, depending on how you want your code to be used uh, you need to check out licenses software licenses uh, because some of them allow like any kind of use of your code uh, some of them limit for example you can't um, use them in paid products and so on so this is also an aspect that when open sourcing you need to keep in mind very good very good you know speaking of uh, pet rescues i just stick my nose in here for one moment. I have a free ticket to tomorrow that is still up for grabs. If you go check out my Twitter, all you have to do is answer a question. There are three adjectives that describe dogs in shelters that have a very difficult time being adopted. Put down those three words uh, in reply to my Twitter there. And if you get it right, you get the ticket. And in the meantime, go adopt a dog. <laughs> Yes, I definitely agree on that one. Yeah, we do. Uh, we do the hard cases here. Our last one was a pit bull who had been abused pretty badly. So, but anyway, that is about all I have. If that's all you have, we're going to take a short break before our next talk. Okay. Thanks for having me, and you can find me in chat. Hey, thank you for coming. And we will catch you all again soon. We will be back at 10 minutes after the hour. Okay, everyone. And now we want to say a huge thank you once again to our sponsors, GuardSquare. And uh, if you're into mobile app development, and certainly you are since you're visiting this summit or you're just starting, uh, have you ever thought about this, uh, this idea? Is your 
mobile app really secure because new vulnerabilities they pop up every day and malicious actors look for easy targets on app marketplaces to exploit daily this is their business and securing your app valuable ip and data is critical and guard square security solution are built for developers and they protect your app at every stage in the development cycle. So you can start early and make sure your app is secure. And GuardSquare solutions are based on secure software development principles with ease of implementing and comprehensive polymorphic protection against threat actors at the very core of your application. The roots of this project is open source and their culture is to continuously collaborate on improving of the best practices which are used for this tool. Multiple layers of protection prevent reverse engineering and automatically detect tempering, making your app a difficult target for attackers. Learn more at guardsquare.com. Link is in the chat. Thank you for supporting us, Guardsquare. Have a great summit, everyone.
Hello Flutter family. Welcome back to Flutter Global Summit 2022. I'm Yogita Kumar and today we are going to visit some of our awesome speaker with me. And let's see. Wow, our next speaker picks up very interesting topic that is off context, the secret weapon everyone's afraid of. So let's welcome Scott on the stage. Welcome Scott. Hi, how are you Thank doing? You. I'm doing very well, doing very well. It's been a long time since I've been here. <laughs> that's nice, nice. I enjoyed your session, the previous session that you hosted. That's really nice. Yeah. Very good. Well, I hear we've got a, yeah, we've got an interesting speaker coming up. Um, I hear that they are into rescuing uh, big black and old dogs, hint, hint and are a, well, in general, an all-around wonderful and modest human being. Me! Yeah, <laughs> yeah here you are. Definitely. Here I am, yeah. at last. Now, yeah. um, alrighty then. Well, I thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, Yagita. And uh, please, please come back. Ahead. Yeah, I'm stage sorry? is all yours. Please go ahead, stage is all oh. yours. <laughs> okay, well, please come back for questions. Yeah, sure, sure. I will. If they don't have any, could you make some up? Yeah, That'd sure. Be great. Yeah, Thanks. sure. Definitely. All right. Well, and away we go. Ah, I'm still trying to drive. I shouldn't do that. Okay, something threw my camera focus out. Give me just a moment here. See if I can get it back. You know, there's a really, a very, very easy way to fix this. There. Now it's fixed. All right. Flutter dot of context. What are you afraid dot of? So, look, one of the things that I feel is pretty important is for people to know whether or not the talk is going to be worth their time, whether or not they should stay. So let me give a quick blow through of what this is. Um, it is for beginners. It's aimed at beginners. So, and especially it's aimed at beginners that may be coming from a design background or a web background. People who come from .NET or Xamarin, other things like that, where you might have uh, more experience with the, uh, sorry, more experience with backend might not benefit from this as much. But look, if you know how to create something like a car class and a person class, and then go into your state object for your app state and initialize private instance variables, and then initialize them, I'm sorry, in the init state, then you bounce back to my app and you create static methods that will return those instances, then you can access them anywhere in the app via app state dot of, or actually app state dot your method name, and then pass it in a context. Then you handle notifications, you know, with whatever approach of choice, be it Riverpod block, provider, um, you know, you, you could even, I'll show you how to do it with a change notifier and an animated builder. It's really not that difficult. So if you already know all that, feel free to take a break or you can hang out uh, either way. You're welcome to. So for the rest of you, what we're going to do is show you what the data of context is really doing and how to use your own. First of all, you can get the code at bit.ly dot underscore of underscore context. Complicated, I know. Give everybody a moment to grab that. So 
when we're looking at this, okay, dot of context, okay, we see it everywhere. But really, what is it? And, you know, you may be coming from a non-programming background where it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for me to say that it is a static function that is declared inside of a class, but because it's static, it can be reached from the global namespace. Backend people, don't laugh. My next talk is probably going to have to do with Material Design 3, accessibility, you know, color blindness, and responsive and adaptive apps, especially using aspect ratios. Um, so all the design people will be snickering and the back end people are saying, what? So let's take a look now at a static method. What we have here is a person. And normally, a lot of times you will get an of method, just OF, but it's doing the exact same thing that this is. You pass it a context and that's important and I'll show you why in just a little bit. But what this is going to do is it's going to declare a variable called state. And it's going to use find ancestor state of type, which is why it needs a context. Now, this find ancestor state of type is going to do exactly what it sounds like. It's going to go up the tree through its ancestors. And it's going to find the state called app state or it's going to find the first one it runs across. And then it's going to bring that back. Well, the interesting thing is it does that in the context. It looks for it in the context. So right here is the state that it is coming from. And the value of that state that's being returned is not in the my app class. It is in the my app state class. And you can see right here, it's being declared as a late final, and it's being initialized along with a couple of others in the init state. So right here and right there. So then we go back here and we declare that state and we initialize it right there. And again, what this is going to do is it is going to go into the context and it's going to go crawl up the tree to find the closest instance of app state. Any app state object will do. If you put more than one in, it's going to stop at the first one it can find. Now, does this have to be app state? Absolutely not. This can be barbecue rib state. OK, it, it can be home state. It can be, I don't know, um, motorcycle state, whatever state object you are tracking down. And remember, the state object is the state of any stateful widget. So you can make a dog stateful widget and then this would go looking for dog state. Let's take a look for a moment at the docs for this. And find ancestor state of type is going to return the state object of the nearest ancestor stateful widget, the first one it stumbles across, that is an instance of the given type T. Now, if you don't recognize T, don't worry about it too much. T basically is a blank. Picture that there's the word blank there. If you see T, if you see a capital E, a capital S, things like that, they always stand for what's called a generic, and basically it's a placeholder. All right, so it, it's going to return the state object of the nearest stateful widget it can find that is of the type you hand it. And just to look back at that again a moment, this is the type that you're handing it right here. Whatever you hand it will do. Now, in addition to this, there is a little something else that we should be aware of. Oh, I'm sorry. And there is the type T. 
I finished these slides 10 minutes ago. So, yeah. In the docs, calling this method, find ancestor state of type, is pretty expensive. If you understand your big O, it is type O, it is O of N, which is the depth of the tree. So basically, it is going to get worse and worse the longer the tree is because it's got to check everything on the way up. So this can start eating up resources. You only want to use this method if the number of widgets, if the distance to the desired ancestor is known to be small and it's known to be bounded, which basically means it's known to be limited. Again, only call it if you know it's not very far basically. So now that you know what it is, um, what do you do with it? Well, you get stuff. It's really cool, right? You get stuff even if it's not your birthday. Now, now that you're unwrapping your not birthday presents, let's take a look here and see if we can figure out what is the person's name. All right, so what's happening here is we are going to now address this current person method that we created. This is the static method that we made in my app. So the way we get this is we look at my app and then the name of the function. Now you notice we're going to be returning a person but we're calling it from my app. We're not calling person dot. This is not a method in person. This is a method in my app that returns a person. But again, how does it know where to find the ancestor state of type? How does it know where to find this? It's going to be in the context. Because every time you create a widget, you get a new build context that tells it what everything is above it along with other things. But without that information, you're never going to be able to find the function in my app called current person of, and then get the name out of what it's been, I'm sorry, out of what has been returned. Now, this is used absolutely everywhere. All right, it is used for theme. As in theme dot of context, you've probably seen this all over the place. It's also used in media query. If you want to get the device's size, if you want to look at uh, the semantics properties, the accessibility options that the user has uh, has set in their settings, they're all right there, and you have to look in the context for that. And the way you do that, of course, is the media query class itself has a function called of. So also, so does the navigator. Let's say you want to go find a text theme. Well, you go to the theme object and you call the of method. You hand it a context. And then it will go grab the text theme. Now, these may not be returning an ancestor state of type. They may be returning a state of type. And of course, if you can get a text theme, you can get an icon theme. So let's say you want to go and find, or you want to use a Material Design 3 compliant text size. <laughs> Where do you find that? Well, you find it in the theme, you call its of method, feed it a context. Now that you've got the theme, you look in the text theme member of that, the text theme parameter. And when you get that text theme back, that is a data object, which will contain all the various sizes, one of which being title large. So, but wait a minute. What if we don't want this to be the default color? What if we want to 
I don't know. Show an error? Well, we can give it the error color. So theme dot of context, text theme, title large. Now the compiler is going to complain and say this might be null, so you have to promise it won't be null. Then we run copy with, and what we're going to do here is when we run copy with, that allows us to change whatever we specify, and we're going to change the color. Well, what color is the error color? I have no idea. I don't need to know. I can go into the theme and tell it to use the error color. Hopefully, I'll never find out because, well, hopefully I won't have any errors. So, you want to see something cool? Really? Are you sure? Do you like clean code? Do you, you like names that make sense? Because, you know, easy to understand names are cool. You know, it's kind of like a fez, if, you know, any fans of Doctor Who. Fezes are cool. I don't own a fez, but maybe one day. So we take a look here. Now we've got a car instead of a person. The typical way of doing this is to say of. That's what you're going to find all over the place. And then we're going to do the same thing. We're going to declare a state. It's going to be context, find answer, st ancestor, state of type. We're going to the app state still because that's where we're declaring the instance of the car. Okay, this doesn't change unless we put it somewhere else. Of course, we don't have to put it in app state either. We're just keeping this this way for, um, sorry, for consistency. But if you actually create this somewhere else, then you'll be looking for it there. When we reach for this, using of, we will say my app dot of context type of car. Okay, all well and good. But that kind of reads like, well, everything else out there. Theme dot of context, navigator dot of context. Um, a lot of different things out of context, media query. But what if we did a little different? What if we named it in the? What, what does that do? How does that change the readability? Well, everything else here is exactly the same. As you can see, all we changed was the name. Now, when we use it, we're going to go my app in the context type of car. Is that cool or what? I mean, you go to the my app that is in the context and you get the type of car variable. I mean, makes perfect sense to me. And of course, find the my app instance in the context and return its type of car. My app in the context type of car. How easy can you get? Now, this is important. Okay, remember, the class before the dot of or dot whatever, person of, car of, you know, Jelly donut of. That's where you find the method. That's not the class that actually owns the method. Right here, we go to my app. But here's what we want. We're going to get a name from the person. Okay. But that's not a person. Right? We want to get a name from a person, but we're not going to the person to get it. We're getting to the, we're going to the place where we created the instance. Okay. And that right there is the function or the method inside of my app that's going to return the person. And where is that? I just gave it away. It's in there. 
it's in my app. So really what we're going to do here is this is where you find the method. Okay, so here is where you find this method, which takes a build context and it returns this. All right, this is what you want to remember. Here is the method that takes the build context and gets you that. So, thank you very much. I really do appreciate it. Um, interesting trick that has been used down through the ages by the ancients. If you really, really want to remember something, make it a song. Not kidding. If you make it a song, then it becomes so easy to remember. It's absolutely ridiculous. So let me just double check where we are on time here because my good buddy Arahel is waiting in the wings and I want to make sure I don't run over his time. Okay, so where are we here? We're going to summarize. And again, really, this is probably the most important slide in the whole talk. Here is where you find the method that is going to need a build context in order to get you this. So let's summarize. You want to declare your instance in the app state. Actually, I'm sorry, that's wrong. In the state object of whatever stateful widget you're using. Here, we're going to use app state. And app state's a great one to use because it's way up the widget tree. But if you know you're going to be using something on just one branch, then you can move this to the base of that branch and that way it won't be in the context of all the rest of the app, which is called polluting the scope. You don't need to have a bunch of junk, excuse me, a bunch of junk floating around in your context that you're never going to use in those branches. You know. So what we have here is we declare it as a late final because what we're going to do is we're going to run a constructor. Now, yes, there are other ways to do this. This is just the way I decided to do it right here. So we've got a theme manager, which I will show you how that works in just a moment. And, oops, where did we go there? I clicked on something that maybe I shouldn't have. Nope, we're good. So now we're going to create a static method, okay, that is often called of, but not always. And it is going to need a build context. And that right there, of course, we have gone over multiple times. Now, what do I recommend for state management? We always get this question. Not one week on hump day Q&A goes by when we don't get the state management question in the first hour. And then somebody comes along late in the second hour and asks it again. Just saying. One way to do it is to have the class ex uh, extend change notifier and wrap the widgets in an animated builder. Your instance is the listenable. Okay, now what's going on here is person and car are extending change notifier, which means now you're going to be able to use them in that. So, and also, I'm sorry, the theme manager as well as extend is extending change notifier. And you have an animated builder here. Now, this is an interesting little point. As Simon pointed out to me, an animation builder does not really take an animation. This is a lie. Okay, it lies. Don't trust it. What the animation builder takes is a listenable. It does not have to be an animation. And a form of listenable is a change notifier. So anything you extend 
or I'm sorry, anything you make that does extend change notifier is going to be able to be used as the animation of an animation builder. And when it changes, that's going to cause the animation builder to change to the next frame with the update. That's all an animation builder really is. It's just that your animation ticker keeps feeding it ticks. So that's one way to do it. Then you could use Riverpod or Provider, Flutter Riverpod. You could use Block. You could use Flutter Block. These are all great systems. They are very well maintained. Uh, there are enough people and enough corporations using them that they're always going to be maintained. And, uh, but there is one thing to be aware of. Okay. You want to avoid these huge, complicated packages that say they're going to do everything for you. Okay. It, it's going to be the greatest thing you have ever seen. And it's going to make everything so easy. And, 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 you know, there, there's not a widget left that hasn't been replaced. Let me tell you something. If you make a fintech app, financial technology, you make an app for fintech and suddenly regulations change. Okay, now it needs to be updated and say Flutter updates, the Flutter SDK updates. And this is a breaking change. You have this monstrosity package that is maintained by a bunch of different people. But nobody's working on that particular little area. And you have to remember this is maintained by volunteers. Okay, they're not going to stop their day job to come running because you have a problem. The less you depend on other people's packages, the better off you're going to be. All right. This is why when people do things like they're using Riverpod, they're not orchestrating everything in their app around Riverpod. They're only using it for the state management notifications. And if you really got stuck, you could go and refactor that right into change notifiers and either provider or change notifiers and animated builders. It's, it would take a little time, but you wouldn't have to tear your app completely apart and rebuild it the way you would have to if anything went wrong with one of these packages that says, we're going to do everything for you and make it super easy. Don't do that, really. But when you're doing things yourself, sometimes, well, sometimes you get stuck. Well, there are lots of places in Flutter where we can get help. All right. There is a Gitter for those of you who are really old-fashioned and like to torture yourself. If you go to flutter.dev in the community page, you will see their official Gitter. Now, a Gitter is a chat that comes with every GitHub repo. Okay, what's the deal? Well, a Gitter is single-threaded. There are no channels. There's just one chat. Now, pick any subject. Okay, you get in there with 6,000 other people. This thing is moving so fast. And you never know, sometimes unless somebody asks you properly, you don't know who they're replying to. You don't know what the topic of the next question is going to be. There's no organization. There's just this flow. It was great when Flutter first started. There were only about 300 of us in there, but it has um, grown. That's one way to put it. It has grown. So there's also the Flutter Dev Google Group. Now, this is an excellent place. We used to see people from the team on there all the time. I'm not sure how much time they still have, but I'm certain that they still pop in once in a while. And when I say people on the team, I'm even talking about Eric Seidel, okay, lead engineer. There is also Reddit. So please remember, this is not Flutter Reddit. This is Flutter Dev Reddit. That's a great one. Also, the Flutter community publication on Medium has over a thousand articles. 
was 1200 last time I looked, which was last year. I help uh, every once in a while over there, but I don't really look at the totals very often. In addition to that, there is also the Flutter team's own medium. So Flutter community and the Flutter team are not the same thing. Uh, there is a Flutter community page on Facebook. I am guilty of not maintaining that very well. My apologies. I should get on that. And then if you go to Twitter, there's the Flutter hashtag. And the official is, of course, at Flutter Dev. And you can look at my own page and see who I'm following. Then if you go to Flutter Community YouTube, there is a live feed almost every Wednesday. We're skipping today. Uh, and it's open Q&A, which sometimes feels like open season on the hosts. Um, you never know what you're going to get shot with. It's, uh, it's rather interesting. One minute people are asking how to use set state, and the next minute people are asking extremely complicated questions about using platform channels and encryption. <laughs> so, all right. Let's take a quick little look here at the app itself that I wrote for this. As you can see, we're going to start here with the root of all evil, which is my app. Now we cruise through my app and we're going to skip this for just a moment because we're going to come down here to app state, extend state. We're going to create a theme manager that handles the theme changes. Now, one thing to know about a theme manager is it's extending change notifier. So it will send out changes. This is going to, this has an empty constructor. It's going to initialize by going theme data from, and then we're going to hand it a color and it's going to create a whole theme around this. Now, what color are we going to hand it? Well, we actually have to hand it a whole color scheme. I'm sorry, but the color scheme is created by just handing it a seed which is color purple, and then it does everything else for us. And yes, this is doing a lot of wonderful things for us, but it's not a package. It's just part of Flutter. So if we're going to change the theme, then we can pass in a different theme, which we have some handy-dandy pre-made ready themes right here. Next, we get a little silly. Okay, If we call use a random theme, we're going to random out four values up to 256. Then we're going to create another theme data from a color scheme from a seed. And for that seed, we're going to create a color from the RBG that we just randomed right here. So in other words, we have no idea what we're going to get. But, you know, that's not that unusual. Okay, so we also create instances of person and car. Now, if you take a look, we come up here to the person or car. These are the ones that we're going to be accessing that way. Also, there is the theme manager right here. I'm sorry. This is the function call. It's going to return a theme manager. It's static, so we can call it from anywhere. It needs a context, as we said. We're going to call it. We're going to return the state, and what we're going to do is we're going to look in the context and we're going to crawl up the tree until we find the nearest app state. Okay, so that's what we're going to call state. And then we're going to look in that state to find the theme manager, which is right here. That's the one that we declared. And right there is where we instantiated it. So now we get down into the animated builder. And what this is going to do is it's going to look at the theme manager, which as you saw extends change notifier. And anytime this changes, we're going to rebuild material app. And then for a theme, we're going to look at the theme manager variable and we're going to use whatever the current theme data is. And I already showed you how that might change. So next we build home. Let's take a look here. We get down in here and we need a theme manager on this to be able to use for the UI. So we're going to go the old, and go get my app theme manager of context. We're not doing anything with it yet. We're just making sure that it's ready to go. And this right here is just a little more readable. 
So we get down in here, and I'm also going to show you the less readable way to do things. Okay, when we go and get the person's name, we're going to use string interpolation. We're going to go to my app. We're going to call the current person function, which takes a context, and we're going to go get the name. And then we're going to see what they're driving. So we're going to go up to my app. We're going to call the current car of context and the type of car. So we're going to say that this is the person's name and this is what they're driving. We're going to show this font in a set title large, which is Material Design 3 compliant. And we're going to find that in the theme, which has enough method, which takes a context, which will return a text theme. And we're going to use the title large parameter, or I'm sorry, title large member that is within that text theme. Is this getting redundant yet? Probably. Now, when we click one of these buttons, this is for the readability. Remember, we created a theme manager. So you could just as easily put this in that spot. But we are going to call the change theme function of the theme manager. And that's going to need a new theme data. And we're going to call that with the theme manager blue. Hey, there we go which is one of our handy pre-made ones. Okay, easy enough, right? Right. Now, what we will do then, after calling that, we're going to change the name and we're going to change the car. Well, these do the same thing. What they're going to do is they're going to call a random next int 5, and it's going to go to a list of names and of car names. That's all. And it's going to return those. And it will update. Now there's a blue one. In this one, we're going to use red. In this one, we're going to use green. And in this one, we're, I don't know, we're going to be brave. So we will go and use our little random there. And that really is pretty much it. I mean, the person, and I'm sorry, I misspoke earlier, person and car do not extend change notifier. Only theme does that. But this is really simple. There's a name, there's a list of possible names, and we change the name. Okay, car does the same thing. Literally the same exact thing. Okay, I have an extra comma here. There, now they look the same. If we take a look at the neon style button, this is a little interesting thing that uh, someone wanted off of Stack Overflow, so I kept it. This basically ha makes a glow. If the background is dark, it'll have a black background. If not, it'll have a, a white background. Um, that is necessary because of the way it works. The shadow size is how much spill there's going to be. There's a text, there's a color for the whole thing, and then there's a callback. It's really not that complicated. It's just an inkwell takes callback. The decorated box is going to have a background color, depending on whether or not the background you're putting this whole thing on is dark. Um, just another decorated box that uses the color. There's the shadow. You know, it's really not that big a deal. So, what in the world does this all end up looking like? Well... This could get interesting because I have not tested how this is going to look once I get it on camera. Um, this right here, oh boy. Huh, it's not too bad. This is a Windows app. This was created for Windows. Oh, and that's me dragging it around. So it starts out with purple. And we can take it to blue. And the name of the person is Min. They drive a Ford. Okay. Still Min drives a Kia. Min has a lot of cars. Min has a lot of cars. And don't forget, folks, RNG isn't. See? Aha! There's somebody else, finally. Okay. And they're all driving Fords now. No, just kidding. 
And as you can see, the RNG is changing it all over the place. The reason the text is changing size somewhat is because it's in a fitted box. And so if the name gets long enough, the text is going to adjust its size. But that's really all it does. And to show you one last thing real quick, um, the way the uh, state management on this was done was by simply making this a change notifier. Change notifier is part of Flutter. It is not actually part of Riverpod or provider. So you can use a change notifier anywhere. And if we go into my app, again, we use the animated builder. The change notifier feeds it changes, which triggers the animated builder, which rebuilds with the new theme. Not much to it. Um, now, there is one question here that's how to correctly handle build context after calling show dialog or show modal bottom sheet. I'm not quite sure uh, exactly what you're trying to do there. And also, um, one other thing, please keep in mind, really, the talk is about how to use dot of context to reach things. But, you know, I, I at least wanted to address your question so that you know I'm not ignoring it. But really, we would need more information about what you're expecting when you say correctly handle. Um, yeah, that's a little confusing. So with that... Uh, I'm pretty much done. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Scott. That is fabulous explanation about the off context. And uh, I can summarize this question like the how can I best access the build context of nested widget from the child widget? Uh, maybe this the, this question is going to answer for the same one. Well, the, the context of the child widget is going to have all the information of the context of the parent widget plus some. Every time mm -hmm. you create another widget under another one, it creates a new build context, but it's adding information, which another key thing to know, if you have a widget and it creates a build context, and then you do things within that build function, you cannot reach into the context and get the results of that because the context is not going to show those changes until you create a new one. There are a couple of ways you can do that. You can create a builder within your tree, or you can just go into another new widget, which will then create a new context. But there are some times when you are doing changes, especially with a stateful widget, and then you think you're going to be able to get those in the context and you can't. And the reason is you probably did a few things in an it state and you expected them to show up and they're not going to show up because an it state takes the existing context, which means it's already been created and the things you change are not going to show up until the next one. But just about anything uh, in a nested situation, if you're deeper down, you should be able to reach information that's higher up. That's, what looking for the uh, my app state is, or I'm sorry, yeah, my app state or app state is all about. Okay, right. Here we have the another question. That what do you think about state management solution that hide the build context from the user? Would not go near. Would not go near, because there are so many things in the context that we need. How else are you going to get your text sizes that you know are compliant with Material Design 3? How else are you sure that your primary, okay, that your primary color and what did they change it to? It's no longer secondary color. It's, um, oh, I can't remember. It's it's a little bit deeper in the, te in the uh, color scheme. But there is a secondary or an accent color. Okay. How do you know what those are going to be? How do you know what the card color shade 
of a color is actually supposed to be for proper contrast if you don't reach into the theme object. And the way you get to the theme object is through the context. If somebody's hiding all that from me, I am trying to write an app with both hands tied behind my back. I, I wouldn't do it. Sure, sure. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Scott. As you're you're the creator and the host in the hum hum day question and answer, and here you explain today the off context and clear all the doubts regarding that. Really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you all for having me. Yeah. I see an out of hell. Sorry. I said I see an out of hell in the background here. I have the mm -hmm. gentleman there who's waiting. Yeah, <laughs> our next. Sorry, that, that's that's how you pronounce. That's how you pronounce his name, actually. Arigen, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah. but yep. With that, I yeah, will get out of the way. And you all have a yeah. great day. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Okay, guys, let's move forward. Our next topic is knowing the Flutter forest. We will start walking inside the Flutter widget tree to understand how it communicates between the widgets. And we will learn a bit, little bit more in deep about the elements and the render object. So you all can follow how smart the rebuilds are and how they help us when we are walking. Please welcome to Argel on stage, please. Hi. Hi, hi. Can you, can you hear me good? How are you doing? I'm good. Yeah, thank yeah. You. Perfect. Thank you for thank you for having me. Oh yeah. I, yeah. How I'm, are you doing? I'm good. Uh, I start today suddenly to get a, my my throat a little bit sore. I don't know why. I haven't done it differently, but yeah, I'm here and I'm happy to be here. So let's let's uh, try to do this the yeah. best we could. Yeah, sure, sure. Just for audience, Argel is a Flutter and Dart GD, a lead software engineer at Newbank, and he is the Brazilian Zuzu practitioner and lovely father, and I hope perfect husband. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, all all is your stage, Argel. Please go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Yogita. So, uh, I don't know. Can, can you help me with yes with the with the with the slides? um this is a a really hard topic so i decide to do it this way i'm gonna do my best to give you a proper idea uh and i do it like this i decide not to go deeper not to try to do this perfect uh sometimes people say or reach out to me or ask me hey I want to do a, a, a presentation. I'm going to be a speaker, but I'm so afraid to make mistakes when I'm on stage. So let's try to embrace mistakes. Let's try to, to learn from them. And let's look how it goes. So why this is called Flutter Forest, right? As Yogita says already, my name is Argel Bejarano. I'm from Mexico. I'm a lead software engineer at Nubank. Uh, I have been here for almost a year, and I have been enjoying way too much. <laughs> so. Um, what we're trying to solve with this, uh, we have many questions. I don't know if you already know how many trees are in Flutter, how many of these are being used all together to solve a solution, right? Uh, which are the tasks that each one of those are doing? Um, what is important to know about them in each step, why they are going to be, how they work, what the tasks they have, how they communicate, more like how they communicate is related to, um, which task one of those do and which task one of them has and how this is gonna be a, a playful uh, or a game for, for the building on the screen, right? So it could be um, when this decision, when I need to go and create the more profoundly or more in deep into these trees and know how they work, okay? So this is the easy one. And also using this also image, for the two dashes, there are three widgets, okay? There are three widgets, sorry, three, three trees and, uh, and 
and one of them are the widget trees. Okay, the widget is one of them. So let's go move forward. Nothing less to say, like we are in Flutter tree and there are three widgets. I I just find kind of I find kind of funny to say it like that. So what are the trees, right? So we have the widget tree, we have the element tree, you have the render render object tree. But what this means, right? So the widget tree is just describe the configuration for an element. Okay, so it's a widget. It has a configuration for an element. So this moves us to the element tree. When we are talking about the element tree, we are talking about the instantiation of the widget in a particular location of the tree. So if you want to know this cat in, in which position is it, the one who will know where it is located is will be the element tree. So that's why we have a tree of cats in there. So it's the element tree. And the render object tree is just, okay, it handles size, size, layout, painting, and, and that's it, right? So if you are not old enough to know it, it's Bob Ross, he's an amazing painter, and he has some um, videos in, in TV, and in open TV, and they paint something so way too much beautiful for me in less than an hour. So this is a history lesson for you uh, in there. So, but what happens if we use all these forests, all these trees together, right? The uses, the usage of these trees make it possible to have a fast UI rendering of development. Okay, what this means is that because of the usage of these trees, we are able to have a really um, fast UI, but also it's a performance way to reveal your screen to make changes to help you to do this fast development so as a bad joke i had the coffee but because i i would know that we need this for me is just 11 a.m so i need coffee and because of my throat i also need something to drink so you will see me doing this quite a lot <laughs> um but what are those trees right so it's basically what are those what are, we could do with those trees and, and whatever so everything is a widget right but you know what's a widget we can find this in a, in a definition so did you know that widget is an immutable so the widget is immutable tree yeah it, it 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 may sound weird for you because you see the widgets that are constantly changing and i seen this widget and i push a button a button and then it's changed but actually it's not what is happening underneath and that's i want to make clear that the widget is an immutable description part of the user interface okay so what we mean with this is like that it's immutable let's let's keep uh let's keep this this moving and, and we're going to talk about and describe the configuration in a previous uh slide so let's learn a little bit more about element we, we talk about elements so let's let's take a look and and get what's an element right the element is the mutable part okay the, the elements are the mutable part of the flutter forest or well of this flood forest the way the trees happening this part is the one it's changed is what it managed the updating and changing the ui and controls everything just to make a definition to have a couple of lines where we could take um, from the, for this talk is the element are the ones managing the life cycle of the widget. That's what is going on element. It's going to be taking uh, and the man is going to be the manager for the life cycle. We know we have a life cycle for the app. We know we a life cycle for the widget. And now we have a life cycle is being done in the element. Okay, we will go deeper in a few slides ahead so don't just beg with me here uh render all your tree this is the artistic artistic section okay that's why i use a painter bob ross um we're gonna talk a little bit um but let's rephrase a little bit this tree will take care of the sizing layout and painting what this means right it means that the render object is the one who is going to take the job of layout and painting your UI. So if something is being painted in your UI, is not being taken care of by the neither widgets or 
elements. These are not taking care of what is gonna be painted on your screen, right? So just for you to know, when you are painting something, you're actually using the render object to take care of this situation, okay? So this is the screenshot type. type. So this is kind of a summary for every everything before. And if you wanna take one picture for a slides, because I, I do it on a regular basis. I'm hearing someone and it's something relevant for me and I just screenshot and save it for later. So we have a widget three that describes that configuration for an element. And this one, the element, is an instantiation of the widget in a particular location and where the mutability lives in our forest or in the trees, right? We, was, we must never forget that every tree in our forest will have a different layout, size, and rendering, and that the render object tree will take care about this painting. It could be kind of a summary, let's say it has a lot of layers in between you, you could Take a look into that deeper and go there and review a lot of videos. We could find a video from like 2.5 hours from an, an awesome dev that is creating and tell you how to create your own render objects and take it to the widget and want to paint and everything about that. But for now, for this conversation, remember we're in, a, in the junior track. So what um, one of the main tasks for me over this conversation and as I always say in all my talks, I'm going to solve some issues, solve some questions, and give you some knowledge about trees and what of each one of them do, but also when I give you more doubts. So uh, you can go back to your computer and take a look and go deeper and review this video from this guy who is doing this thing or whatever. So that's what I want to hear. So you get some answers and you look for more questions to have the next the next time to another pair of people, another speaker, to me later in the future. So this is gonna be kind of an easy conversation just for you to get the information and look, look forward for more details. So in a nutshell, the last slide could be a summary, but just saying that is not good enough. At least it's not good enough for me. I think just saying that and give you, okay, that's it, this, do that, and whatever is it's not good enough. So just want to tell you how it works, right? So we can see in here, we have a widget, element, render object. So this is kind of um, um, the way it's being named. There's a foo, foo element, and render foo. You will find this uh, pattern in all the, in the, all the, in the code base, if you go to Flutter and you read the code, you will have, let's say, I don't have the names, or just have, we have a container, a container element, a render, a render container. I, I Right now, I'm not sure about the name. I'm just saying that it's like a, a way, a pattern that you will find and you will understood better how is, this is gonna be working, right? So, but how it works. When Flutter draws your UI, it doesn't look like the widget tree. This was what I just told you back a few minutes back. Is the render object the one, uh, the render object tree, the one is being in control. So yes, the sizing layout and painting will be the be the one is being taken care of for that render object tree, not the widget. The widget will be immutable and will be interchangeable. You will be changing this whole thing. This screen is another screen. If you want to, you can kind of get a screenshot if you if you wish. So remember that with your tree is to configure is a configuration. The element tree is the life cycle, and the render object object is our painter, our artistic part of the code. So what do they have? The configuration of widget tree has holds properties and offers the public API. Right, this is the container, the size box, the rotator box, the whatever contain uh, widget that you may think right now. So the life cycle or the element tree is the one that holds a spot in the UI hierarchy, which means that you will know where you live. And for for that, it's when context about uh, relating this conversation to what uh, 
uh, Scott says in the at the last in his talk context that's why it's really important to know where you are at the at, always you need to know where you are right in managed parent child child relationships because of the same thing if you know where you are you know who's your child your child and who is your your parent right um and render object three or the paint it will take care of the size the painting the layout the claim input it will be taking care of everything related on your screen about painting and and, and events so as we said already we have this full full element render full it is kind of a extra detail that if you notice it's pretty similar of those host configuration for a piece of the ui has a public api this is for the widget tree represent an actual piece of the ui this is the element the element tree is the one who represent an actual piece of the ui and it holds the references to manage the tree so what it meant is I have the configuration, but you have a tree. The tree is the one who actually manages everything. And that the widget, it doesn't have anything. It doesn't manage anything. It only holds configuration, okay? So if any any extra information or data will be on the element, not on the widget tree, okay? It will be the element tree where it holds uh, the references and is the actual piece of the UI that knows where you are at that moment. And painting, I mean, I already uh, say this way too many times, size layout painting. It's kind of repet repetitive, but it, this is not an easy, an easy talk. So what I'm trying to do is give you enough information so you can get this and try to process it and review it and maybe this, create your own design language. We'll get this at the end. I will. I didn't add any slide for that. At the last slide, I'm going to talk about which short videos you can have, um, if you can watch, and 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 this uh, design language that it was an amazing video. This from more than a year ago, so we we'll, we will get there in a bit. Just the fun time, okay? How this work? How this actually work? If we are seeing just a text in there, and we have this. Text span is a hello world. Okay, this is what we have. But what will be the next step? How this works on screen? How it moves into the um, into the um, the root of the tree and how it grows and how when it creates which method methods it create it takes to create everything else. So what do you think we move forward? So we had we need to add this into into our uh, to our run app, we have the run app. It's just a void. They're receiving a widget, and we are going to be sending a text, right? So maybe this this in here is um, something that you have seen before. Ensure initialize. Sometimes we need to do this to be able to run some stuff like Firebase or or kind of those uh, kind of packages. Not all of this, and not always we need to declare directly in our code, but sometimes it's needed. And then we attach the app. And what we are attaching, a rich text, okay? This will place our widget on a root level. And we will have the widget and we will have the rich text. When this happens, then a render object element is gonna be created. Be careful with this because it says render object, but it's actually talking about the element. Render object element is the name if you see in <coughs> in here this is render object element okay it says leave if you notice notice in here is a leave render object element this is leave render object widget render object widget and in here is going to be creating an element it creates an element it's going to be a leave render object element because this is a forest we are talking about trees and all trees had Leaves. Where's the leaf is the last part. It will it will not have um a child. Okay, that's why is if we look back, if we go back, we notice there is a, a rich text, read the text, and that's it. It doesn't have a child itself, it just have properties, it have information. So it's a leaf, and you will find many of these different. I wouldn't I 
didn't talk, it will be a good idea to put more details because it could be confusing. We have a leave a rendered object widget. You have a single rendered object. Uh, you have a, a mold, uh, how it called? Because it's, if it's a child, if it's a, a children, so it will have one child, more than one, or it will be the end widget. It creates, it calls a different set of, of render object elements and widgets. So these types, you can take a look into your preferred widget. We all have one of those. We all have this preferred widget. And you can go there deeper and you will find how it was implemented. You can take a look. That's the beauty of an open source in the from Flutter that you can actually go there and take a look, a deeper look into what is being done. So you will, will be able to notice how a column is being built. And a column will not use a leaf render object widget. It would use, a, I think, a multi multi child or a, a something like that. I can't remember the name right now. But as I told you, I don't want to get, I don't want to confuse you right now. as well just to give you information in there. So this is the second tree. If you notice, we have a render um, uh, uh, widget tree with the rich text widget. We have an element that is called leaf render object element, but we is, we are still waiting for the render object. So now I'll give you the render object, okay? So if you can look at that exact place with in the third line where it says widget that create render object, okay? And it runs into here. It has a parent element, it has a new slot, and it, this is render, Paragraph, okay. Why a render paragraph? Because it's a text. It's a rich text. It's something. It's a paragraph. So it will use. It will be the, a type of paragraph. Paragraph. Um, the same way it could be another kind of render, as uh, render box, uh, render. I couldn't remember another ones right now. It's render box is the one that pops into my mind. But it could be all the properties that a paragraph could have and we know these properties are being held by the element the one should get this information and manage everything is being sent to um to the create render object that it do is used and in here is created and it takes the text the alignment direction soft wrap overflow text scale factor max line and locale Okay, now we have a full, a full set, uh, a small forest for this, for this, what we are seeing on screen. So for us, it will be a hello world text in the screen, okay? And only that, and it's been using all of this. But we, we might think, okay, um, maybe this is kind of way too much, right? Uh, just for one thing, why we need to create all of these, we need to have a, a widget, an element, a render object. Why well, we don't create only one thing and, and that's it. And we, so the cost of this could be high, but what, we're gonna keep moving in here. And there were three, right? And we will see this, but what happens if we run it twice the run app? We had a main and it will do a run app and then we're gonna run the run app again. We can do this. Uh, this is allowed in Flutter. It doesn't make any sense, but it's allowed. Uh, so let's let's keep moving, and now we will see that even it's being run "Hello World." Then <coughs> we have "Hello Shanghai" is the second one. Is the one being shown, right? So our trees grow, and it creates the you uh, all the information that we need to the render object, to all the elements, and then the widget. But what happens and why do we need this kind of heavy con uh, construction, this heavy build for these three trees? So if we move forward, we will see we have a forest and we have the whole, the last image that we saw, the one in the back is the rich text. that says, oh, hello world. So the leaf render object element, the render paragraph. And now we're gonna be using another widget, right? So it says, okay, I'm a new widget, and now my text says "Hello, Changai." I get these images from a converse, uh, uh, call, a really old video 
and it was they were in China, so Shanghai is that way in Shanghai, and so if we if we move into the widget, then what happens, right? I am having a new widget. This new widget is being on top of the other. So what is going on is we would ask, can I update? So I am the widget, I am the screen and I asking you, can I update? And it sets you an old widget and the new widget. After this is being done, uh, you will you will be able to to verify two things. And this is why it's really important to know the usage of the keys in Flutter. Okay. If you so if you, you can see in here run type. So if it's a container and a container and is a and is a different key, it will it will be at rebuild, right? It will uh, help you to rebuild something. In here, it will work like that, but if you have a list and you want to remove an item from the list and you do not send the key for that element, it will not be updated. You will see the same thing on screen, okay? Until you force the update and all the rebuild, but it, this will not work. That's why the keys are important. I am saying this really, really, really too fast, but I think, um, a year ago, uh, one one good, uh, good friend of mine, Rasmus, he talks about why the keys are important. And also, you might find uh, with the Flutter YouTube channel, uh, Emily Fortuna's video about why keys are important. And this is something that you need to know. And this is relevant because this happens only when you are changing and updating your screen. So, why this is important? Did you now know this is the the same ROM type, but it's different? key, it would be revealed again. If it's the same route, wrong time, it has the same key or if no key, it will not do anything. You will be seeing the same thing on screen. So the element notice that something is going on, right? After it happens, the widget is immutable. So it's been dropped. I don't care about this. I will get, it's gonna be removed, removed and now I'm seeing the new one. And then it's being called and remember the element three, the element section of this, it, it holds the whole properties, the whole information data from there, and it's gonna receiving a new configuration. And this new configuration, it calls a method is called update render object. Okay, when we do this update, we ask this update render object, it actually gets and take care. If you notice we get back to what um, Scott just says, build context. In here, there's a build context. You need the build context even in the deeper section of the tree for the render object, and it will receive a render object. Also, there's a type render paragraph because we are gonna be updating a specific type, right? And it gets everything. And now the next time the render object is being asked, it will repaint, and now if you see uh, this image, you will notice that you have the render paragraph, hello guy, that you receive in the widget. If you notice, the flow is going to there, but the change in the screen is not going to happen until this communication is being built. This is getting the element, get the changes, and notifies the render object to the new properties and this is the one that's going to take care only to change the ui it will not make another decision it will at this point just think like the one is going to be painting your ui it doesn't hold anything else you get it from the elements okay and that will be kind of the the end of of the of these trees so if we are working about trees we will have a widget element render object the first one is immutable and only holds configuration the second one is an element it holds um more the all the position like where you are living in the tree that's the really it's really important to know where in part and which is which one is your parent which one is your children if you are the end one like a leaf element and all of this is being called in in the element tree 
and you have the render object, which is the one that takes care of every rebuild, every change on your on your um, on your UI on your screen. It will be happening because of this render object uh, updating. That's called update render object, and it will send the information. So this uh, this is the last um, the last uh, slide. The one is just my contact. But before I go in, I'm gonna give you um there is a and the float flutter channel it is a talk that was done in Shanghai by Matt and I, I think it's John Ryan or I forgot the name, but it's a, there are two dev rails. You can look at for them like render objects flutter, it will be right into there. And it's like a 45 minutes, I get a lot of information from there. I try to change the way it's being explained, trying to give you a little extra details. And this is a, um, a really relevant topic and it doesn't matter. It is an old, co an old video. Information is the one. Widgets are being built because this is the core. This is a, a way of perform many changes. If you notice in here, the only element that uh, the only tree that was actually revealed again was the widget tree because it was the same thing it, it doesn't take anything related to render object or element it just connect to the new configuration the element to get the new the new information and send it to the render object so this element the render object are holding everything and revealing only what it is what it's needed and that's part of this uh tree shake that is called like so you don't always are being revealing everything on screen if you don't change anything about a widget this will be the smart section the smart um part of the code that would help you to be more optimal that's why you don't need to actually know about all of this but it's good, it's good for you to know, to go deeper and underst understood better what is going on. This kind of uh, understanding can give you why the context is important. The context moves right the letter, right down the letter and, uh, and gives you this render object connectivity. So everything you know, you will always know where you are because you can know where your context lives. And also, you will know who one is your shi your child your child or your children or your child, or you will know who is your parent in which type you are, and you know why the keys are important, why you have to be doing this or that. Um, there are kind of um, uh, kind of uh, small details in this talk that I that I hopefully you would get them and look more information about them. So just for finish them up, so wrap wrap up. This Flutter uh, and this uh, Nord in the Flutter Europe is another one. And it's a video from like 2.5 hours on how to create your own render object. So that will be amazing if you have time to take a look to them. Hola. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Argel. That is really fabulous uh, session. And I have one question with me. And that is the if the app scales to multiple feature, does any of provider of or Flutter block will work? Um, okay, I think I can give you an answer in there, but I think it was another question for me. It was more related to Scott, but yeah, uh, is the ask of multiple features does provider of Flutter block work? Definitely, uh, Flutter block is. A is you can create huge apps. And you know Felix Angela, the creator of Flutter Block, works for very good vector. It is like a way to go for them. So if you use if you use the very good plea, they create a feature a scalable um, base from the ground so you can grow as big as you want. Uh, provider is really good, if, but if you notice at the beginning, provider was used as a dependency injection package, not exactly as a stash management, stash management. And actually, inside Flutter Block, you will notice the provider is it was used. I don't know, like, I think right now it's not being used, but it was used before. So, if you want to do a big multiple feature app, Flutter Block, River, River Pod, um, there are way too many, but just be sure that these um, these uh, packages 
follow the basic rules and use it only for what you need. Don't try to get a framework inside a framework. A framework. That's what um, Scott was saying. They use something that will solve your life because if someone is stop being this uh, maintained maintainer, everything will stop to work. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And uh, what is the best way to avoid the error that render bo uh, render box was not laid out? C can you repeat because like, it got to cut to for a little avoid, bit? How to avoid the error render box was not laid out? What is the best way? Right now, as I told you, this is a deep, uh, a really deep um, talk. But actually, you right now, if you are working with a container with a uh, size box, uh, uh, I think even, um, yeah, a size box, you will do the render box. And this is being already built into the core of Flutter. You need to be worried about the usage of them. But if you want to create like a design language, as I told you, in the after the last Google I.O. or at the Google I.O. of the last year, it was a video related to design language. It was really a specific behavior for um for a system an old and they all um, app for desktop and they want to keep the ui so the users doesn't oh it has new colors or whatever and but these were not built in florida because it's pretty specific so what is video or this uh you can watch in the video is the creation of a design system using all the render objects and the elements in creating the widgets from the ground. But right now it's not like something is gonna work and you render up it is not. But if you probably maybe miss to add a key and you're trying to make a review and, and you are using the same run type and in and, and the same key and this will not change the screen. That's what you need to be reviewed with this kind of stuff. But it's not like all oh, the the um, re render box element is working, but the render box object box and uh, render box object no it's not it's, it wouldn't work like that if not the core will have an issue and then it will be uh will need um what is called a, like a pr review and actually do something to the core they are their work all, all together it's not like one is going to work in and the other ones is not but it's already built for you this is just to start to getting deeper into flutter i know it was a junior but it was we're more, we, we, believe me, we can go way deeper than this in this um, trees attack. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you so much for uh, your talks, uh, Argil. Thank you so much. Okay, take care. Have a nice evening. Bye bye. bye. Great. So, guys, our next speaker has experience in publishing several apps on App Store and Google Play Store. And today he's going to share his experience with newbies who started their journey with Flutter recently and the experienced developer to make app productive and proficient. Please welcome to Roman. Hi. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello. How are you doing? How are you? How are you? Great. Thank you. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much. The Roman is a Google developer expert at Philips Health System. He's a GDG Northeast mentor and GDG Lawrence organizer and a Google certified cloud architect who loves sharing his knowledge with our Flutter families. So all stage is yours. Please proceed forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, just wanted to say, uh, first of all, thank you to the whole organizing team at Flutter Global Summit 2022. Uh, just wanted to say you've put such an amazing uh, event together. So kudos to you, uh, Yogita, to Anna, everybody, the whole organizing team, uh, all the, all the uh, um, you know, everybody that was part of making this event happen. So thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, our pleasure, please. And I believe I'm sharing my screen already. Uh, I hope uh, you guys can put it in there. But while that happens, I just wanted to say again, welcome everybody. This is the last session of the junior track for today. And thank you, everybody, for sticking all the way through. Uh, my name is Roman Jacquez. Again, I am a Flutter GDE. I am a lead organizer at GDG Lawrence. And also, I'm a Northeast mentor. I uh, just wanted to say I'm really passionate about being here, sharing my knowledge, not only as a Flutter GDE, but also as a Flutter developer myself. 
So uh, my talk is about Flutter productivity tips, which are kind of like tips I've picked up along the way as I've developed applications. I've published dozens of apps, not only uh, in my in my personal time, but also uh, for my company as well at Fit. So I hope you guys enjoy it. You guys can scan the QR code on the lower right corner if you guys want to follow me on Twitter. In that way, we, you can stay in touch with all of these events that I've been putting out uh, for the community. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the session. Um, so I'm just going to put it one more time right there. So you can uh, subscribe and follow me on my YouTube channels. I'm also going to be doing some live Twitch, uh, live coding about Flutter. Uh, you can visit me on my portfolio site where you see some of the apps that I've developed. Uh, and last but not least, you can follow me on Twitter at DR Coders. And also you can scan the QR code on the screen as well. So thank you. Thank you so much. Great. So everybody knows. So we're here because of Flutter. Flutter is an open source UI toolkit supported by Google that allows you to develop amazing, beautiful, natively compiled user interfaces using one single code base, of course, using Dart as a programming language, and you can target multiple uh, platforms with that. Uh, with the latest installment of Flutter, which is Flutter 3, now we're able to target six distinct platforms. And if you count embedded, that makes it seven. So this is a great, compelling reason for those of you who are on the fence, whether you want to jump into Flutter. This is an amazing announcement. So let's start right away. So these are my 10 useful tips for Flutter productivity and learning. Uh, some of you may have seen a previous video that I did on, on these same tips, but I've updated these tips with more uh, uh, updated stuff based on Flutter 3 and also some feedback from the community. So I just wanted to say thank you, everybody, and I hope you enjoyed these tips. Let's try right away. So tip number one, hot reload. I can't stress it enough how hot reload is an amazing feature that, that is part of Flutter that makes it uh, very different from other frameworks out there. So let me just show you real quick how, how uh, what hot reload entails. Let me show you this quick application that I've been developing. So hot reload works by injecting code, source code files, updated source code files, into the Dart virtual machine that is running behind the scenes. Then when the VM knows and picks up all of these changes like fields and the widgets and all the changes that it picks up, then it rebuilds the Flutter tree. So that is the way that uh, the Flutter framework handles it by injecting updated source code files into the Dart VM running behind the scenes. Let me show you real quick. I am running an Android uh, application and uh, an iOS application, the same application, both platforms. If you, for example, make a change and then you type something, let me say, for example, content, something like that, and you save or reload, or uh, let's say you either save or try to uh, perform like a, you hit R on the command line. For example, right now I'm going to hit it. You see that the change uh, is immediately reflected on the user interface. So this is great about the hot reload. So there are three types of hot reload or the, the three types of ways that you can update your UI as you're developing. So it's hot reload, which is you hit R on the command line as your application is running, or when, or you know, depending on how you configured it. But if you hit R, it will reflect and it will just rebuild the UI. If you hit Shift R, it will actually re, that is, this is called a hot restart. So you see, we have hot reload and hot restart. Hot restart actually clears the memory. Let's say if you have anything like a state management solution and you're keeping things in memory, so it will clear that and it will reload your application. And then the third approach is a full restart, meaning it will kill completely the application and then it will just re-bootstrap the application, bringing everything uh, from, from scratch pretty much. So you have to be, uh, be conscious about those three approaches, which are hot reload, uh, hot restart, and full restart. So hot reload is amazing. For those of you who are new or experienced, keep using those. Let's continue. Next tip, use packages. We've stressed it enough in here. Scott said it. Also, Arhel mentioned it earlier. So when you use packages, it's, it's because you don't want to reinvent the wheel and you want to bring your applications to production quicker. But there's a caveat. Some of these packages, again, may be outdated or they may be too bloated. If it's something that you that you know that, uh, for example, like it's something that's going to bring a lot of value to your application, but it's not bloated uh, or it's not like outdated, you should you should use it and then implement it in your application. Otherwise, 
if it's something that you can just do it with just a few widgets, you can roll it out on your own if you can. Not only it allows you to uh, make the ecosystem of packages uh, available for the community bigger, but it also makes you, uh, uh, you know, you can add to the contribution of this community. The way that you can do that is uh, you can either find it through uh, pub.dev, which is the main site for you to find packages that you can imp imp import into your Flutter applications. And Flutter is so good that it also allows you to create your own packages as well. That way you can cr contribute to the ecosystem. So again, some of the suggestions that we've already given to you is you can use packages so that you can make your applications much richer, but not at the expense of making it really slow or outdated. And then it hits you, uh, you know, you, you have like a, uh, some negative consequences later on. For example, the way that you can see which packages are being used in your application, you go to the pub spec that YAML in your project, and you can see, for example, how I'm using the Cupertino icons. I am using the Flutter SVG to import some SVG images, uh, the HTTP packages, and so on, and, for example, like the provider. So these are packages that are already pre-created by the co uh, community, also by Flutter, and you can use them directly into your applications. So tip number two, use packages when needed. Otherwise, you can go and build it yourself if you want to. Great. Threat num uh, tip number, tr number three, so you can use icon fonts. So I love using icon fonts. Why? Because it brings uh, a level of uniqueness to my application. And it makes my applications different from other, from other applications as well. Uh, so if you can see here, there's a lot of icons being used in the application. In this application right here, you can see the icon for like the the weather, you can see the icon for like the, the wind and all of that, all of these icons, you can use them already because they may be either already available to you from the material design uh, package that comes by default in your Flutter application when you create a new application and are provided by Google free of charge. These icons are, are vector-based, meaning they're very high quality, they're vector-based, they have, they're very crisp and they don't have like, a, there's no like pixelation on these widgets because they're really sharp. One of the great things about this is also that icon fonts are very small in size and you can scale them as you wish and they will still maintain the same quality all throughout. So I would encourage you to use the existing icons available in the material, in the material icons package, which you can see that you're actually using it in your application. If you go to the pub spec that YAML, and if you see this property here called users uh, uses material design true, that means this is ensuring that you're using the material icons and you can use them right away into your application. What if you don't want to use the existing icons that are available to you? Well, you can use services like fluttericon.com that you can import your own SVG, like your own vector images, and you can bring them in here and you can build your own custom icons. Uh, you can create them yourself. And then those images that you're going to use in your application will be vector-based, sharp, and small in size, and you can just scale them as you wish. And you will make your application a lot more, uh, a lot more robust, looking more professional, and the UIs will look a lot crisper. So I would suggest using icon fonts, whether the ones from Google or you roll out your own uh, set of icons. So I totally suggest that. Let's proceed. That was tip number three, using icon fonts. Tip number four, use snippets and plugins. So not only you save a lot of keystrokes when you're using snippets and plugins, but it makes you productive. Why? Because you make your code a lot more consistent, uh, you know, and then you, you can provide a lot more uh, structure in your application. For example, if you want to create a new class, not only, like I mentioned, it saves you time. For example, I'm just going to create like a new file and say, you know, sample widget.dart. Let's say instead of you uh, making it very error prone by creating your own class and all of that, you can actually use plugins that are already and snippets that are provided by the community. For example, if you want to create a stateful widget or a stateless widget, you can just use, for example, like this this uh, snippet uh, package uh, from Flutter that allows you to, cre to create very quickly, you know, a state uh, stateless widget, something like that. If you want to create another one, all you have to do is just type ahead, like the beginning parts of the, of the word, and then it auto-completes, and then you create like multiple widgets like that in a very systematic, very programmatic, automated way. You can also use some of the plugins and snippets already available to you from Flutter and Dart. Let's say this same widget, you want to make it into a, for example, convert it to a stateful widget or something like that. 
You could also do that. You know, you can import the particular packages, but then this one, you can make it into a stateful widget. You can just use the same uh, components that you have in there. Also, let's say if while creating your widget tree, as opposed to you having to type it all, all of that, you can use some of the existing ones to create like, you know, wrapping it inside a builder, wrapping it inside a column. Uh, you know, you can create widgets, uh, widget trees like that, and then it makes it very automated, very less error prone, and then you kind of continue kind of like a pattern, and then it gives you, uh, you know, better, uh, you know, code quality and all of that. So I would definitely recommend you guys doing that, leveraging um, the existing plugins that are already out there. So you can do, uh, follow this tip, which is using snippets and plugins as the tip number four. Tip number five, this is more of a like a suggestion to you and also like a like a, some guidance. So try to avoid over engineering your applications. So complexity, this is a saying that I came up with. So I say complexity blocks productivity, which kills creativity. Why? D don't go by the hype. This is like my advice number one. And simple doesn't mean weak, but complex doesn't mean strong either. So you can you can still implement like a you know a clean architecture for your application, but without making something very convoluted or very complex. I've seen, for example, like Hello World applications using the block pattern or using like Flutter Redux. If your application can live even with a stateful widget and just triggering widget reveals using a set state method, you can also do that. No, no, nothing tells you that just because you uh, you can implement clean architecture by using very good patterns without making it too complex. So that's one of the key things that I always emphasize. The point is to delight your users with great experiences because that's what Flutter is built for, as opposed to uh, you know uh, bragging about how complex your application is. Your users don't care how complex your application is. They care that it performs well, that it looks good, and they let them do the bragging for you. So again, that's that's one of the things that I, I suggest. Like you know, it also in the future it will allow you to make your application more maintainable and also uh, uh you know very maintainable, scalable, and even future proof it. So for you, I always recommend avoid or over engineering the application. Make sure that you have your uh, application very well structured. Whether you're using like a feature based approach or you can use it like a, a folder based approach, it all depends. But at least so that you can keep like a very good structure. For example, like in here, you see that I'm using like the provider package. Uh, you see that my application is uh, divided into like services, widgets, pages, and all of that. And it's very simple. So you don't have to make something very complex just for the sake of making it complex. So try avoiding over-engineering your applications as like a rule of thumb. Tip number six, small widgets over helper methods. Because this is where Flutter shines. And we've seen it in videos out there where, where you know that Flutter, this is the, the crown jewel of Flutter, is the way that it builds widget trees. So usually a widget, small widgets are better than a helper method. Some people may see may see it harmless, like creating a helper method that generates a whole structure for them. But what they don't know is that underneath the scenes, you're actually bloating the build method by making it very large, even though if you split the distribution of your widgets in, uh, uh, you know, to kind of like helper methods as opposed to small widgets, small widgets are better because they have their own life cycle. And the updates are concentrated and encapsulated on a single widget, as opposed to you making a very large uh, build method that will rebuild the whole application, as opposed to just concentrating the changes to that single widget. For example, in this application that I just built, if you can see right here, all these elements in the application are all separate widgets. For example, this little windmill, that is a separate widget that only handles that animation within itself. The trees are a separate widget. This whole container that provides like the, the air, air content and air quality information that performs even like uh, um, like restful calls is also a separate widget. The, the clouds are widgets. The little sun is a widget. All of that is a widget. Why? Because each widget, you know, in, in this particular case, I'm implementing a single responsibility sim uh, principle. Uh, so every widget performs its own updates and don't affect the whole application, making it performant at the same time. So uh, to you, I recommend definitely using uh, smaller widgets as opposed to helper methods. Nothing wrong with helper methods, but make sure that you use them appropriately. But they're kind of like frowned upon 
but leverage what Flutter is really good at, which is building Flutter uh, uh, widget trees. The key always for you, for those of you who are starting right now in Flutter, the key is to always have something in mind that everything in Flutter is a widget. Everything in Flutter is a widget. Repeat it to yourself. Everything in Flutter is a widget. If you live by this mantra, you will know how easy it is to understand how Flutter works, the inner workings of it. That way you can be a very productive uh, developer in the future. So just keep that in mind all the time. Let's proceed. Tip number seven, test on physical devices. There's no way uh, around this. Eventually your users will have to consume your applications on the physical devices. Nothing wrong with you using your emulators for testing your application and developing your application, but eventually you need to deploy it on physical devices. Even though if you see uh, on my screen, for example, uh, if you see on my screen, like these two uh, 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 windows where you see those two phones, these are the actual applications right here. So I am actually running on a physical device, but I'm using a tool called uh, Visor that actually just projects my screen. And then it allows me to actually test the application in real time, but using my screen. So I use my screen, but I connect to physical devices and then you can test the application because eventually this is where uh, ultimately your consumers will uh, will uh, you know consume your application. You can definitely, of course, uh, uh, you know, try to find ways that you can get your hands on physical devices like low end um, Android devices and whatnot, borrowing a device from a friend. But eventually you need to test it on physical devices because that is the ultimate medium on which your users will consume your Flutter applications. So tip number seven, test on physical devices. Tip number eight, this is one of my favorite ones, which is using the Flutter developer tools. I updated this one precisely because of Flutter 3. Flutter 3 now brings an amazing set of uh, new features for Flutter developer tools. Uh, now updated for Flutter 3, more better performance, a better network tab, and also something really cool that I'm gonna that I'm about to show you right now. So the way that you can access, of course, the developer tools, you can even use it. Uh, for example, like here in the in the in here in the in the terminal, you can actually see like the debugger, and you can just grab one of these links that it gives you like the Flutter developer tools debugger page because it is a web based. Uh, tool, you can just open up a new browser and you can just go and navigate to that URL that is provided to you. And you can see the performance. You can measure the performance of your application. You can actually take a look at the network tab. You can see a lot of cool things to manage the performance and actually achieve those 60 frames per second that are that is promised by the Flutter framework. Let me show you something really cool that was introduced in Flutter 3. If you go to the performance tab right up here, here, there is a new button called Enhanced Tracing. So if you, if you go here to Enhanced Tracing, there will be a capability that will allow you to actually enable tr to track three very important aspects of your application, widget builds, layouts, and track paints. So not only you will see the performance of how your widgets paint, how they perform the layout, and how they build on top of the same the, the same performance uh, performance information that the Flutter developer tools collects for you. Also, you can take a look at a more improved network tab. This is the network tab, uh, like how, how you can improve it. It's pretty cool. You can you can definitely see like a lot of cool things. Right now, it's just disconnected, but definitely you can see more of that once you uh, like build your application and all that. I love it because you can manage all those things uh, and you can track like all your uh, all your endpoints and all of that. That's amazing. So please use more the Flutter developer tools and those new features that are, that are available to you. Let's go to the next one. Tip number nine, again, more of another type of some guidance and some, uh, and some uh, suggestions and like advices to you as developers. So start simple and small. Uh, Mangir does mention also that this earlier. So you wanna actually try not to tackle like a, a Facebook application or a Twitter application. You want to start simple. You want to build uh, like a small application, put it out there in front of your users, and then you get feedback. But then you apply like an incremental, uh, you apply incremental progress to your application with an iterative approach. That way you put your application in front of your users uh, the quickest and you 
uh, get out to market as fast as possible. Then you get uh, feedback from your users and then you iterate over those features and make it much better as you make progress in your application. For example, like this application that I that I uh, that I just created in here, like it's pretty simple. I like it, uh, but then it's something that I can just make uh, again, like I said, available to people right now. I can just publish it. Something simple. Then I get feedback from users. They tell me maybe what other features they might want to add. Let's say I'm adding like a weather a little widget. I have like an air quality type of widget, but maybe they they want me to add authentication. But at least I put something out there. I get more experience as a Flutter developer. I become a published web de uh, a Flutter developer uh, and for all the multiple platforms that Flutter can provide. Like I mentioned, web, mobile, desktop, embedded. In that way, it, I, I get more feedback from my users. So totally suggest that. Start simple, start small, and make iterative uh, approach. And last but not least, which is again, no shortcuts for this one. And this is something that people ask me a lot. Like, how do I become like a really good Flutter developer? The best tip is to build, build, build. You try to get your hands on any project, anything that you're passionate about. Uh, you know, you can make it into a small application. Building Flutter applications is what makes you best at Flutter. Uh, you, of course, you can watch videos, you can follow tutorials, but then don't leave it at uh, up to that. And then just don't just let your GitHub repos collect dust on GitHub or in your local machine. Try to just make something small, put it out there, like I mentioned earlier, but build, build web applications, build desktop applications, mobile applications, anything, because Flutter allows you to do that. The best way to learn Flutter today is by building. There's no other way around that. For those of you, again, who are starting now, another suggestion is to focus on, on like building layouts and widgets. That way, you know, kind of like the way that our hell was mentioning earlier, learn about the widget trees and, and the inner workings of that. That way you can learn more how to build UIs. Um, you can see like UIs like this, and then you may find it like really daunting, but it's, it's, it's really simple when you split it to something like that. It's nothing more than just an arranged set of of you know widgets and components that come together to make a full application. So don't feel that it's like really daunting or really hard. You just go out there and make applications. Try to make your apps, of course, stand out from the rest. Challenge yourself, uh, but without again compromising quality. Uh, and of course, uh, always listening to your users because they are the ones who ultimately will be using your applications and giving you feedback on those applications. Other things that some people overlook as far as like when they're building applications, like, yeah, I'm going to build, uh, I'm going to add the block pattern to that. I'm going to add a DIO or this or that. But there are other aspects of applications that people overlook that make it pop and make it successful. The, the iconography, like I mentioned, the imagery using, using colors and making it very minimalist as opposed to making it very convoluted, very hard, very hard to use just for the, 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 the sake of adding a bunch of features. So these are some of the things that you definitely need to look into as like an additional set of things that you can add to your application to bring value to it. And this is just a small teaser for an upcoming event that I'll be doing only for advanced Flutter developers. I'm just going to leave it there for a few more seconds because I want you guys to join that. I'm going to be dissecting some of these. Like, uh, I'm also going to be, I'm going to be giving love to you guys, the advanced Flutter developers. Today, I'm catering to you guys, the beginner, uh, intermediate, and advanced developers. But we're going to be doing really uh, something really cool, amazing events for advanced Flutter developers. That's just a little preview of some of the things that I'll be dissecting. So stay tuned for that. Follow me so that you can see uh, some of those upcoming events. These are some resources, again, for you uh, to pick up on if you want to uh, increase your knowledge on Flutter and you want to be become better at that. Uh, again, the Flutter uh, Widget of the Week series, that's an amazing resource that you can use. My blog and my portfolio site, you can see a bunch of code labs that I've created for all of you. Uh, and of course, the pub.dev and other resources that you can use, not only for you who's beginning, but you who's, uh, you know, who's a seasoned developer and want to continue increasing your skills and make yourself better. Uh, with that, I just I just wanted to put my contacts again one more time. Thank you so much for letting me be part of this event. I know that I'm the last one uh, in this whole series, but I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. On behalf of the other speakers uh, ahead of me, thank you so much for everybody joining, for sticking all the way through. 
And thank you again for being a Flutter uh, uh, you know, a fan and enthusiast. So thank you so much. Uh, just wanted to open up to maybe a few questions if anybody have, or otherwise, uh, just want to say thank you one more time. Thank you, Roman. We have lots of questions for you. Here is the first question. What are the drawbacks we can experience using packages? Perhaps some use cases where using packages is not advised. Very good question. Thank you so much. Whoever asked the question, that is an amazing question. One of the drawbacks of using packages, you have to take a look at the author of the package, how well maintained it is. You heard uh, Scott mention it as well. Like how well is maintained, how updated it is. If it's something that brings, uh, like makes your application bigger and bloated uh, and doesn't bring that much value, then don't use it. If it's something that you can even tackle by yourself, by creating a, a, a widget that does that, you can definitely do that. If, you, if you're really torn about using it or you don't have any other way of, of how to tackle that issue that you have to bring that package, then you have to make some compromises. But um, one of the use cases is if you can do it and is it doesn't take you too long, doesn't derail you from your goals, go ahead and do it. Why? Because it will make you also uh, understand the inner workings of your application. You are the maintainer of that application. And then you understand the inner workings of it. And then at the same time, you're learning more on how to build packages, on how to uh, you know be a Flutter developer and even contribute to the community at large. But yes, uh, that is a great question. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for the answer. Mm -hmm. Next question from the squad. Scott, uh, do you recommend building a bigger project to try to have something in your GitHub that looks like a real realistic app or a lot of small ones so you get more experience publishing to app stores? Great question. Some people have, uh, uh, you know, are torn between volume or quant or or quality. For example, like if you want to do quantity or quality, do you want to do a bunch of little projects? Uh, and but they're not but they're very small or you want to do one single one that is really big if you want to if you want me to give you the quick answer you could go for the first one why because it will give you a breadth of knowledge on on flutter you can build multiple sm small applications you're not like uh inflating let's say your github uh, repo or your profile just because you have a bunch of little applications uh, but at least it will give you, uh, you know, uh, the ability to practice, you know, creating multiple repos, creating multiple projects. Each project may be focused on one separate thing. And then that way you can put yourself out there much quicker. People see, uh, even though if it's a small sample, like people get a taste of what you're capable of, as opposed to you uh, staying like one year building one long, big project that then after a year, there's a bunch of things that are outdated, uh, you know, and, and there's a flutter four or something new. And then you're like, oh, I'm going to have to start it again. So I would say if you want to go for either one approach, you could go for the former and then uh, create like small projects because it will give you like a very nice routine and momentum as opposed to just one project where you don't even share it and it takes you too long to build it. That's my right. advice to you. Thank you. Right. That makes really sense. The next question needs, uh, what is the best way to migrate your app from old Flutter app to latest version? Must be this is regarding how to from not null to null safety. Yes. So there are yeah. there are links uh, that, you know, and, and resources out there to help you migrate your application into null safety. I myself have run into that issue where I've created a couple of applications. And then when I come back, I'm like, oh, I created it on, before Flutter 2. So, you know, there's no null safety and all that. So there are ways that, you know, to mitigate that you can start, you know, in an incremental approach. But there are tools out there that allow you to do a full migration without breaking your application. But I would say do it now as opposed to much later, because if you want to uh, continue incrementing, adding more features to your application, bringing more safety into it will bring uh, a lot of benefits in the future. Uh, but if you see, for example, now I'm going to twist that question. How about rebuilding a another application to Flutter as opposed to bringing it little by little into Flutter? I would say go for the greenfield approach, completely re rebuild it in Flutter, but using Flutter 3. So for, for you who has an old Flutter application, try to use the, the migration tools because it, it will expedite things for you. And you who want to build a brand new Flutter application from iOS or Android, it's better sometimes to start like on a greenfield approach, like completely brand new, because at least you have a cleaner code base and you're using the latest and greatest from Flutter. Yeah, right. that's right. Our next question is, uh, how to be productive in learning Flutter while working full time as a UX designer? 
it is hard to maintain coding session after working. After I, I totally identify with you, uh, whoever asked that. I, I, this is actually why Flutter is, it has been a great hit, not only for developers, but for UX designers, because it, it kind of bridges the gap between developers and UX designers. Uh, if you, to you, UX designer, if you want to learn and you want to uh, uh, build Flutter, start building uh, UIs, like start building just the UI portion of it. And then, for example, you can hand off that to a developer. But to you, I would say focus on building layouts. I have great code labs that focus on just that on building really cool UI layouts. Let's say if you're a UX designer who uses like Figma or Adobe XD or Canva or something like that, all those mockups that you create, uh, some of those tools actually migrate code, uh, uh, can make you uh, like generate Flutter code uh, out of that. But I would say if you really want to learn Flutter, you want to do it from scratch and you want to build those components yourself. So I would say take a look at code labs that focus only on UI layout builders, uh, lay on UI layout building because that will definitely make you more proficient. Uh, and of course, you know you have to uh, pick your battles because I know that you may be really busy, you know, with a full time uh, job, and and you want to really become proficient in Flutter. Take it small, like do incremental uh, like progress every day. You could do like one hour every day, kind of like me. I have a full time, but I also I'm a Flutter GDE. And I also do like side gigs and I also have a side project. I do like incremental uh, uh, incremental changes. And I uh, like I just increment like little by little every project that I do. And then that's what makes a uh, progress as opposed to not doing anything. So I would say start small and then you see uh, the progress and the advance as you as you, as days go by. Yeah, that's right. You're an all rounder drummer. And that's a nice tips for the UX designer. Here is the next question. Uh, how to decide design pattern like MP or MVPM? Any good resource to look? Great, great question. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, without over engineering your application, you can find really good patterns uh, to um, to design your application, and and that way you can provide like a clean architecture from the ground up. That way you build your application on a good foundation. Whether MVP or MVVM, it all depends on your particular case or even your preference. Because as long as you provide at least a good foundation to your application, it doesn't matter which which pattern you pick. I would actually even point you to some of uh, my previous colleagues, um, uh, some of the resources that they've put out there. Mangirdas has a great set of resources, like uh, and 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 some links on like uh, design patterns that I would actually point you to. Uh, and you can even see uh, some out there, like in the in the Flutter community, about like uh, clean architecture, uh, design patterns. Uh, also, um, I know that uh, uh, Majid also has like really great resources on that. So I could point you uh, to some uh, some of those uh, great, amazing Flutter experts that could help you in that aspect. Uh, of course, you know, humbly I say you could also go and take a look at my code labs. But I love sharing. Uh, and you know, spreading knowledge and even give props to my you know to my colleagues as well. So you can take a look at at their resources as well. Uh, you know, for, for learning uh, great patterns for building your Flutter applications. Yeah, thank you for the references. Uh, next question we have: If you want to do web, desktop, and mobile, do you we use mono repo or separate repos? Again, it all depends on your team, like depending on how you're working. If you yourself, if you're just like the sole developer, you could do mono repos, but then you will see how, for example, like the benefits of doing separate repos when you have like multiple teams, multiple features and all of that. But if you, depending on how big your application is, or I would say, don't get caught up in like, how am I going to start uh, my application? You can start with a mono repo and then eventually probably if it, if it doesn't become too too large, then you can migrate to that. But I would say start small, uh, you know, get your get your application out there, get feedback and see how the team works, uh, uh, you know, w with that type of approach. Because usually tr tr try not to think, you know, be a little bit more uh, selfless uh, uh, as far as that, not, not so selfish. Like you want to think about the team. You want to see how they work. Uh, you know how you work as a team how what best works for all of you and then you implement that approach but if you're just a single developer you know depending on how big your application you can just go with a mono repo and and that should do it but try not to get hung up on that start building flutter applications put them out there and become a flutter published developer that's my suggestion to you yeah right maybe separate repos help us to just avoid the hodgepodge that we can hear exactly exactly there you go that's my point great great point. yeah our next and last question is, do you favor SPA or multiple page for easy maintainable Flutter web apps? Great. So uh, Flutter web apps, remember Flutter web apps, 
are just like a almost like a Flutter mobile application. It's the same code base. You just uh, target multiple platforms. When you're talking about single page applications, uh, let's say if you want to do like a single page app, it's kind of like a single page app pretty much. It's just that everything is contained within that natively compiled, uh, you know, web assembly, you know, type of package for the web application. Uh, and then you can have like navigation and all of that. But I would say for multi-page, uh, you could actually use uh, Flutter for that. Uh, you could also use packages, for example, like Go Router, which actually are more in line to uh, like multi-page applications because you have like deep linking. It has like better navigation for for like those type of web applications. But if you're just going for like one single page type of application, j Flutter, just regular Flutter with you know with one single code base, it will do it will do just that. Like it would actually be good for that. So don't think about like the spa as like uh, another type of thing. Uh, if Flutter actually generates kind of like a single page application type of package pretty much. But but yes, like I would say Flutter uh, if, uh, right now is in stable for, for the web. You should go ahead and try it. The application that I was uh, demoing earlier, I'm also, I also have it ready to be published for the web and without pretty much no changes whatsoever. So I'm able to target desktop, mo uh, both mobile platforms, uh, web, and even I've tried it on like a, an embedded uh, Ubuntu Raspberry Pi little device, and it's worked the same way. So my suggestion to you, yes, go ahead, use Flutter for, you know, whether you want to make a single page app, or you want to make it multi-page, you could do you could do any of that. Yeah, again, it totally depends on the requirements, right? Totally. Also, we are going to pick this last question here. I have to know native Kotlin or Swift to be a good Flutter day. Not at all. Not at all. So in order to be a Flutter developer, even you don't even need to learn Dart before you tackle the Flutter uh, framework. As you're learning the Flutter framework and becoming a Flutter developer, you learn Dart. I never took like a Dart course before becoming a Flutter developer. As I was doing like my first Hello World and building uh, applications in Flutter, I was learning Dart at the same time. It's not, nothing wrong of you, you know, with you going to the Dart documentation and you want to learn more the intricacies of that language. Please, the, the uh, much, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's really good if you do that. Uh, much power to you, like I, I wanted to say. But yes, you don't have to uh, learn that, but it's, it's, it's really useful if you're going to tackle like the intricacies or you were, you're going to tag, uh, you're going to tap into the lower level, uh, let's say, workings of each platform. It would be good to know uh, both either Android or iOS. Like on iOS, I still need to open the Xcode. And for Android, sometimes I need to open Android Studio and then uh, like tap into the underlying platforms. But just to start as a Flutter developer, you don't need to know any of those technologies. It's a plus, but you don't need to. Yeah, that's that's great tips. Okay, uh, Raven, we here we finish all our questions. And thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming here and giving these great, wonderful tips to make our prof app proficient. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I just thing. heard you, Sandan, <laughs> that you can start without knowing Flutter. You know, I tried a few times. Maybe because I'm running uh, React, Node, uh, Flutter, and now iOS event. That's why I'm a little bit distracted. <laughs> but I tried a few times. I failed. I'm telling honestly, I failed. <laughs> no, <laughs> maybe I really need to. You, you have, to you have, have amazing, some... you have amazing uh, uh, resources in this talk. So all of us can help you. So let, let us know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I really hope that one day I'll come back. <laughs> we'll be great. We'll be great. This great. <laughs> Thank you so much for your speech and being with us and that your emotion that you gave us. Uh, and of course, Dieta, thank you so much for Madrid and last blog for today. It was a pleasure to have you with us and to, to see also you could ask some questions and to share some emotions with us. I would like to see everybody tomorrow at Senior Track as well or at our Next event, I can do some kind of spoiler that we'll have next event in February. Uh, I'll do all another kind of announcement later. Uh, so we are not stopping. We'll keep moving. We'll have a first Flutter Global <laughs> Summit, and I hope I still will do it. So, yeah, thank you a lot. Thank you for being with us. And I think that me and Dash, we need to take some rest and be ready for tomorrow. <laughs> take care, guys. Have a nice evening. Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye.